Zephyr Audiobook Presents. Audiobook title I was sold at the lowest price in my class. However, my personal parameter is the most powerful. 01 to 503. By Kurwasasuma Part 01. Author Kurwasasumu. Source https colon slash slash galaxy translations 97.com slash novel slash i dash was dash sold dash at dash the dash lowest dash price. C1, year 2 class 3 being sold. C1, year 2 class 3 being sold. The school trip. I've been waiting for this day. To confess to Yuki Shuryuki, who I've loved since first grade. Hey, what are you freezing up for? You're not nervous now, are you? You don't even know what a pure man's heart is. And it's my childhood friend Negisa who says that you're a delinquent and should be more careful with your nervous childhood. Friend. I'm not nervous. You're lying. Yuta looks like that. It's when he's too nervous to think about anything. Yes, the confession is scheduled for the third night of a four-day, three-night trip. And now it's the first day of the school trip. There are still three more days to go. I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that I'm not the only one who's a little nervous about this. Your childhood friend is playing the game of a lifetime, so you should be more careful. How dare you say that to your kind-hearted childhood friend who is willing to help you confess your feelings for free? If you say that, I won't help you. I'm sorry about that. I won't be cocky anymore, so please help me out. I'll tell you what. But, are you really going to confess? If you want to stop, now is the time to do it. Because the other party is not only the class, but the whole school, even the most beautiful girl in our town, Yuki Shuryuki. You are too disproportionate. Humph. Even if the place we're attacking is impregnable, I'm not giving up. I hope it's at least impregnable. That's when. The bus we were on shook like crazy. What an earthquake. Things were strange for an earthquake. The scenery outside had changed into something unusual. It was a very colorful pattern of lights swirling like a blur and a large amount of smoke. Then, as an even bigger shock occurred, the bus felt as if it had fallen somewhere with a thud. What the hell? What happened? No, I think he fell off a cliff. Calm down, everyone. Minami-sensei, what's going on? Minami-sensei, our homeroom teacher, tried desperately to calm us down, but it was hard to keep the noise down once it started. The door of the bus was opened with great force and then a person in an unfamiliar outfit, like a medieval soldier, rushed in. Everybody out of here! What's the matter with you? Why do we have to leave? Funashio, the hottest guy in the class, attacked the soldier. The soldier hit Funashio in the leg with his spear. Move! Next time I'll stab you! When he said this with a straight face, even Funashio fell silent. Everyone, let's go outside like we were told. As soon as we stepped outside... I was the first to see Yuki Shuryuki's figure. Thank God, she seems to be safe. Yuta, I am scared. Nagisa is unusually weak. If they wanted to harm us, they would have done it by now. I'm not sure why, but I said that to reassure her. Outside the bus, we were in a primitively built structure that looked like the streets of old Rome. Seeing the scene, Namiji Tabata, a nerd and video game enthusiast, exclaimed, I've never seen anything like this. We're in another world. This is definitely a different world. Wow, I didn't think such a world really existed. Another world. Surely it would be too strange not to think so. Once everyone is outside, the bus is transported somewhere by a strange machine. It looks like a primitive civilization, but I've seen some machine-like things in places, so I'm not sure what the level of civilization is. All right, everybody, get over here. Surrounded by dozens of soldiers, we were moved somewhere. Well, I expected a little, but it was a prison. Everybody in. What the fuck is? Why do I have to be in here? Just get in. Next time you say something, I'll stab you in the back. No one can complain when they are threatened like that. We were put together in a big jail. After a while, a slightly pompous man in different clothes than the soldiers came to the front of the jail. He started talking about. I'm the director of this summoning center and my name is Vermal. It's a summoning center, so this is another world after all, Namiji said happily. Yes, I suppose it would be called an alien world to you earthlings. Earth, do you guys know about it? Minami-sensei asked. Of course, we summoned you because we know you're from Earth. Why is that? 
In this world, the tools of the old magic civilization called magic machines are used in all sorts of situations, such as construction, engineering, transportation, etc. But the magic machines must be linked to a special energy to operate. In the event that you've got a lot of time and energy, you'll be able to take advantage of it. There are few people in this world, Falva, who have strong energy. And there's an absolute shortage of people who can pilot a magic machine. What do you mean by that? You earthlings, many of you, have high levels of that special energy, we call Ludia. Which is why we spend a huge amount of money to regularly summon people from earth in summoning rituals like this. Such selfish, disregard for our wishes. Well, I feel bad about it. But the pilot of a magic machine in this world has a high status. I guess it's not a bad life. Apparently we don't have the right to refuse. Nagisa is holding my clothes with a worried look. Anyway, tomorrow you will be put up for sale. The higher the Lydia value, the better the place you'll be bought. So keep your fingers crossed that your Lydia value is high. With that, the director of the summoning center left. C2, Lydia value 2. C2, Lydia value 2. In the meantime, they served us food that I didn't understand. And it wasn't very tasty. But it filled my stomach. So I decided to go to bed anyway. Women and men are in the same prison. But naturally the girls clustered together. And the boys gathered nearby. Yuda, I wonder what my Lydia value is. What the heck, Haranishi, you're quick to accept the situation. You know, the higher the value, the better the treatment. While I was having such a conversation with Yuji Haranishi, a relatively good friend of mine in class. The rich and slightly pretentious Mamra Mikaj unusually entered our conversation. Well, I'm pretty sure my numbers are high. Are you sure about that, Mikaj? In the event you're not sure what your Lydia value is, you can't fool the intrinsic qualities of a person. In this class, I think it's me or the girl, Yuki Shuryuki. I don't know what the basis of Mikaj's confidence is, but for some reason I agree with him that Yuki Shuryuki is expensive. And the next day, we were made to stand in a line, one by one, on a strange round wooden machine. The first one is Rin Iwanami from the soccer team, who is very athletic. When Iwanami stood on the round board, the man who was checking something in front of the machine shouted, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure what it is. 12,000, that's over 10,000 Highlanders. As he said this, the people around him began to rustle. If the first one is a Highlander, isn't this product of ridiculously high quality? Maybe we'll get a double Highlander for the first time in a while. The soldiers around us were having a conversation about it, and it seems that over 10,000 is a standard. Iwanami was moved to the next room, and the next guy was put on the round board. The next one is Haruma Sakaki, who is dark and quiet and doesn't stand out in class. It's Sakaki. He's that dark-skinned. He's low anyway. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I was lower than Sakaki. But Sakaki's numbers shut the mouths of those who were talking behind his back. And 29,000 is... A double Highlander. Wow. And it's almost a triple. He wasn't happy about it at all. But the people around him were in an uproar. I guess that's how great it was. But it hadn't sunk into us yet. Two Highlanders are better in a row. Looks like we've hit the jackpot this time. I had such high expectations. But after that, the number didn't exceed 10,000 for a while. I'm a little disappointed. By the way, Kiyama, who said earlier that he couldn't live if the number was lower than Sakaki's, was at 2,200. And the next big thing was her. There it is. Triple Highlander. 36,000 is the highest number in years. Yuki Shuryuki had a talent that was different from the norm after all. Is it really so great to be a triple Highlander? The excitement around us was extraordinary. It was like a festival. Now, the next one is my childhood friend, Nagi Sakuri. Well, she's not that big of a deal. I thought so, but she did surprisingly well. 6,500. Shuryuki's 36,000 is great, so it doesn't stand out. But so far, only 5 of the 25 have over 5,000. So it's pretty high up there. Well, that's what he's like. Okay. I guess it's my turn now. With that, Haranishi climbed onto the round board. 3300. What? I'm sorry. Am I doing something wrong? What the hell? You're 3300. No, that's not possible. Can you measure me again? They measured again. And the number was still 3300. 
That's ridiculous. No, something. Just go. They told him that, and he was forced to move to the next room. Eleven thousand, Highlander. That's what Mikeage told me. Unlike Haranishi, this one seems to have gotten a decently high number. The next one was Minami-sensei. From that side, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or a student. Everyone is in line. Minami-sensei's number was 4,300 and... You're lying about... Two has... Needles pointing to two. The person in charge of measurement is calling another person to check. Wait a minute. How is that number possible? It's not broken. Yeah, dude, just get off for a second. That's what he told me and I got off the round board. Yeah, is working fine. Try it again. I did as I was told and got on there again. Oh, wait a minute. Didn't the needle just go around? Oh, come on. This machine is the latest and greatest. It can measure up to 100,000. It's not going to go around. 100,000. That's impossible if it's... If it's... Then his Lydia value is 2. It's been a long time since I've seen less than 100. Well, I guess even earthlings have garbage like this once in a while. What? Garbage is a terrible thing to say. C3. The winning bid price is two fruits. Apparently, we're going to be auctioned off. One by one, we're made to stand on a stage in front of a venue with hundreds of people. Then a man who looks like a moderator begins to explain. The first rider is a Highlander with a Ludia value of 12,000. And since he's a Highlander, the starting price is a high 10 million gold. Then you can bid. 30 millions. 50 millions. The price keeps going up and up. There is no other bidder. Then the Valkyria Empire's bid of 160 million is the winner. The MC looked around, made sure there were no other bids, and hit the hammer in his hand. Since your bid was successful, the Valkyria Empire will not be able to bid again until the fifth round. Apparently there's a rule that you can't win bids in a row. And now for the next rider, this is a double Highlander with a Lydia value of 29,000. We'll start at a high price of 20 million. Please bid accordingly. When they heard the figure of 29,000, the audience started to get excited. The face of the person in charge of the Valkyria Empire, who had just won the bid for Iwanami, turned pale. Even if they wanted to, the Valkyria Empire could not bid so they could only watch with their fingers crossed. 300 millions, 400 millions, 700 millions. There are some outrageous prices popping up. 29,000 seems to be such a great number. 1.2 billion. Is there any other bidder? Then, the kingdom of ruble is the winner. How overpriced the Highlander is becomes apparent in the prices of the mediocre classmates that follow. I was surprised that there was so much difference between 300,000, 450,000, and a million at the most. And finally it's her turn to be the highest priced Snow White in the class. So here's today's best rider, Lydia Value 36,000, Triple Highlander. With those words from the moderator, the room became the noisiest it had been all day. Then, with the words of the auctioneer, high-pitched voices overflowed. One billion! Two billion, two and a half billions. The order of magnitude of the amount of money in dispute is different from what it used to be. And then one man's words silenced the audience. 120 billions, 120 billion. Is there any other bidder? Then Alicia Empire's bid of 120 billion will be the winner. When the winning bid was decided, the audience started to get excited. It's Alicia again. Lately, the best riders are always taken by Alicia. It's no use. Alicia has found another new Orichalcan mine and things are going pretty well. That's what I've been hearing. Now it's Nagisa's turn. I wonder how much she is going to be sold for. 20 million. Is there any other bidder? Then the kingdom of Amuria's bid of 20 million wins. 20 million is a lot of money. Well, actually, I didn't do anything but I was a little bit happy that my childhood friend was appreciated. The auction proceeded in a bland manner, perhaps because the highest priced auction was over, the Highlander's micage was a little more exciting. But that was it, and then I. My auction gets exciting in a different way. Now, here comes the unfortunate rider. I'm really sorry, he's not for sale but we'll auction him at least once. Lydia Value. 2. This value is like some kind of joke. It's not going to help you. 
but you might want to bid on him as a memento. And so it begins. But no one's hand is raised. The audience is just making a lot of noise. No, they're not making noise. They're laughing. I was being laughed at by the audience. What's wrong with the Lydia value? Two, damn it. And if it was only the audience that laughed, it would still be forgivable. For some reason, my classmates, who were supposed to be my friends, also laughed at me as if they were looking down on me. That's terrible. But Shiroyuki and my childhood friend Nagisa were the only ones not laughing. They were looking at me. With concern. That made me feel a little better. Is there anyone betting? I'll accept even one gold coin. Okay, I'll buy him. But I can't even give you one gold. I can only give you two of these Lego fruits. Ha 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 ha. When the man said that, the audience burst into laughter. I don't know what's so funny about that. I'm only worth two pieces of fruit. C4. Life as a slave. I was sold for two pieces of fruit, and my treatment was terrible. I was chained up and taken away in a carriage that looked like a prison wagon. Then, after a short ride, I arrived at a large mansion on the side of a mountain. At the mansion, I was taken not to the main house, but to a stable-like place in the garden. Come on in, this is your home from today. It was not a house. A shack would be a good place to start, no matter how you look at it. There were about ten men and women crammed inside. Hey, I'm hungry. That's what I said to the man who was leaving. You're done eating for the day. You'll have to wait until tomorrow. Seriously? I'm so hungry I can't sleep. While I was depressed thinking about it, a girl came up to me. She was wearing tattered clothes and had shaggy hair. I guess it's not a bad idea in a place like this. But she wasn't the prettiest girl. Are you hungry? The girl said bluntly. Oh, I'm starving. Here, you can have this. Then she handed me a black dumpling. Nanami, that's your precious emergency food. You can't give it to a newcomer like that. When the auntie said that to the girl, the girl said with a blank expression. You know Nanami is spicy when she's hungry. That's all she said. I can't believe such a little girl would say that. I can't take this dumpling. Indeed, I gave it back to her. Thank you. I'll be able to eat tomorrow so I'll put up with it for a day. Don't force it. You can eat. And I'm not sure if we'll even have food tomorrow. Is that so? The auntie answers that question. Yes, the owner here is fickle. We eat once every three days, that's all. Well, that's why they're all so skinny. Okay, thanks Nanami. Well, let's split it in half. It's good enough for me. Half is enough? Yeah, half is enough for such a big dumpling. I split the dumpling in half and handed the larger one to Nanami. Okay, let's eat. Me and Nanami sat down on a dirty wooden table and ate it together. As you can see, it doesn't taste as good as it looks, but more than the taste. Nanami's feelings made me happy. After eating the dumplings, Nanami led me to my bed. I wasn't expecting a proper bed, but it was worse than I expected. It was a bed of flimsy straws on a board, no quilt, and everyone was sleeping together. When I lay down to sleep, Nanami came to sleep beside me. She was a little cold, but she hugged me. I held her shoulders to keep her a little warmer. I couldn't sleep at all. I was cold and stiff. But they wouldn't let me rest in that situation. A man came to our hut and took me out. The women were taken towards the house and the men were taken to the cliffs behind the house and made to work. Our work was to excavate something. We were forced to dig and carry something. We were forced to do this all day long without a break. And when the sun went down, we were sent back to the hut. A little bit of water was given to us while we were working. After we finished our work for the day, we were given water and a piece of hard bread, like a cookie. So this is today's meal. It's better than nothing, on a good day. We get a big loaf of bread, some cheese, and some dried meat, but that's once a month. Okay, apparently this is the worst place to be. Nanami, why would a little girl like you be in a place like this? Sold to. Sold by whom? My mom. Oh, I guess I shouldn't have asked but she said that the money from selling her would allow her family to live for a month. So, Nanami was fine with that. What a healthy girl. Uh, wait a minute. Her family can live for a month. Nanami was sold for a higher price than me? I felt a little upset. For a while after that, I worked during the day and slept at night. Sometimes I would get a meal and eat it. 
The turning point came when I noticed the unusual behavior of the man who owned the hut. They don't lock the hut, do they? When I said that, the old lady told me the reason. That door has a Ludia control key. People with a Ludia value of 300 or less can't open it. There are only people in this hut with a value of 100 or less. It's sarcastic. I see. My Lydia value is 2. Well, that means I can't open it. I thought that. But I casually put my hand on the door and opened it. C5. Slave to slave. Oh, it's open. Hey, hey, did you open the door? Yeah, it opened with a little touch. What's your Lydia value? 2. If it's then the guy in charge forgot to close it. They forgot to close it. But the door was open. This is a great chance to escape. Looks like we're going to get away with this. There are no guards. I was chained up when I came here. But now I am free. They're not here. But there are guards at the entrance. Well, maybe we can escape through the mountains in the back. I don't know. The mountains are dangerous at night. Still, it's better than being here. I'm leaving. Okay. Strangely enough, no one but me tried to escape from there. They're used to living here. I felt that way. But, only one person seemed to want to follow me. Nanami, are you coming? Yes, I'm following Yuta. Apparently, Nanami thinks of me as an older brother or something. For her sake, I have to get out of here somehow. It's true that there were two guards at the entrance. But there were no guards at the back of the mountain. Which might make the mountain that much more dangerous. I didn't hesitate to head towards the mountain. Once I entered the mountain from the mining site, I made my way through the steep bushes. I'm not good at studying, but I'm relatively good at exercising, physically. I didn't seem to have a problem. I'm sure you'll be able to understand why I've been so impressed with my performance. All right, Nanami, I'll take you on my back. On your back? Like this. I said that and carried Nanami forcefully. Yuta, Nanami squeezed me from behind. I guess she had no experience of being piggybacked because her family sold her. We spent the night crossing the mountain. They lied to us. About the danger. Probably to make us think that and to keep us from escaping. It was hard. But we managed to cross the mountain safely. And on the other side of the mountain was a large city. Maybe there's some work to be done here. Wait for me, Nanami. I'll earn some money and buy you something to eat. Nanami nodded, however, when I said that I wanted to work in a place where there was likely to be work, I was always asked this question. What's your Ludia value? If I answer two, they won't take me seriously. Apparently, in this world, you can't even get a job unless you have a high Ludia value. But if you don't work, you can't buy food. I searched hard and finally found a place that would let me work regardless of my Ludia value. He he he. Okay, I'll let you work, that girl too, just me. Okay, well, the job is simple. It's to turn the motor of the ship. Motor? Power the ship. It's a simple job, anyone can do it. Food twice a day. Pay is three gold a week, is that okay? No problem. I didn't know if three gold was expensive or cheap, but I had no right to choose. It was a big ship that took me and Nanami. This is where you'll be working. Don't worry, you can sleep in here. Sleeping there means, come on in. When he said that, I went inside and the door was shut with a slam. Nanami held my hand anxiously. As I walked to the back, I saw a bunch of people, all dressed in shabby outfits. You're new here, what's your name? It was an old man with white hair who approached me. I'm Yuta, and this is Nanami. Okay, so what's your Lydia value? Two. When I said that, I could hear the breaths of disappointment around me. Well, it's better than nothing. I'll explain what we do here. Look at that. When I looked in the direction the old man was talking about, I saw a round gear that looked like a large windmill turned on its side. It's our job to move it. We all hold those handles and spin it around. The higher the Lydia value, the easier it is to spin. They're all below 100, so they're at the bottom of the ladder. They're heavy. Be prepared. Yes, I understand. More importantly, I heard you can sleep in here. Where is the room? The room is here. We sleep here, we eat here, we work here. That's our life. Can't you go outside? Of course not. What do you think you are, a slave driver? I've been duped. Apparently this is where slaves work. Well, it's easier now that the ship isn't moving. So don't worry, it's not so bad once you get used to it. Slave to slave, 
What bad luck, Nanami, sorry. C6 manpower. The ship didn't move for a while, but food was served twice a day, which is good because this treatment is better than the previous place. It looks like the ship is leaving, things are getting hectic on board. Finally, the order to turn on the motor was given, Nanami was also forced to work as a turner, damn it, I can't protect a single girl. However, when I held the handle to turn the motor, the motor began to rotate at a frightening speed. The people in the room were startled and began to make a fuss. What the hell? The motor just started spinning on its own. Wow, this is easy. What's going on? Apparently, judging from everyone's reactions, the motor was running differently than usual. Indeed, the motor was running much easier than I heard, requiring very little effort. I don't know why, but the motor turns at an unbelievable speed and the ship moves along effortlessly. This put the ship's master in a good mood. Well, you did a great job today, and if you keep it up, we'll reach our destination in half the number of days we planned. If that happens, we'll offer you a reward. The captain of the ship said this before dinner, and everyone cheered when they heard it. Anyway, I've prepared a more sumptuous meal than usual for today, so you can start working hard tomorrow. The food was certainly better than usual. Hot stew, bread, and a stir-fry with meat in it. Cheese and wine were also served and proper meat, not dried meat. No one could figure out why the motor was running so well. But they didn't care. They seemed to think that as long as they got a belly full of food and a reward that was all that mattered. What's the matter, Nanami? You don't eat bread? Yeah, I'm saving it for a future. Okay, I'll save some for you. You'd have worked hard, so eat up. I'll give you half of Nanami's food when we eat the preserved food. Don't worry, there's plenty of food today. I'm already full. The next day, and the day after that, the motor ran smoothly, and the ship arrived at its destination at an incredible speed. Hey, the captains rewarded us with a bounty and permission to go out. The fact that they arrived at their destination in a third of the time meant that they had made a huge profit. The captain, in a super good mood, gave us ten gold coins each as a reward and permission to go out. That was an unusual treatment for a slave, and it meant that the profits were Worth it. Doesn't everyone think that? We're just going to go away. When I asked this question, one of the old guys on the boat said, I don't know. Ha ha ha, where do you think we're going? It doesn't matter where we go as long as we have a low Lydia value. We'd rather be on this ship where we can eat properly. That's how it is. Sure, it's easy to eat and have a good time. But I still want proper freedom. Nanami, do you want to stay here? Nanami wants to stay with Yuda. Well, if you stay with me, you might not be able to eat again. I still want to be with Yuta. When I heard those words, I took Nanami's hand and left the ship. I have no intention of returning to this ship. We have 20 gold together. It seems that the price for a large loaf of bread is about 5 silvers, and 100 silvers is worth 1 gold. So if we save, we can live for a while. Since we've been slaves for so long, we were both pretty dirty. I suggested that we buy some clothes and take a bath first. Bath? What's that? Nanami, you've never taken a bath? Yeah, Nanami doesn't know. Okay, when I tried to enter a store that sold clothes I was kicked out immediately. I had no choice but to find an open air store that sold clothes, so I decided to buy some there. Nanami, which one do you like? Nanami's eyes were shining as I wondered if this was the first time she had ever picked out an outfit. Then. After an hour of agonizing, she picked out a dress. It wasn't cheap at 20 silver, but when I saw Nanami's smile, I was glad I bought it. I'm going to buy a pair of sweatshirts and pants on sale for one gold each. I also need to buy some shoes. What Nanami has on is a pair of tattered straw sandals. That's going to hurt her feet. Even at the shoe store, Nanami had a twinkle in her eyes and chose a pair of pink shoes. 1 gold 30 silver. Well, that's about right if there were cheaper ones. I would have bought them too, but they were a bit expensive for men, so I decided to hold back. C7, Rider's Treatment slash Magisa. C7, Rider's Treatment slash Magisa. What's your name? I'm Nagisa, Nagisa Curry. Bought for 20 million, I had been handed over to the purchaser. It seems that the purchaser was some royalty, but her appearance was not so extravagant. 
I'm Renel, second princess of Amuria. It's nice to meet you. Yes, I know you're worried. Because you've been brought into a strange world and sold. But don't worry. I won't harm you and I promise you the same treatment as royalty. I see. Yes, I think riders with high Lydia value are treated quite well in all countries. Especially in my country. Which is small enough that they're treated as equal to royalty. But if you have a low Lydia value, you will be treated badly. Your friends all have high Lydia values. Oh, except one of them. What's going to happen to him? I'm worried about that. Oh, it was probably a slaver who bought him. So that's not you to, uh, are you in love with that person? Yeah, I've been in love with him for a long time. But he's got someone else he likes. Well, okay, I'll check it out. Maybe I can buy him back. Really? I know I'm from a small country, but I can buy one slave with my allowance. Yuda, stay safe. The kingdom of Amuria, where I will be staying, is small. As Renel said, the population is about 500,000, and the size of the country is about the size of Tokyo metropolitan area, as it can go from one end to the other by carriage in half a day. The castle where Renel lives is also a large mansion, and looks more like a noble residence than a royal palace. TL Note Tokyo Metropolitan Area Size is 2.194 square kilometers. Oh, that must be the half radar rider. Nice to meet you. I'm King Majni of Amuria. Hi, I'm Nagisa. Father, you look nervous, smile more. Renel warned her father, the king. Oh, sorry about that. The king draws but smiles at me. I could see the goodness in their hearts just from this exchange. Apparently, I've been bought by a good country. Big sister, introduce me too. Then a middle school girl came into the room. This is Himari, the third princess. She's a jerk and I can't handle her. That's terrible. She's been quiet lately. I hope so. And where's Yukiha, Himari? Yukiha is at her usual place. So, shall we go for a walk then? I have something to show Nagisa. Then they took me to a place that looked like a big warehouse. There was a, I don't know much about it, but, but it was a robot-like vehicle that looked like something a boy would like. Yukiha! When Renel called out, one of the robots walked briskly up to us. Then a door in the chest opened and a woman with long blue hair came out from inside. Renel, this must be the half-radar rider. Yeah, come down and I'll introduce you. All right, hold on. Then she got off some kind of ladder-like vehicle and came over to us. I'm Yukiha, the first princess. Nice to meet you. Yes, I'm Nagisa. It's nice to meet you. Well, let's have a quick look at Nagisa's magic raft, shall we? Yukiha said as if it was obvious. My magic raft. Yeah, that's the machine I bought you to drive. I'm on. I still didn't know what was going on. But what I found at the place where I was brought was a red robot. It's the strongest magic raft our country has. This magic raft is... Yes, this magic raft needs a minimum Lydia value of 5,000 to run. But even Yukiha, who has the highest 4,000 Lydia value in the country couldn't operate it. That's why I participated in this auction of earthlings. We're being used for war. I was shocked. Because apparently I knew I was supposed to get on this thing and fight. Oh, sorry, it's true that many countries use magic rafts in war. But Amuria is a defensive force. In fact, there hasn't been a major battle in 20 years. So don't worry. So you don't have to move this magic raft. It's called deterrence. If Amuria has a half radar that can move, the countries around it won't be able to do anything easily. Deterrence. I've certainly heard stories like that. But I'm getting a little worried about my life here. C8 Bath. I bought some clothes and shoes. And I'd like to change right away but I'd better get rid of this dirty grime first. I needed to take a bath somehow, so I asked an uncle around where the bath was. You want to take a bath? Well, I guess you'd have to stay at an inn with a bath or go to a hot spring somewhere. Hot springs, that's nice. Are there any hot springs nearby? Yes, there are. It would take about three hours by webliner to get there. I didn't know what a webliner was, but apparently there were none nearby. I had no choice but to stay at an inn with a bath. Nanami, we're going to stay at a very expensive inn today. I've never been to an inn before. At first, we looked for a cheap inn with a bath. A room in the places that looked good was 10 gold per night, so we couldn't stay there. Finally, we found a cheap inn with a bath for only 2 gold per night. 
When I entered the room, I found only one large bed. But that was no problem since I always slept cuddled up with Nanami. The bath was a wooden tub with a wooden floor. There's soap and towels, so we'll be able to get in right away. The hot water seems to come from some unknown force, and when you twist the faucet, it comes out. The feeling of warm steam after a long time is impressive. Okay, Nanami, you want to come in with me? When I ask that, Nanami comes into the bath without answering. Nanami, we need to get you undressed. Yeah, I took off my clothes along with Nanami. I don't need these anymore, I thought as I looked at our tattered clothes. Then I went to wash Nanami's body and was surprised to see her. She was small, but her breasts were swollen. I was a little nervous and looked away. What's wrong, Yuta? No, Nanami, how old are you? Fourteen. What the? Oh, shit. I thought she was about ten years old. That's not good. She's only three years younger than me. Nanami, can you get in there by yourself? Why don't you come in with me? I can't. Why not? No, no, no. I can't tell you how nervous I am. So, yeah, can you wash yourself? I've never done that. Right. I don't have a choice. I'll just close my eyes and wash. I squeezed my eyes shut and washed Nanami's body. I let her do the bottom part herself, but he was still insistent. Why, why, why did you to ask me to wash it? I wash her hair from behind. Her shaggy hair begins to unravel and become clean. Then I washed her face as well. Normally I can't see her eyes because of her shaggy hair. But now I'm holding her hair back to wash her face. This may be the first time I've seen Nanami's face properly. Maybe she's cute. Okay, now Nanami will wash Yuta. No, I'm fine. I can wash myself. Just let me wash you. Okay, then you wash my back. Because I can't wash my own back. Yeah, I got it. Nanami scrubbed and washed my back. Yuta, stay with me forever. Nanami said unexpectedly. Oh, we'll always be together. Nanami is like a sister to me now. I had no hesitation in replying that way. Yuda, I'll wash your bottom too, she said, but I refused, saying that I would do it myself. I had a little bit of a fight with Nanami, who tried to wash me forcefully, but I managed to win. Then we both got into the bathtub. There I listened to Nanami's story. She talked about her family, about being a slave, about me. I told her about my life before, my family, and about school, which she was very interested in. Well, she never studied, has she? I don't know if there is a school in this world, but I wanted Nanami to learn something. Okay, I've got my goal. I'll create an opportunity for Nanami to learn. That's what I decided. Now that her age has been discovered, sleeping with her has become more and more difficult. She didn't know how I felt about that but she was sticking to me as usual. In addition, the degree of closeness was twice as much as usual, probably because she was happy to have taken a bath and become clean. It would be strange to suddenly reject her today, so I suppressed my nervousness and went to bed. C9, looking for work. C9, looking for work. In order for Naomi to study, we needed to earn money. I had to find some kind of work. I bathed and changed my clothes which made me look better, and she started to listen to me more than before. Even so, the Lydia value of two is a barrier, making it impossible for me to get a job. Today was another bad day. I'm sorry, Nanami. No problem, as long as Yuta's with me. Nanami tells me this as we share a loaf of bread. The money we got from the ship won't last that long. I have to find a job somehow. Are you looking for a job? It was an elderly man who approached me. Yes, I am. What do you say? I have a job for you that pays 50 gold a month. 50 gold? Now that's a lot of money for us. What kind of job is it? I asked cautiously here, because of the matter of the ship. I have a daughter about your age, that I'd like you to talk to. Is that all? Yes, and if you don't have a home, I'll give you a place to stay if you want. I took the job because I had no other choice, even though I was incredibly well treated, and might get cheated again. Good, the first man said happily. The man's name was Mr. Belfast, a member of the country's nobility. Immediately, Mr. Belfast took me to his house. The house was a large mansion. With servants, there was no doubt that he was rich. I'm going to take you to see my daughter now, but I don't want you to be surprised, okay? Yes, okay. What does that mean? Is she weird, 
When I actually met Mr. Belfast's daughter, I understood what he meant. She wasn't a person. She looked like a half-beast. I listened to her story and heard about this phenomenon called half-breed. It seems to be a kind of curse. I have a lot of business enemies, and it seems that someone somewhere has a deep grudge against me. My daughter became like this. Ugh, I can't help but pity my daughter. When I heard the story, I approached the daughter. She was frightened, but I said proudly, I'm Yuda, this is Nanami, nice to meet you, can you tell me your name? When I told her that, she was frightened and told me, Pharma, well Pharma, from now on we're your friends and you can tell us anything you want. Friends, she was born in this form, and until recently she had been living confined to her room. This is the first time she has talked to anyone outside of her family, let alone friends, so she is still wary. Pharma, play with Nanami. What do you want to play with? Nanami forcefully pulled Pharma out of bed and took her to the garden. In the beginning, Pharma was confused by Nanami, but she gradually got used to it and started to smile. The two of them started to play happily. Ugh, Pharma looks so happy, Mr. Belfast said joyfully. I'm glad that Nanami has found a friend her age. Well, actually, I brought someone like that before you guys. But that time the person I brought saw my daughter and said she was a monster and ran away. I stopped looking for someone to talk to my daughter for a while because of that. I still wanted her to feel normal and happy. I'm really glad I reached out to you this time. Strangely enough, I didn't feel that Pharma was a monster at all. In another world, there would be girls like that. From that day on, my life at Belfast House began. I would sleep in a proper bed, wake up, eat breakfast, talk to Pharma, eat lunch, play with Pharma, eat dinner, talk to Pharma, and go to bed. After a month, Pharma and I became very close. Nanami and I became even closer, almost like real siblings. C10, the unmoving demon. Come on, Nanami, let's catch up. Wait, Pharma, you're a little early. I sat in my chair and watched them chasing each other. It's like being a slave was my imagination. I wish I could just stay here. Come here, Yuta. Pharma calls me. Okay, I'll be the demon, so you two better run. When I said that, Nanami and Pharma ran away, screaming. Wait, that's what I said as I chased after them. However, both of them were quite quick, and I couldn't catch them at all. I was getting a little tired. You're pathetic, Yuta. That's right. What are you going to do if you're so exhausted? No, I'm going to take a break. They had escaped to a warehouse in the mansion, where I found a large white robot. That was maybe 10 meters tall. As I looked up at it, they approached me. This is, this is a magic raft my dad bought a long time ago. He says it's broken. This is a magic raft. Everyone has one of these. It's not working. Yeah, dad said it can't be fixed because he doesn't know what's wrong with it. Oh yeah, are you sure it's broken? After the excavation, a triple Highlander got on board, but it didn't work. It seems that it's broken because there's no magic raft that triple Highlanders can't move. Excavation, aren't magic rafts constructed? It seems that the core cannot be recreated with today's magic technology. So it is common to dig up magic rafts from old civilizations and use them by repairing everything but the core. You know a lot, Pharma. Yeah, I like magic rafts. They're very attractive. We can't make them from scratch with our current magic technology alone. I'm also attracted to their unknown power. Well, it doesn't matter to me if this thing works. After all, I have a Ludia value of 2. What, Yuda, you have a Ludia value of 2? Yes, it's low. I've never heard a number that low before. What's Pharma's Ludia value? 7800. Oh my god, it's that high. Yeah, but it's not helping me. I can't appear in front of people. If your Lydia value is so high, why don't you just take whatever magic raft you want? I can't do it. After a long talk with Pharma, Nanami joined the conversation as she felt alone. I'm sure you're not the only one. Oh, by the way, does Nanami know her Lydia value? I don't know. I've never measured it. I see. But if you can't open the door to that slave cabin, it must be low. I've never tried. What? Because I've never touched the door of the slave cabin. Okay, so it's possible that your Lydia value is high. I don't care about those numbers. Nanami is Nanami. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. I'm a 2 and I'm totally fine. Nanami said she didn't care about the Lydia value. 
But a short time later, her Lydia value was discovered, and it was a surprising number. And, triple Highlander, Nanami's Lydia value was 32,000. Since we didn't know her Lydia value, Mr. Belfast took the liberty of measuring Nanami's Lydia value. That's where the surprising number came from. Nanami, this is great. These numbers will get you good treatment as a rider in any country. I really hope you'll always be a friend of Pharma, but I can introduce you to this country royalty if you want. However, Nanami didn't seem to be interested in such things. I'm staying here, with Yuta and Pharma. Hearing this, Mr. Belfast patted Nanami's head happily. Thank you so much for saying that, Pharma has good friends. Normally, Nanami would be more appreciated, have a better life, and be able to do whatever she wants. But she still wants to be with us. Honestly, I felt happy. But this will cause a big problem later. That would change the fate of Pharma's family for the better. C11, the continent's strongest rider. C11, the continent's strongest rider. Strange world, strange auction. What will happen to me? Everyone in my class has been torn apart. I wonder if Sakira and Nanami will be okay. And Yuta, everyone made fun of him like that. I don't know what to think. Dear Yuki, we have arrived. Watch your step. The man who said this to me was an uncle called Dio, the minister of war of the Elysian Empire. This is the man who bid for me in that strange auction. After the auction, I was brought to an amazing castle. I wonder how many Tokyo domes it would hold. My personal feeling is that it would easily hold 200. Inside the huge castle I was led to a gorgeous building further in. Salute Triple Highlander Yuki-sama. Many soldiers salute me. I'm not that great. I'm not worth that much. I knew that in my heart. In an even more luxurious room in a luxurious building. A person was waiting for me. Ho ho. A young girl. I like the fact that she doesn't look like a triple highlander. In the presence of his majesty the emperor, Miss Yuki, please bow your head. I did as I was told and tried to bow. Good, good, don't bow your special. You're my country's fifth and most valuable triple highlander. Instead of bowing... Pledge your loyalty to me with your power. After he said that, I was told to back off, and I was escorted out of the room. Miss Yuki, please come this way. Before I show you the room, I'd like to show you your magic raft. Magic raft. He then led me to a huge warehouse-like area, where large robots were crammed together. What you see here are the ordinary magic rafts. The advanced models are in the hangar at the back. Then he led me further inside. This is Yuto-sama. Is that the new rider? Yes, this is triple rider Yuki-sama. When the person called Yuto heard this, he approached me and extended his hand. I'm Yuto. Nice to meet you, Yuki. Hi, I'm Yuki. I'm Japanese. If you have any questions, you can ask me. I can explain most things. Japanese? That's right, I was sold like you, for about five years now. Oh, really? Master Yuto, we've finished the maintenance of Ajura. A voice called out from behind me. Well, I've been summoned, so I'd better get going. After saying that, Yuto walked away. Mr. Io explained about him after Yuto left. This is Yuto-sama, a quintuple highlander, a rider with a Ludia value of 57,000, said to be the strongest on the continent. The most powerful rider on the continent is such a person. Yes, because of him, our Elysian Empire is considered the strongest on the continent. Sometimes he has more authority than the king, so there is no harm in getting to know him. I can imagine what you mean by saying that with a slightly unpleasant smile, but I didn't dare answer. What was shown to me was a jet black magic raft, with a slender body and a dragon-like frame, that I honestly thought was beautiful. This is my, it's a monstrous magic raft with an activation value of 30,000, a maximum output of 3 million, SS ranked armor and SS-ranked mobility. That's how they explain it to me, but I don't understand it now. I'm not interested. You will be taught how to operate it by our trainers at a later date. So please get on board and help this country. Yes, well, could you do me one favor? What can I do for you? I think there was a boy who was sold at that auction for that fruit. Oh, the defective product with the Lydia value of two. Defective? He's not like that. Oh, I'm sorry about this. What about him? I'm worried about what happened to him. Can't you check it out? Well, yeah. Please, I care about him. 
Hmm, I can't refuse a request from a triple Highlander. Very well. I will instruct Alicia to buy the man back. Really? Yes, it's a small gift for Miss Yuki. Thank you very much. I've liked him since freshman year because of his honest and kind nature. But it's only recently that I've realized I like him. I was going to be brave enough to confess my love for him on the school trip. But then this happened. The room that was prepared for me was luxurious. About 50 tatama mats in size, with a bath and toilet, and a human being. Nice to meet you, Miss Yuki. I'm Miss Yuki's personal maid. My name is Russia. My personal. Yes, in this country, every rider above the rank of Highlander has a personal maid at their disposal. That being said, I'm hungry. I was telling that to Russia. Yes, I'll have your meal ready in a moment. In about an hour or so, a meal was prepared. It was a sumptuous meal in a quantity that I couldn't finish, and I was a bit confused. I can't eat this much. You can eat as much as you want, and if there's anything else you'd like to eat, we'll have it ready for you soon. I eat a small portion of the food that was served to me. All of it is delicious. I wonder what Yuta is eating. C12, The Sorrow of Pharma. C12, The Sorrow of Pharma. That day, Mr. Belfast came back in a hurry from somewhere. Prepare to leave here immediately. That's what he told me. What's wrong? When I asked, Mr. Belfast gave me a very sorry look and began to talk. The people of this country found Nanami-chan's Ludia value. The technician who measured it must have leaked it. That's why they ordered me to recruit her into the army. But Nanami-chan's intentions were known to me. I refused. So, are you sure you're okay doing that? I don't know. I already had information that the military was on the move, so I rushed back. What's going to happen to us? I'm sorry, Yuta. You guys have to get out of here. If you don't, Nanami will be forced to join the army. Nanami in the army? I would never want that. I nodded to Mr. Belfast and agreed to him. But, it was already too late. The door of the mansion is violently slammed. Boom, boom, boom. Viscount Belfast. Open up. It's the Lutuan army. Give us the triple Highlander's child. Yudakuin. Take Nanami-chan and run out the back. I nodded at that and headed upstairs to Pharma's room where Nanami was. Nanami, we need to get out of here now. When I said that, both Nanami and Pharma looked surprised. What's wrong, Yuta? I want to stay here. If we stay here, Mr. Belfast is going to be in trouble. When she said this, Nanami almost cried, but she shook Pharma's hand and said goodbye. Yuta, Nanami, Pharma, I am sorry. Just as I was about to leave the room, I heard a loud sound of something breaking. When I looked out from Pharma's room, I saw three magic rafts in the garden of the mansion. This is Zofu's magic rafts of the Lutuan army, Pharma tells us so. That sounded like, I had a bad feeling about this and immediately ran downstairs. My bad feeling was right. The front door had been broken by the big spear of the magic raft, and Mr. Belfast was lying in a pool of blood. Dad, Pharma, who came downstairs with me, saw this, screamed, and immediately ran over. Pharma, I'm sorry, Dad is already. Dad, Dad, no, no, Yudakun, take Pharma, with you. I don't want her to be lonely anymore. Mr. Belfast, hurry up. They're already coming in, GGHHH. With a short moan, Mr. Belfast collapsed without strength. Dad, I could hear voices coming from the crumbling doorway. They were already coming inside. I'm not going to let this. Pharma, Nanami, we're going to get caught if we don't leave. Let's run like Mr. Belfast said. With that, I forcefully took them around to the back of the mansion. Ugh, gug. As she walked out the back door, crying, Pharma took a small box off the shelf. What's that? Ugh, the box Dad said to take in case of emergency. Oh yeah, maybe it'll be a memento of Mr. Belfast. However, there were also magic rafts placed in the backyard. There was no way to escape. That's right. Let's hide in that warehouse for a while. I ran to the warehouse where that motionless magic raft was and looked for some place to hide. What's in there? What Nanami meant by that was the inside of the cockpit of that non-working magic raft. It's true that the three of us could barely fit in there. Once we were inside the magic raft, we manually closed the hatch. Sure, quiet. I was sitting in the cockpit chair, 
with Nanami and Pharma snuggled up on both sides of me as if they were hugging me. Crack! I can hear the entrance to the warehouse being broken. Oh no, did they find? Quiet. Did you really see someone go in here? Definitely. They were sneaking in. I can hear voices. They're loudspeaker-like voices. So they might be the voices of the pilots of the magic rafts. Hey, there's a magic raft. Huh, that's some ragged antique. But you know, it's a triple highlander we're after. If it's in this thing, no matter how many triple highlanders there are, they can't defeat us with an antique like this. The voice gets closer and closer, and says something outrageous. You want me to smash it just in case? Yeah. Oh no, if we don't get out of this. C-13, activation of the demon god. C-13, activation of the demon god. What should we do, Yuda? If we don't do something, the magic raft will be destroyed. Hey, can I borrow your spear? Looks like the enemy out there got a spear from one of his buddies. He's going to destroy this guy with a spear. No, if we don't. Damn, this guy. Really doesn't work. I said that and grabbed the levers of the spheres that were set up on either side of me. Boom. Woof. Beep. Crinkle. Some strange sounds echoed around me. The lights of the devices around me went on, and the outside was projected. No way, it moved. There are voices from outside. He's moving. Just stab it with your spear. Utah. Stand up, Pharma screams. How do I get up? The magic craft can be controlled by consciousness. Just imagine moving it with your mind. Break it down, antique. The enemy's magic craft attacked me with a spear. I stood up and imagined avoiding it. I felt my body lift up from the ground and the magic craft stood up and quickly avoided the spear. What the hell? This guy is surprisingly quick. Don't let your guard down. It's going to take both of us to take him down. Two magic rafts enter the warehouse. One with a large spear, the other with a sword. And I am unarmed. Can I win in a fight? The magic raft with the spear attacked me. Its movement is not very fast. But it looks like slow motion. I lightly avoided the attack and hit the body of the machine with my fist because I had no weapon. Boom! There was a great sound. And then, to my surprise, the magic raft body dented and he collapsed to his knees with a plop. What the hell? A fist to dent the body of a deranked armored Zophus. I don't know how good the D-rank is, but the enemy is surprised. Another Zophus attacked me with both hands swinging his sword. I stopped it with my right hand. The enemy tried to swing his sword down with a lot of force, but it just made a squeaking sound and didn't budge. It seems that the power of my magic raft right hand is much stronger than the enemy's hands, and I pushed it back and forth, then I shoved it against the wall behind him. I took the sword from the fallen enemy and swung it straight down on his head, bash, his head was crushed, and he stopped moving. This magic raft is strong, I can't believe that the Lituan army's main magic raft, the Zophus, is no match for it. All right, let's just ride this thing and get the hell out of here. When I said that, they nodded and agreed. But it wasn't that easy. When I came out of the warehouse, three Zophus magic rafts were waiting for me. What the hell is this magic raft? Stay alert. The triple Highlander we're chasing may be piloting it. Surround and seize it carefully. Understood. The three of them moved slowly around us. I was somewhat used to it from earlier. So I was calm. The right one was equipped with an axe-like weapon. The front one had a sword and the left one had a spear. The three of them moved at the same time. I grabbed the left one spear attack with my left hand. I grabbed the right one axe attack with my right hand. And for the sword in front of me. I pulled my right hand and forcefully used the magic raft holding the axe as a shield to receive it. Ack. The axe magic raft is slashed in the back with a sword and it released a puff of smoke. What power? I threw the magic raft in my right hand in front of me and broke the spear. Then I kicked the Zophus who was holding the spear, the machine that was kicked, spit white smoke through the gaps in the armor, and then collapsed. The magic raft that had the sword tried to stab me but I quickly avoided the sword and punched him in the shoulder with my right hand. The armor on his shoulder fell off, as if it had exploded, and he fell flat on his back. He made a pushy sound and tried to stand up, but it seems that something malfunctioned and he couldn't stand up properly. After putting all three out of action, we walked away from the compound on foot. 
the infantry was making a lot of noise, but it was easy to shake off the people chasing us on foot. We succeeded in running away in one piece. C-14 sail, C-14 sail. The Lituan army is after Nanami. It's not safe for her to stay in Lituan, so we've decided to leave the country. If we go to the commercial nation of Arpika, the Lituan army may not be able to touch us, Pharma suggested. Okay, let's head there then. When I said that, Nanami pointed out softly. This one stands out, is that okay? Well, normally, magic rafts travel in ride carriers or something like that. Ride carrier? It's a small land ship for transport. Well, there's no such thing as that. Let's just walk away. However, the suburbs are fine, but the city is a quagmire. We moved as far as possible to avoid the human settlements. Pharma, sorry, we made your father. I apologized for that in between walking around in my magic raft. No, it's not Yuta or Nanami's fault. It's Lituan's fault. I, I'll never forgive them. I felt her strong anger. I also feel indebted to Mr. Belfast. And I like that man. So I felt indignant that he was killed. It is the same with Nanami, who agrees with Pharma's words. Let's avenge your dad's death. Let's take down Lituan. Yeah, but we can't do that right now. We need to build up our strength. Let's get a powerful magic raft. I think it's wrong that Yuda's Ludia value is too. The fact that he's operating this magic raft that even the triple Highlander couldn't start is proof of that. Maybe his value is greater than we think. I don't know about that. But I know from the battle at the compound that even I can fight. Nanami will fight too. If it's to avenge my uncle, I'll ride a magic raft. Nanami, thank you, let's get a magic raft that is worthy of you, a triple Highlander, so we can defeat Lutuin, thank you. We now have a goal of avenging Mr. Belfast's death. The first step is to get power, and the practical problem is to get money. Pharma, what was in that box? I remembered the box that Pharma brought with her when we escaped from the mansion and asked her. I'll open it up a bit. With that, she unlocked the box and opened it. Dad prepared something like this for me. When I looked inside the box, I saw that it was packed with jewels. I guess it was prepared for Pharma so that she wouldn't have to worry about money no matter what. Pharma said she would not hesitate to sell the jewels that Mr. Belfast had prepared for her, and suggested that we should use the money to buy a magic raft. Calm down for now, Pharma. That's the most important thing your father left you. Yeah, it's but... I knew how she was feeling. We crossed the border from the suburbs and entered the commercial state of Arpika. The commercial state of Arpika is a country that revolves around economic activity. So it is easy to enter. They only react to large military operations. And in the event that you've got a lot of money to spend, you'll have many advantages here. Well, Pharma, you're not going to change your mind, are you? Yeah, sell jewelry. Okay. But why don't you keep one as a memento of your father? Don't worry, dad's inside me. It's like she's in my mind. I nodded, understanding the feeling. Okay, but how do we sell the jewelry? I don't want to sell it poorly and get a cheap price. I decided to take just one piece of jewelry, ask around for the price to sell it, and find a merchant I could trust. Ho ho, nice jewelry. I'll pay two million for that. I'll buy it for a million. It looks good but it's a bit old. That's a cheap fake. Well, it looks nice, so I'll buy it for 10,000. I asked 10 merchants, and they all gave me different prices. I'm glad I checked. So I tried to ask the merchant who gave me the highest price to buy all my gems. Hey, are you trying to sell jewelry to that merchant? A pointy-headed man with red hair, who looked suspicious, approached me. Ha, huh, yeah? Ha, huh, I thought you might be since you were going around asking about the price of a single gem. But don't, not to that merchant. But he offered the highest price. That's because he figured out that you still have a lot of jewelry. He's going to take it all and buy it off you at a low price. No way. How could you possibly know that? Ha, huh, you're really sweet. That's because I'm one of those evil merchants. I call myself vicious. That's more believable. No evil merchant would call himself evil. Sure. Ha ha ha, it's really simple. Well, okay, how about you hire me? What do you mean? I'll negotiate the sale of the jewels for you, and in return I'll get 10% of the sale. I don't trust you and I don't want to work with you. You don't trust me. Then how about this? If I don't sell the jewels to that merchant for a bigger price than what he offers I won't get paid. 
I see, that way we don't lose anything. I'm not good at negotiating, I'll just ask. If you sell them for more than 20% than the price he offered, I'll give you 10% of the reward, is that okay? Okay, that's good enough for me, I'll take care of it. I'm Jean, nice to meet you, he said with a big smile on his face. C15, negotiation. C15, negotiation. With Jean in tow, I showed the jewels to the merchant I chose and asked him how much they cost. Ten millions, some of them are good, some of them crappy, so that's about it. At any rate, I told the merchant I'd think about it, and declined. Jean took it from there to negotiate, and then I learned what he was capable of. Jean wandered around, looking for merchants to negotiate with. Then he targeted one merchant, showed him the jewels, and began to negotiate. Fifteen million for this gem. Keep the jokes to your face, old man. This is Imelda's tenth, and this is FIFA's grade A. These two alone are worth over ten million at throwaway price, and fifteen million at full price. Are you serious about that? Oh, I see, you're in the business of doing that. There is also a network of merchants in this city. But let me tell you, Mr. Lambert, you are a merchant of this type. When Jean said that, Mr. Lambert turned blue and suggested this. All right. How about 20 million, and I'll buy them. You still don't get it, Mr. Lambert. I know how much this gem sells for, you know. I'm sorry, I'll buy them for 30 million. That's really all I can afford. Okay, sold. He sold the jewelry for three times the price I was offered. At first I thought he was suspicious, but I guess he's really a good guy. Hey, I hope you don't think I'm a nice guy. I got this 3 million just by moving my mouth, originally. You didn't even have to pay for this. I realized that you guys were idiots. I talked to you and this is how I got this money, brilliantly. That may be true, but if it weren't for Jean, we'd have lost a lot more money. Thank you so much. What are you planning to do with that money? I'm thinking of buying a magic raft. Ho ho, you're a rider? Well, hmm, at that rate you're going to get fooled again. Okay, I'm on board. How about you hire me again? What are you going to do? I'll negotiate the purchase of a magic raft for you. I'll get you a good, cheap one. What do you want? Well, this is a free service. I made a lot of money off of you earlier. This is a very helpful suggestion. But I was a little concerned about the fact that it would be free of charge. What Lydia activation value are you looking for? I'm looking for something over 10,000. No way. Are you a Highlander? No, not me. One of those ladies must be a Highlander. Well, I can't say that out loud, but your budget might not be enough for a magic raft for a Highlander. Is it really that expensive? Oh, I think it's going to be a hundred million at the cheapest. Ugh, we're not even close to that amount. Hmm, money is one thing you can't do without. That's what Jean said when he saw my distress. What do you mean? We'll use the money to make more. More? How? In the Coliseum. Do you know those riders they call gladiators? No, I don't know. Magic rafts fight each other for money. Highlanders are rare among gladiators, so I think we can make a lot of money. I see, that's certainly a good idea. I have a track record of defeating Lidwin regular army. I'm starting to feel like I can win. How can I fight in the Coliseum? Whoa, you're on board. Leave it to me. I'll make you a fortune. I had to fight in the Coliseum to buy a magic raft. C-16, training. C-16, training. When I woke up in the morning, I found myself in a strange room. I thought about it for a while and remembered that it was my new room. I was washing my face in the bathroom, and someone knocked on the door of my room. Yes. As I replied, I opened the door and Renell walked in. Good morning, Nagisa. How did you sleep? I slept really well. That's good. I've had breakfast prepared for you. You can eat with me. Thank you. Renell and I went to the dining room where the king and two princesses were already eating. Good morning, Nagisa. Good morning, Nagisa. Good morning. Each of them calls out to me. They're so friendly. I can't believe they're royalty. The breakfast consisted of bread, eggs, soup, salad, and a variety of stews, fish, and meat dishes. It was a simple meal for royalty, but it looked luxurious enough to me. After finishing the meal, Renel and Yukiha took me to the magic raft warehouse where I was introduced to two people. Hi, I'm Jihad, an ace rider in the Amuria army. The person who introduced himself as Jihad is a blonde, fresh, sportsman-like man, and he's pretty cool. 
I'm Delphine, and it's nice to meet you. Delphine is a large, dark-skinned man who seems to be taciturn. I've heard half the stories about Jihad being an ace rider. What the hell, Rennell, who else is an ace? You have me. Delphine, I'm 108 to 107 against you in mock battles. Don't lie. I'm 108 to 107. You're on a losing streak. All right, let's get this over with right away. Let's do it. As they were talking, Yukiha interrupted them. You can't do this today. Both of you, give priority to Nagisa's guidance. I guess we'll have to wait for the mock battle Delphine. Okay. In the meantime, I got into the cockpit of the magic raft. I thought there would be a lot of difficult equipment because of the robot appearance. But the inside was simpler than I expected, and I wondered if I could really operate it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. It's a great way to get a feel for what it's like to be a part of a team. That's what Yukiha explains to me. You mean it works just by thinking about it? That's all you need to do for most movements. Well, it's better to get used to it than to argue about it. Let's try it. The cockpit hatch was opened and closed manually, so I clicked it shut from the inside. I placed my hand on the control sphere and imagined it starting up. I heard something move with a beep and a click, and then the lights came on to supply power to the surrounding equipment. And then the outside was projected onto the hatch. Awesome! I knew Nagisa was a half radar. It activated properly. Yukiha, what should I do? Just try to move whatever you can and rest assured that Jihad and Delphine will support you. Well then, let's try walking for now. I sent the image of walking to the control sphere. La Spella slowly moved her feet and began to move forward. All right, keep it up. I've tried jumping. I squatted down and jumped straight up. I felt a sense of floating, and the next moment, I landed on the spot with a thud. Apparently flying is not an option. As soon as I got used to the basic movements, Yukiha instructed me to do this. I'll have Jihad and Delphine restrain La Spella, and you try to break free. The magic raft Jihad rides is called Barbera. Its Lydia activation value is 3000. Delphine's magic raft is called Tarbella. Its Lydia activation value is also 3000. These two magic rafts will hold me from both sides. What's this for, Yukiha? It's combat training, of course. If you can't get out of that on your own, you'll die in combat. Didn't they already say something about deterrence or something? I mumbled and tried to get out of those restraints by moving my body. In the beginning, they didn't falter, but I guess I got the hang of moving the magic raft a little bit. I put my center of gravity in front of me and brought all my strength backwards at once and swung my two arms through the air. My lost Bella seemed to have more power. Jihad and Delphine fell backwards onto their buttocks as if they had lost their strength. Nagisa, you moved it so well. It looks like both Jihad and Delphine will lose their ace rider seats to you. Hey, hey, Yukiha, cut me some slack, if I was serious. Yes, it won't be long before you overtake Jihad. Delphine, if I get overtaken, it means you'll get overtaken too. Huh, I doubt it. You son of a bitch. All right, we'll settle this right here. Both of you, today is Nagisa's day. They both seem to be getting along well. I knew this country was at peace. C-17, the Colosseum. C-17, the Colosseum. The atmosphere near the Colosseum was completely different. I've never been there. But it seems closer to the image of slums, slightly chaotic streets, etc. Stay close to me. Because all these people here are money-grubbing assholes, Jean warns me. The Colosseum was a rather large dome-shaped building, with seating arranged in a circle and a space in the middle about the size of a baseball stadium. Watch a gladiator fight once before you join, but don't use it as a reference, because gladiators have strong fighting habits and will respond very differently to different people. As Jean said, the gladiator's fight was an interesting one, when one of the opposing magic rafts came out. The audience was unusually excited. An announcement was made in the hall. In the first round of today's tournament, the most notable rider of recent times, who is currently on a 10 fights winning streak, is Shinsuke Yamakura. Against him is an old gladiator, Aldman, who has won a total of 300 games. Wait a minute, didn't he just say Shinsuke Yamakura? There's a guy in my class with the same. Shinsuke Yamakura's magic raft was a tough, yellow, Gorilla-like machine, his opponent was the exact opposite, a smaller, thinner magic raft, 
and from the looks of it, Shinsuke Yamakura seemed to be the stronger of the two. A large monitor like an electronic bulletin board displays the odds of the matchup. It seems that the onlooker's assessment is that the old gladiator has the edge. I'm going to make you regret that you didn't retire as soon as you could, you loser rider. Hmm, the voice is also similar. But I wonder if that quiet Yamakura Shinsuke would say something like this. Hmm, young man, I'll show you that a gladiator's fight doesn't just depend on the Lydia value. As soon as the two sides finish their argument, the match begins. Yamakura seems to have made the first move. He lunges forward and approaches the enemy. The opposing magic raft was waiting for it. Yamakura attacked with a club-like weapon that he was holding. The opponent avoided it and attacked Yamakura's body with a short, knife-like weapon. However, it seems that he didn't do any damage as he didn't have enough attack power. Yamakura realized that the enemy's attack was ineffective and approached the defenseless enemy. The opponent continued his attacks, but they were ineffective. I got you, but it seemed to be an opening for the old gladiator. Yamakura Magicraft, who took a large step forward, was caught by a large hand-like arm emerged from the back of the other Magicraft. What the hell? This is a huge arm that can make a Magicraft immobile. I want you to be tortured to death, kid. He pinned Yamakura down with his big hand. The old gladiator takes out a stick and attaches the knife to the end of it. With that the weapon turned into a short spear. He began to attack Yamakura's magic raft. It seems that the attack is more powerful than the knife, and he is taking damage. Hey, old man you think an attack like that will hurt this Gorian? Let me show you the power of 100,000 max. He then began to pull away the arm that was restraining him. Useless. Even at 100,000 power that arm is. That's when the old gladiator's words stopped. Because the shape of the arm that was restraining him began to transform. No way. With a great noise, the arm bent and broke. Yamakura, now free, swung his club wide and struck the old gladiator on the head with all his might. The old gladiator's lightly armored magic raft seemed to have suffered fatal damage to its body. With its neck blown off by the impact. It collapsed on the spot with a pushy sound. The winner, Shinsuke Yamakura. The crowd cheered as Yamakura celebrated his victory. Yamakura responded to the cheers by raising his hand. C18, the first fight. C18, the first fight. All right, let's go find your opponent. Jean said. What kind of opponent? First of all, he has to have money and be somewhat confident. Is that something you can see on the outside? That's why you have me. I'll take care of that. I'm a good judge of character. Jean chose a man who looked like a Viking from a movie who was laughing gaily in a bar. What, you want to fight me? That's interesting. So what's that guy's track record? This will be his first battle. I'm sorry, but I don't feel like fighting with such a snot-nosed kid. Please choose someone else. Twenty million on the line. What the, is that, are you serious? I'm serious. You're not gonna take it? Pfft. Okay, I'll take it, don't regret it, you too. Thus, my first opponent was decided to be someone named Kevin of the Red Dragon. Your opponent looks strong, will you be okay? Nanami said with concern, and I gave her a confident look. Don't worry, I'm going to win. Wait a minute, are you the one who will fight? Isn't the little girl a Highlander? It's me, not the Highlander, but I'm going to win this thing. No, it's better to let the Highlander handle the magic raft because the Lydia value can make quite a difference. No, well, actually, I don't have a choice, since only I can run the magic raft we have. Huh, what's the logic behind that? You're running a magic raft that a Highlander can't run? I wonder if it's chemistry. No, I've never even heard of such a thing. It's reasonable to assume, simply, that you have a higher Lydia value than that Highlander. No, it doesn't, because my Lydia value is two. What the hell? Two? This is getting weirder and weirder. You can't even lit a magic light with that value. Well, it's kind of a weird magic raft. Hmm, it's not my money to bet, so it's okay. In the Coliseum, there was a union that managed the gladiators' fights, called the Gladiators' Guild, which managed and mediated the fights and guaranteed the victories. In addition, one can apply to the Gladiator Guild for the match in order to prevent the losing opponent from not paying. I thought it was some kind of gray business but I guess it's alright. Well, it seems like it used to be a mess, 
But now that the Gladiator Guild is so powerful, it's pretty quiet. So when's my match? First thing in the afternoon. That's fast. There's a big match in the evening, so first time fights like you does usually get pushed into the early hours. I see. Front seat, I guess. I'm sure you're right, but you should probably get your magic craft ready. There's a waiting room downstairs for the fighters. Go there. Nanami Pharma, I'm going to get the magic craft. Can you wait here with Jean? They nodded. Incidentally, Pharma's large robe hid her entire body, so I couldn't see her nod well, but I could get the vibe of her movements. I was allowed to keep my magic raft in the plaza near the Colosseum. It doesn't have a lock or anything, but no one can move it except me, so no one will steal it. The magic raft was placed safely in its place. I got on it and headed for the Colosseum's antechamber. When I went to the antechamber, an attendant approached me. Are you Yuda, who will be competing in the first match of the afternoon? Yes, I am. This is the magic raft you will use, right? Yes. Then may I ask the name of the magic raft? What's it called? The name of this magic raft is... Oh, yes, I'm having trouble registering it. So can you give me a name right now, even if it's just a random one? A name for my magic raft. I didn't even thought of that. What should it be? White magic raft. Speaking of white, I remembered an anime I saw when I was a kid. It's a story about a white lion cub whose name, I believe, is... Please register your name as Arleo. Arleo, I see. This is how my magic raft got its name. C19. The Gladiator's Battle. C19. The Gladiator's Battle. Before the match, Jean gives me some advice. It was something very Jean-like. Look, even if you can win by a comfortable margin, make it look like you won by the skin of your teeth. Why? The sooner I beat him, the better. Stupid. If you show up looking strong... You're not going to get another match. Just act weak. I see. What a calculating man. The attendant told me to get on the magic raft and go out to the Colosseum. And when I did, the opponent was already waiting for me. And now for the match of the day. Our new gladiator Yuda and his magic raft Arleo. Let's see how far he can go with his unknown power. Against him will be Kevin the Red Dragon. A mid-level gladiator with 50 victories to his name and his magic raft Horga. The odds are displayed on the electronic board, 57 slash 1.5. Come on, let the games begin. When I heard a buzzing sound, my opponent charged toward me. Let's get this over with. The enemy's weapon was a large axe, that seemed to be very powerful. Kevin swung his large axe at me. He moved very slowly. The Zofa's magic rafts that I fought in the mansion were still faster. I dodged it lightly. Ho! Oh, Kevin seemed surprised that I was able to avoid the attack. I could go straight to attacking the defenseless body with my fists. But I was told to struggle. I hit the enemy lightly but the magic raft was blown away. Ack! The crowd cheers. I look over and see a puff of smoke coming from his magic raft. No, this is bad. What will Jean say if I win this easily? The enemy manages to get up. Though he's staggering. Good luck Kevin, you can still fight. Damn, I let my guard down. I didn't expect you to have this much power. But now the real fight begins. And you're about to get one of my special attacks. Um, I don't know what kind of attack. I should take this one. I'm ready to be attacked by the enemy. Kevin's special attack was a large axe that was rotating around like a tornado as it approached the opponent. I received it with my body. Ready to take damage. I'm not sure what to do. My Arleo flicked back Kevin's axe with a loud clang and the impact blew Kevin's magic raft away again. Kevin's magic raft fell with a loud sound. Ugh, wait a minute, don't fall down yet. However, in spite of my wishes, Kevin did not get up. Winner Arleo, Utah! Another loud cheer goes up. Oh, I won so easily. When I returned to the antechamber, Jean was waiting for me with a devilish expression. I told you to struggle, you idiot Yuta. I'm sorry, I didn't think you could win so easily. The next opponent will be stronger, be prepared, because you won't be able to find a weak opponent anymore. I know, I know. While I was talking with Jean, Nanami and Pharma came in excitedly. Look, Yuta, we made so much money. Then she showed me a large number of gold coins. What's wrong with that? I bet all the money for living expenses on Yuta. What the hell? 
I'm pretty sure I gave 100,000 gold to Nanami for living expenses. She said she bet it all. I'm pretty sure my odds were something like 57. So that means 100,000 times. 57, 5, 700, 000. zero, zero. Hey, I actually had a bet on you too. Jean said happily. How much did you bet? I got 100,000 gold. Damn, I should have bet more. What the heck? Looks like we made a lot of money in that one fight. C20, the next battle. C20, the next battle. My victory in the first round was so overwhelming that the next matchup was hard to decide. Then, Gene said he would use a secret plan. We're fighting in a handicap match. Handicap match? Yes, we're going to give you a disadvantage. What? Disadvantage. For example, a multiple opponent fight, like Yuda alone against three opponents. Hey, that's not fair to Yuda. Yeah, Yuda, you don't have to fight like that. Nanami and Pharma say so, but I can't refuse. It's also my fault for not listening to Jean's advice to struggle in the first fight. Then the next match was decided. It's a big match. A three-on-one match with a stake of 40 million. Your opponents are three middle-ranked gladiators. All three are much better than your first opponent. So it's going to be a tough fight, but go all out. Are you sure you don't want me to hold back? Don't worry about anything else. Just think about winning. Hmm, to be honest, I haven't really fought seriously yet. I don't even know how strong I actually am. Right, Yuda, three against one with bare hands is tough. Let's go buy some weapons. Well, I could carry a weapon, couldn't I? What, you didn't prefer the barehanded style? I just never thought of using a weapon. You're not. Very smart, are you? Shut up, you can't deny it, but... Anyway, I had to buy a weapon for Arleo. The weapon shop for magic rafts had all kinds of weapons. I think I prefer the sword. Why? Because it's cool. I'll choose it for you. It's a hundred times better. Yeah, I like the Tanfa. It's a good weapon for both offense and defense. No way, is not cool. Don't choose a weapon based on its looks. In the end, I was forced to buy a Tanfa. And it was quite expensive. 1.2 million gold. And the match begins. Yuda, look, that Tomfa is custom made out of Magnanite. It's got a lot of offensive power. So go ahead and smash them as hard as you can with it. I nodded at Jean's words. Yuda, do your best. Yuda, don't get hurt. Nanami and Pharma are also cheering me on. They have some kind of paper in their hands. So I guess they bet on me again. In today's special match. A newcomer who showed overwhelming power in his debut match against three middle rank gladiators in a handicap match. Will he be able to overturn the rumors that he is reckless and too ignorant? This is his second match. The new gladiator Yuda and his magic raft Arleo. Against him are three gladiators, Jimmy, Fal, and Epilini, and their magic rafts Rudra, Bunchi, and Hydra. The odds appear on the electronic board. 48 to 1.7 of course, I'm 48. Apparently, they thought the first match was a fluke. Come on, let the match begin. As the match begins, the three of them slowly approach to surround me. He 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 he, you're an idiot. You don't seem to understand how much of a disadvantage a three on one match is. Hmm, like this, if you are attacked from three directions at once, you can't even dodge. Our attack can destroy your magic raft with a single blow. You know what that means, don't you? The three of them explained to me how they have the advantage. I don't need to be told that. They attacked at the same time. The enemy in front of me was a long spear, the one on the left was a large axe, and the one on the right was a two-handed sword. I avoided the attacks of the long spear by twisting my body, and then received the attacks of the right and left enemies with my tanfa. What the hell? I took advantage of the three surprised people. Using the tanfa, I struck the long spear from above and snapped it, then stepped forward and hit the head of the enemy with the long spear by turning the tanfa. A dull thud was heard, and the neck was bent. The magic raft fell to his knees, making a puffing sound. The enemy on the right swung his two-handed sword at me. I kicked the magic raft with my left foot, and the man, who had lost his balance, fell backwards. The aircraft on the left seems to be upset to see it. I spun my body around and struck it hard with the tanfa. There was a mashing sound and the body of the magic raft was heavily dented. It let out a puff of smoke and slowly fell down. 
The right side Magicraft gets up, but when I look around, I realize that it's only me who can move. I poked him with the protruding part of the tomfa and a large hole appeared in its neck that stopped him from moving. He then dropped the two-handed sword he was holding and collapsed. Winner Arleo, Utah. When the announcement was made, the crowd cheered loudly. C21, after the victory. C21, after the victory. This chapter was sponsored by rxst 3 r Thank you for your generosity. After winning the handicap match, I returned to the antechamber. Utah, Nanami and Pharma come up to me. I've made another fortune. I knew she was betting on me, and she has a lot of money. How much did you bet this time? A million. Damn. I splashed the water I was drinking. Well, I think the multiplier was 48x, so that's 48 million. No way. You're making more money than the cost of the fight. In the meantime, let's go for a sumptuous meal. When I said that, Nanami and Pharma nodded with big smiles on their faces. You're going out to eat. Take me with you, okay? Jean comes over with a beaming face and says so. That's the face of Jean who bet on me. It was a 3 to 1 handicap match, and most of the customers were betting against you, so I made a lot of money. How much did Jean bet? A million! No way! How much money are you going to make off of my match? Anyway, we came to an out of the way restaurant to have a sumptuous meal. Excuse me, but this is a very expensive restaurant, that a customer of your stature, no, it's not something you can afford. So why don't you go to that restaurant over there for the common people? I was rudely refused and was about to give up, thinking that a common restaurant would be fine. But Jean didn't like the waiter's attitude and argued against him. What the hell? Are you saying we don't have enough money to eat in this restaurant? I don't know how much money food in this restaurant costs, but can you turn away a customer who has a pile of 100,000 gold coins? As he said this, he displayed the 100,000 gold coin in a bag. Sorry about this. We'll have a seat for you in a moment. After all, money is a powerful thing, and the clerk changed his attitude in a hurry. The interior of the restaurant has the atmosphere of an old medieval palace and is obviously very expensive. I don't know if I can afford this kind of luxury, but today is special because it is also a victory celebration. Ma'am, may I take your robe? Pharma is covering her face and body with a robe. The shopkeeper tries to. No, she's got a bad burn. Just let her be, okay? Oh, I'm sorry about that, the clerk said and stepped aside. It's delicious. I've never had anything like this before. Nanami is happy to hear that. Pharma seems to be happy too, so I'm really glad I came. I'm sure you'll be glad you came. Jean, we'll split it. Don't be stingy. You made a lot of money. You made a lot of money too. Hey, well, yeah, I did. Ha ha ha. Jean is not really a bad person. Bad people can't smile and laugh like this. The four of us were having a nice dinner together, and someone appeared to interfere with that. Gahaha, you've come a long way from being a slave. It was a familiar face. Yamakura, Shiba, Haranishi. To my surprise, three of my classmates were there. What kind of magic does a piece of trash with a Ludia value of two have to use a magic raft? It must be a very one. When Yamakura said that, Shiba continued to speak as well. And I saw the match today. What a bogus match. It was nothing short of monkey business. How much money did you give those three gladiators? Apparently, he thinks today's match was rigged. I'm not playing any games. More importantly, I think you guys have changed your personalities. Gah! Changed personalities? I'm sure you're right. We're special. What happened? Apparently, these guys thought they were special. How pathetic. Haranishi, you think so too? Haranishi, who was my closest friend in the class. I didn't want him to have changed. Ha! Huh. Who are you calling out to Yuta? You must call me Haranishi-sama. Don't you think you can talk to us as equals with your trash Lydia value? I'm not angry anymore. I'm just sad. Perhaps sensing my expression, Naomi and Farmer rebuffed Haranishi and the others. You guys are fooling around with Yuta. Get out of here. Yuta is not trash. Yuta is a good guy. I'm glad you two think so. Gah! What, Yuta, are you raising these kids to be tame? Well, I guess raising trash suits trash. Hey, it's not polite to wear a robe like that here. I know you're trying to hide your ugly face, 
But just take it off. As he said this, Yamakura stripped off Farma's robe. Farma's beastly body was exposed. A small scream could be heard in the store, and the crowd began to rustle. I quickly picked up the robe he had stripped off and put it on Farma. Then I punched Yamakura. Stay! What are you doing, you trash? Don't you dare touch my noble body. What's noble about that, you idiots? Hey, the trash called us stupid. That's funny. Let's kill this guy. Then Jean, who had been quiet until now, entered the conversation. Hey, I don't know what kind of relationship you guys have, but you're gladiators, right? Why don't you settle who's right in the Colosseum? Oh, this garbage and us in a match? What kind of match is that? I was indeed pissed off, and I shouted. It's a three-on-one handicap match. The stakes are 100 million. Gahaha, is going to be an easy win. I'll fight you, trash you to dot. Thus, the next match was decided to be against the classmate. C22, what is a classmate? C22, what is a classmate? The match between the three up-and-coming gladiators and the mysterious newcomer, me, was attracting a lot of attention even before beginning due to the high stakes of 100 million. I'm sure you'll be disappointed to know that all three of these gladiators have won at least 10 straight games since their debut. Are you okay, Yuda? It seems that Jean has been looking up information on Haranishi and his team, and tells me so, 10 wins in a row without losing? That's what warped their character. It's okay. For some reason, I never felt like I was going to lose. Wherever it comes from I had no doubt at all that I would win. I don't think it comes from confidence in winning. I think it comes from the belief that I will win. The Colosseum was more exciting than I've ever felt before. The match time was also a night and treated as a main. Yuda, don't get hurt. That's right. You can lose, but don't do anything dangerous. When Nanami and Pharma told me that, I felt energized. I got into Arleo and walked to the entrance. The hottest match of the day. Shinsuke Yamakura, Yuji Haranishi, and Yosuke Shiba the up-and-coming gladiators from Team Dorf, who haven't lost a single match since their debut, and have double-digit victories. Their magic rafts are Lanza, Idal, and Mizhi. Against them is Yuda, a rookie gladiator who has won the last two matches by a landslide. His magic raft is Arleo. The odds are displayed on the electronic bulletin board. 42 to 1.6 They still think my wins were a fluke. Or is that Haranishi and his team are highly regarded? Hey Yuda, don't complain about dying. Hey Yamakura, don't be so crazy about killing your former classmate. Such a reckless fight would be like suicide. Ha ha ha, you're right, this is Yuda's suicide. Killing him is not an option. Hmm, people can change so much. I should be careful. The buzzer sounds to start the match. The fight is beginning. Yamakura wielded a club-like weapon. Shiba a long spear, and Haranishi a two-handed sword. The three of them seemed to have completely underestimated me and approached me, unguarded. Here, Yuda, try to avoid it. Yamakura then came at me with his club. It's certainly faster than the two opponents I've fought so far, but it still feels slow. I avoided it lightly. Oh, he dodged that one. Lucky. Yamakura, next time let me attack him. I'll skewer him with this Longinus spear. Shiba attacked with his long spear. The long reach seems to be its advantage, but he is using the spear in close combat, not at a distance. I hit the spear handle with my tonfa as hard as I could and broke it off. Hey, what the hell are you doing? This spear is expensive. So much for playing around, come at me like you mean it. I said that with a great deal of trepidation. TCH, what the hell are you talking about Lydia Value 2? Yamakura. I'm seriously going to kill you, because it seems that idiots need to die to understand. The three of them moved to surround me. Suddenly, the Shiba, whose spear has been broken, jumps on me. He clutches at Arleo's torso, blocking my movement. Die, Yuta! Yamakura's club and Haranishi's two-handed sword attacked me from both sides. I caught both attacks with my hands. No way! You gotta be kidding me! After grabbing Yamakura's club and Haranishi's two-handed sword I crushed them. Crushing a tektite weapon with one hand. No way. I lifted Shiba, who was clinging to my body and tossed him high in the air. He flew up quite high before falling. Boom. When he fell, smoke came out of his magic raft and stopped moving. Shiba, damn. 
Yamakura hit me with his body. I punched him in the torso with my tanfa. The torso deformed to the point where the original form could not be recognized. He fell backwards like he was blown away. The last remaining Haranashi was completely freaked out and backed away from me. It's a lie. There's no way Lydia Value 2 can do this. What the hell is wrong with you? You lied to us. What are we going to do? If we lose this game, we're finished. It's all over. I don't know what you mean. You got what you deserved. Damn it. Oh, he just said that and lunged at me. I smashed Haranashi's face with my tanfa as hard as I could. Its head was blown off with a beautiful sputtering sound. Haranashi's magic raft collapsed on the spot. Winner Arleo, Utah. I listened in silence to the loud cheers. I wondered if the rest of the class was like this. I was worried about that. C23, Natural Genius slash Yuki. C23, Natural Genius slash Yuki. Two on the right, and three on the left. I synchronized with Elvira and searched for signs of my surroundings. Suddenly, I felt a large presence behind me. I imagined minimal movement, twisting my body to avoid the attacks from behind, and at the same time attacked with my right rapier. The attack was aimed precisely at the joints of the legs, and the blow put the magic raft out of action. Taking a large leap, I landed behind the two on the right and pierced the core drive on their backs, disabling them. Then I ran to the remaining three. The three of them tried to fight back with swords. First, I quickly poked the one in front of me in the face and destroyed it. I grabbed the magic raft on the left that attacked me with the sword and threw it to the other one. The two bodies collided and I attacked quickly with my rapier. After a series of fast attacks the two magic rafts were filled with holes and stopped moving. Then Yuto's voice came over the communication stone. Yuki, that's enough. This was a mock battle to show the results of a month of training, where I achieved results that everyone could appreciate. I'm amazed at how much power you've acquired in a month. Io, the Minister of War, called out to me after seeing my achievements. No, I owe it. To Yudo-san, who taught me everything. I answered that, but the person who was mentioned denied it. No, it's Yuki's talent. I didn't expect you to grow up so fast either. I think he's just encouraging me, but no one will deny what he says, and even the military brass who were there praised me hands down. Then let me give you a chance to get some real combat experience. Yes, perhaps you'd like to join the Zimri in front. The conversation went on and on, and my first real fight was about to be decided. In the meantime, Mr. Yo, what happened to the case I asked you about? It was about Yuta's rescue. I listened with high expectations but the result disappointed me. We identified the slaver who bought him and negotiated to buy him back, but he seems to have escaped. The slaver hid it and negotiated with us. We made him pay with the sanction of death. Oh no, but don't worry, our intelligence agencies are working on a top priority case, and I'm sure we'll have some good news for you in the next few days. Please, I'm worried about him. Yes, I'll do my best. That night the military hosted a party to celebrate my growth. Many top riders of the Elysian Empire were present. You must be Yuki. Yudo tells me you have great talent. Lady Yuki, this is Emesis a quadruple Highlander. Yo introduces him as such. I'm Yuki, nice to meet you. Don't be so rigid, you're the star of the show today. Yes, I'll have them prepare the best drink, a 60-year-old Bretona, and we'll drink it together. Um, I'm not a drinker. All right. I'll have them bring you some fruit wine. As I was talking with Emesis, a beautiful woman with red hair approached me. Emesis, it's not nice to have the star of the day all to yourself. Yuki-sama, this is Rosetta-sama, a quadruple highlander. Io quickly introduces the woman. Nice to meet you, Yuki. Nice to meet you. Rosetta, weren't you in the fight against Luganin? Emesis asked Rosetta. Oh, didn't you hear? Luganin fell three days ago. Well, that's fast work. I didn't even have to go there, because we already had the upper hand. I see. I guess Prince Immuno is scoring points. I think the fall of Luganin has elevated Prince Immuno's status as successor. As the two quadruple Highlanders were having a conversation I didn't understand, my mentor, Yudo, came over and warned them. Leaving the main character alone and having an adult conversation is not a very thing to do. Oops, indeed, Yuki, my bad. You're right. We shouldn't be having this conversation right now. 
It seemed to me that these two people, who were honest enough to apologize, were not bad people. C24, the strongest gladiator. C24, the strongest gladiator. Me, Nanami, and Pharma were staying at a top quality hotel, which was a reward for having made a lot of money from the fight against Haranishi and his team, which was more than enough for us. Come on, Pharma. It's soft. Naomi, let's see who can jump higher. Yeah, I'm in. Nanami and Pharma are happily jumping in the bed. But Jean and I were having a serious talk. It's about time. You won't be making any more money as a gladiator. Oh, really? You're too strong. No one's going to fight with you. Well, I knew I overdid it. But you've already made over 200 million. So let's use that to buy a magic raft. I'd like to buy two magic rafts and a ride carrier if possible. Can I buy them? I wanted to get a magic raft for Pharma, and I still wanted to buy a ride carrier for transportation. One is for the Highlander, right? What kind of performance do you want from the other one? I want a magic raft that can match 7,800 Lydia value. Half radar, that's going to be a pretty expensive purchase, too. Half radar magic rafts are in high demand, so they're very expensive. I see. I was thinking that it would be half the price for a Highlander magic raft. That's going to take more than about 200 million. Can I just have one more match? When I said that, Jean named one person who might be willing to accept my challenge. There is one guy though, who might be willing to accept a match with you right now. But I wouldn't recommend fighting that person. Why? He's the king of the gladiators. Called the strongest gladiator. Undefeated in 120 battles. Absolute champion of the double highlanders. Double highlander? It's a monster with a Ludia value of 23,000. No matter how strong Yuda is, he's a difficult opponent. 23,000 would be better than 32,000 Nanami. I think I can handle him. I will fight that champion, and it will be my last match as a gladiator. You can't be serious. You're facing a double Highlander. I don't care, I'm going to win. I won't stop you if you do. But how much do you want to bet? I'm thinking 200 million. You're such an idiot. Thus, I had to negotiate a match with the strongest gladiator. That day, Nanami, Pharma and I slept side by side. In a large room with several beds, we lay close together in one bed. After we avenge Pharma's father, let's buy a house somewhere and live together. Nanami began to talk about the future. Yeah, I want the three of us to live together too. Pharma agreed with that. Yeah, that would be good. I was really hoping we would. Yuda, you're going to have another match, aren't you? Nanami said with a bit of sadness in her voice. Ah, uh, my last match as a gladiator. Take it easy. I've never taken it easy. If Yuda gets hurt there's no point. Pharma says so too. I wonder if they both have some kind of ominous premonition. Maybe they have a sense that my next opponent will be a very strong. The next day, we went to ask the gladiator king for a match. The opponent for my last match was in the VIP room of the Coliseum. Oh, I thought you were some reckless old man who wanted to challenge me to a match. But you're a pretty boy. The king of gladiators, I imagined a stern uncle. But there was a beautiful woman with short red hair. So what are the terms of the match? How about 200 million? Jean offers. 200 million? I'm not interested in money. Well... How about 200 million plus, the loser of the match becomes the property of the winner? Hey you, you're cute and I want you as a pet. Don't be silly, I can't accept such terms. Jean immediately refused. Oh, well then I'm not going to take this fight. When she said that, I didn't hesitate to speak up. I'll accept your terms. Let's have a match. Oh, you're cute and you've got guts. I seriously like you. Hey, if you lose, you'll be her property. Don't do it. The conditions are too bad. Don't worry, I'll win. Where's your confidence coming from? Boy, I'm Alana. It's nice to meet you. I'm not a boy, I'm Yuta. Hmm, so, Yuta, I can't wait to make you mine. I got chills down my back. What will she do to me if I lose? This was the first time I felt fear. C25, the last fight of the gladiators. C25, the last fight of the gladiators. The match against Alana attracted an extraordinary amount of attention compared to previous matches. Hearing that the strongest gladiator was fighting, a large number of fans rushed to the Coliseum. That's one hell of a crowd, Jean commented as he looked at the crowd overflowing outside the Coliseum instead of entering it. 
I don't care how many people are watching, I'm going to fight as hard as I can. The odds on this fight are going to be crazy. 67 slash 1.1 is unheard of. I don't think anybody's betting on me. No, there's one guy here. What, are you betting on me again, Gene? Gene's not the only one. Pharma and I bet on Yuda too. I have to win in order to make the three of you money. Hmm, I only spent 100,000 this time, so I won't be upset if I lose. Go ahead and crush your balls as hard as you can. No, if I lose, I'll become Alana's property. Oh, that's right. Well, if you're pretty, go ahead and win. Good luck, Yuta. Be careful, Yuta. Most of the audience will probably be rooting for Alana. But I have some reassuring friends here. Well, I guess I'll go win. And make some money. Since it was a high-profile match, the entrance was more flamboyant than usual. Fanfare, and some kind of band playing. In today, or rather, the hottest match of the year, the strongest of the gladiators, Alana, has returned to this coliseum. The queen, who has been on the management side as a gladiator advisor for a long time, now faces a new challenger. Against her is Yuda, a rookie gladiator who's been on a roll, winning a series of handicap matches. There's a lot of talk about how long he can last against Alana. By the way, Alana's longest match so far is 2 minutes and 32 seconds, can he beat that? Apparently, the topic of discussion is not about winning or losing, but about how long I can fight. The venue began to buzz with excitement, anticipating Alana's appearance, with a fanfare that was even louder than my own. The bright red magic raft had a slim and lean form, and its weapons were small swords in both hands. I guess you could call them twin swords. I've ever felt it in my gut. She's definitely the strongest opponent I've ever fought. Boy, are you ready for this? I'm not a boy. I'm Yuta. That's right, Yuta. The buzzer sounds to start the fight. The match begins. The moment I heard the sound of the buzzer, a red magic raft was already approaching me. It's fast. Alana attacked me quickly with both swords. I hurriedly blocked them with my tomfa. The tomfa and swords clashed with and sparks flew. After five or so attacks, Alana moved to the right. I stepped back once I saw an opening. But when Alana saw this, she took a step forward and closed the distance between us again. She also attacked me with her sword, just like before. I managed to block that attack with my tonfa. Damn, her attacks are so fast that I don't have time to counterattack. I wonder if I can do something. What's the matter, Yuta? You're not attacking me? I would if I could. But then I got an idea, Alana's magic raft seems to specialize in speed. Maybe it doesn't have much power. If I could somehow bring it to a power comparison. Alana attacked with both swords in rapid succession as if she were dancing. Her quick and irregular movements made it impossible to find an opening. Maybe I should just take a few hits and go for it. With that in mind I forcefully stepped forward and tried to hit her as hard as he could with my tonfa. Alana quickly avoided the attack and poked Arleo in the neck with her right sword. Click. The sound of metal striking metal echoes, and Alana's sword is bounced back. No way. Alana seemed to be surprised by this and stopped moving for a moment. I spun the tonfa in my left hand and smashed Alana's body. She twisted her body to avoid a direct hit, only to have the attack graze her body, making a strange crackling sound and shaving off part of the body. You're doing it, Yuta. You're the first person to ever hurt my Bersia. Not just hurt, I'll defeat you. You're funny, try it. And if you can do it, I'm yours. The audience cheered loudly. I looked at the electronic board and saw that the time had passed three minutes. C26, outcome. C26, outcome. The fact that I had bounced back Alana's sword had given me a sense of security. The enemy's attack would not work on my Arleo. That's what I thought. I attacked her with the tonfa, and Alana dodged it lightly. It was a big swing, and it left a big gap. In that gap, Alana went into an attacking stance. Instead, a strange sound was heard, a high-pitched sound, as if countless sharp winds were blowing, and then it turned into an explosion. Boom! The magic raft shook from the tremendous impact. I looked and saw that Arleo's shoulder parts were blown off. What? I was surprised to hear Alana say this. What, you don't even know how to concentrate Lydia? How can you fight me like that? Concentrate Lydia. 
Lydia value is constantly changing depending on your emotions and concentration. You have to focus your consciousness to control the Lydia value and bring it to the maximum value. That's Lydia concentration. Alana was kind enough to explain that to me. Well, lecture is over. It's time to end it. The movement of Alana augmented with Lydia's had changed dramatically. Alana's twin swords attacked me with great speed. I tried to block them with my tonfa, but I couldn't and Arlio was hit. Parts of his arms are blown off, his body is torn apart, and part of his face is blown off. No, I am going to lose, what should I do? Then it occurred to me that, I should just concentrate my Lydia too, but I don't even know how to do that, can I do that? No, I have to do it. I meditated, and concentrated my consciousness. A few times I accompanied Nagisa to the temple to meditate. The feeling of that time. Eventually, I saw a glowing white dot in the darkness. The more I concentrated on it, the larger it became. And the dot of light was turning into a large circle of light. I imagined the circle to be even bigger. Soon that circle of light filled my entire field of vision and I saw something. What are you waiting for? I'll finish you off without reservation. It's strange. I saw Lana's attack even though my eyes were closed. I didn't dodge that attack. I felt no need to avoid it. Oh my god! It was Alana's Bersia who was blown away by the attack. What the hell? That attack used the maximum 2.5 million power of Bersia. It's enough to tear apart even a double Highlander magic raft. And that aura on Yuta's magic raft is... My Arlia was surrounded by a pale aura and there was some kind of sizzling sound. It was a strange feeling, like I was assimilated into Arleo. I felt like I could move it like my own body now. Alana quickly stood up and attacked with her twin swords. I don't know what happened, but I'm the one who's going to win. Yuta, Alana's attack appears to be slow. I lightly twist my body to avoid it, and in a split second, I slammed the Tonfa into Bersia's body. There was a dull thud. And Bersia's body dented. She fell to her knees and collapsed. Then she stopped moving, while emitting a puff of smoke. Winner, Arleo, Yuta. The venue was quiet for a moment. After a few seconds of silence, a loud cheer broke out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I won, just in time. I quickly approached the fallen Bersia. Alana, are you okay? The hatch of the Bersia is opened with a strange noise and Alana appears safe and sound. Yuta, open the hatch. She screamed, are you mad that I won? But if I ignore her, I'm afraid of what she'll do later. I open the hatch as Alana said, then she came up to the cockpit with a thump and hugged me. Yuta, I'm seriously in love with you. I'm all yours now. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. No, that's it. But even if we don't talk about you becoming my property, what are you talking about? Of course you can't do that. A bet is a bet. Just as it's wrong for the loser to say no to the condition, it's wrong for the winner to say no to the condition. What? I'm not sure that makes sense. Now, what should I do? C27, the retirement of a gladiator. C27, the retirement of a gladiator. After the battle with Alana, we had come to a restaurant to eat. It was a celebration of victory. But for some reason... There was also a loser among us. Here, Yuta, give me a kiss. The loser was attached to me so tightly that she wouldn't leave me. Hey, sister, get away from Yuta. It was Naomi who said this, with a slightly different vibe than her usual quiet demeanor. Oh, well, you're jealous. But I'm Yuta's property. I'm his property. And I'm allowed to be around him and make out with him. What's your logic? Property, Yuta. I'll be Yuta's property too. Hey. What are you talking about, Nanami? Wah, me too. For some reason, Pharma started saying that too. Hold on, for now, Alana. It's hard to eat when you're so attached to me, so get away from me. When I say so, she surprisingly obeys me. So, are you sure you want to be Yuta's property? Yuta says you don't have to become his property. Of course I will. I'll never leave Yuta. I'll always be with you, master. Ugh, my head hurts. I've made enough money and I'll quit being a gladiator. What about you? I'm quitting too. I don't have any opponents anyway. I've been an advisor, but it hasn't been fun, so I'm retiring just in time. Well, I don't mind. 
but a double Highlander would be useful for my next business venture. Jean just said something strange. What's the next business? And what's this strange feeling? I couldn't keep quiet and ask Jean. Jean, what's your next business venture? Didn't I tell you, I'm going to start a mercenary group? Wait a minute. You didn't tell me you're staying after I purchased the magic rafts. You can't just abandon me when you're done with me. No, that's right, bud. Think about it, those ladies over there. The double Highlander Gladiator and Yuda who defeated her. How can we not make a mercenary group with this lineup? I don't know. I don't need to make any more money. Why not? You know, you never told me what your ultimate goal was. We're going to defeat Lidwin. The kingdom of Lidwin? Come on. No matter how strong you are, you can't go to war with a country. You'll need more money for that. What? Is that so? Of course. Without supplies, there's no war. But, Alana, who is listening, also joins in the conversation. Yuda, that man is right. You can't fight with a country just because you're strong. That's how it is. I was thinking of defeating the army and getting the leaders to apologize to Pharma. Looks like that's a naive idea. What does a mercenary group do? Simply put, it's war. You're hired by the government to fight the enemy. No, I can't let Naomi and the others join such a dangerous thing. Yeah, that's true. Well, you and Alana can start off with the two of you, and then we can get more people to join you. That's fine, but it seems that Jean can't be beaten with words. No. If Yuda fights, then Naomi fights too. Me too. I'll fight too. Somehow I had a feeling you two were going to say that. Nanami Pharma, this is war. It's absolutely dangerous. But we were going to fight Lidwin. Lidwin is a country too. What's the difference? Yes, Yuda, we can fight too. Wait a minute. I'm starting to think this is another one of Jean's plans. Anticipating that the two of them would say this. I really can't be too careful. He's a really tricky guy. All right, you two, we'll fight together. But don't overdo it and run if you're in danger. When I said that, they nodded cheerfully. So, it's decided that we're going to form a mercenary group. C-28, big purchase. C-28, big purchase. A ride carrier and two magic rafts. I have a ride carrier, you don't have to buy it. That's what Alana tells me when I tell her about what I plan to purchase. Look, I know ride carriers are expensive. What are you talking about? I am Yuta's property. My property is Yuta's property. I'm a little confused as to what her logic is. Well, if I can get it for free, that's great. Also, Yuda, there's someone I'd like to introduce you to. Who? Liza, come here. When she called out to her, a boyish girl came running up to us. This girl wants to be a part of our group. She's a mechanic who's been working on my Bersia for a long time, and she's a genius at Magicraft maintenance. It would be great if you could help us out with the maintenance of the Magicrafts. Nice to meet you, Liza. I called up to her, but Liza stared at me with an angry look on her face. Did I do something wrong? I hate you. Stop trying to seduce Lady Alana. What? No, don't say that. Hey, Liza, I'm telling you it's not like I was seduced. I lost and became Yuta's property. How dare you win? And just because you won, it's vulgar to own a woman. Give me back Lady Alana. It seems that this girl just wants to be with Alana rather than wanting to be a part of the team. If she wants to complain, she should do it to Lady Alana. Liza, this is a done deal, and if you don't like it, go somewhere else. In response to the cold words of Alana, Liza clenched her mouth into an indescribable expression and returned to her work in silence, looking at her sad expression. I felt somewhat sorry for her. More importantly, Yuda, what kind of specs do you want for the magic raft? It seems that Alana has a history of buying magic rafts, so she asked me. They want a magic raft for a Highlander, Jean answers for me. I see, but isn't Arleo enough for you? No, it's not for me. I want to buy magic rafts for Naomi and Pharma. Wait a minute, you're a Highlander, aren't you? Well, my god, we should definitely fight. So what's their exact Lydia value? I was a little hesitant to say that when I was asked that. I heard that Nanami's Lydia value is at a level that could move a country. But, Alana and Jean are not sure what to think. Nanami's at 32,000. Pharma's at 7,800. What? Nanami is a triple Highlander. Jean exclaimed loudly in surprise. We're in a private warehouse of Alana. So outsiders wouldn't have heard us. That's amazing. 
I thought I was the second best in the mercenary corps. Alana is also surprised by the number. So I guess I should buy a triple Highlander or double Highlander magic raft instead of a Highlander one. Well, there's not much demand for them, so the price isn't too different from the Highlander ones. Alana nodded at Jean's suggestion, and I also agreed with the two of them. The top class magic rafts are not sold by ordinary merchants, so we went to a large merchant who does business with the government through Alana's connections. Wow, there's Jelma, Epsis, awesome, all these magic rafts you only see in books. Pharma, a magic raft fanatic, was looking at the models lined up with a glint in her eye. Well, 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 Miss Alana, what brings you here today? Perhaps you're switching from Bersia. A small, fat man who looked like he was a merchant approached and spoke with Alana. No, I'm here today to purchase magic rafts for my companions. Can you show me the ones you recommend for Triple Highlanders and the ones for Half Radar? Triple Highlander? That's a big deal. Okay, we have just the best magic rafts. Actually, I was thinking of selling it to the Elysian Empire. But since it is none other than Alana. Then he took us to the back of the hall. There was a beautiful, golden, shining magic raft. The magic raft Vajra has a startup ludicrous value of 30,000, a maximum output of 3.2 million, SS rank for armor, and S rank for maneuverability, so its performance is unquestionable. That's true, so how much is it? I'd like to say 500 million, but since it's none other than Alana, I'll sell it to you for 400 million. What do you say, Yuda? It's a nice magic raft, no doubt, but... Yeah, Nanami, you like this guy? After all, it can't start unless the person riding it likes it. I thought I'd let Nanami make the decision. Beautiful figure. My dad used to say that gold is the color of happiness. I like this one. Okay, I'll buy it then. Just as I was about to make that decision, Jean entered the conversation. Wait, wait, wait. You can buy it. It looks like a nice plane. And Nanami likes it. That's fine. But don't just accept the first price the merchant offers. 400 million. Don't be stupid. Of course I'm going to bargain. Well, it's true that from Jean's point of view, there is no such thing as shopping without bargaining. Jean began to bargain with the merchant. It turned into a big battle. That lasted one hour. C29. Beyond bargaining. C29. Beyond bargaining. Jean is amazing. In the end. The price of 400 million dropped to 250 million. That's pretty good. How about you? Come work for me. The big merchant suggested this to Jean. But he laughed and turned it down. Why did you say no? I think you could use your talents better than you do with me. What are you talking about? It's obvious. What do you mean it's obvious? I think I'm going to make more money with you. He patted me on the shoulder as he said that. You're going to make more money with me. I couldn't quite figure out what he meant by that. But it seems that he has some kind of arrangement going on. How about this one for half radar? It's a special magic raft. But it's very strong if you know how to use it. He showed me a small blue magic raft. What kind of special? Is it? Garuda. Activation Ludia value 6200. Maximum power 100,000. Armor C rank. Maneuverability A rank. It's an excellent half radar magic raft. But its main selling point is that it can fly. It can fly? A magic craft that can fly seems to be rare. Which surprises both Alana and Jean. Although it can fly it only floats. But if you use it with weapons such as arrows. You can attack from the sky in a one sided manner. Which is very effective. Arrow is probably a bow and arrow. Sure that sounds strong. So how much is? Hmm. I hope I don't have to deal with you again. So I'll give you the bottom price. And if that doesn't satisfy you, you can give up. The price offered by the merchant was 100 million. Which is not a problem since Nanami's magic raft was bought at a discount. And we'll see what Pharma thinks. It's amazing that can fly. I want to ride this baby. Apparently Pharma liked it. But Jean didn't give up on the bargaining. Mister, I'm sure you don't want to deal with me either. So I'll give you 100 million. But can you give me a freebie? A freebie? Yes, for example, as you said earlier, an arrow which suits this guy. I see. Okay, then let's get the latest arrow. Both of them were tired, but unlike earlier, the negotiation was concluded quickly. How's the ride, you two? 
I call out to Naomi and Pharma as they get into the magic rafts they purchased. Both of them were somewhat awkward as it was their first time piloting a magic raft, but they managed to move. Wow, Yuta! I'm riding the magic raft. It's moving. Okay, Nanami, move slowly, but don't overdo it. You both have good senses. It should be difficult to walk at first. That's right. I was suddenly in a battle from the beginning. I moved it unconsciously and I don't even remember if I was moving it well. This, how do you fly? Wait, Pharma, you can't do something so dangerous before you get used to the controls. When I looked at it, the fan-like thing on Pharma's Garuda, back started buzzing around and it slowly started floating. What should I do? Yuta, it's floating. Pharma, for now, just imagine you're going down. Don't fly yet. Hearing my words, Garuda came down slowly. We've got to train before we go into battle, Alana said as she watched the two moving the magic rafts. I came here with Alana's ride carrier to purchase magic rafts and take them back home, so I loaded Vajra and Garuda into it, incidentally. Alana's ride carrier is large and can carry up to six magic rafts, so my Arleo and Alana's Bursia are already loaded. In addition, this ride carrier had an 11 square meters living space and a bath so it looked like it would be fine to use this as a live-in base. Jean's Lydia value was surprisingly high. Even though it's high, it's only 1500, nothing compared to the rest of us. In fact, it was Jean who was now piloting the ride carrier. The ride carrier's activation value was 1000, so he took over piloting. Quick, tomorrow we'll load up the supplies and head for Kirk's. Jean suddenly spoke up while single-handedly maneuvering the ride carrier. What is Kirk's gene? The Republic of Kirk's is currently at war with the Cilicia Empire. It's the perfect place for a mercenary group to make their debut. Alana replied on Jean's behalf. Yes, the Kirk's have a couple of tie tight mines, and they have gold, and I hear they're pretty much outmatched by the Cilicians right now. Well, it's true that they won't pay you much if you sell to the dominant side, but isn't it dangerous to side with someone who is losing? That's what I was afraid of. C30 protection slash Nagisa. C30, protection slash Nagisa. As I was eating a quick lunch with Yukiha and the others on the roof of the castle, Renel told me about Yuta's case. Sorry, Nagisa, we just got a report that, the enslaved friend you're looking for. What's wrong with Yuta? Could it be that he was found? No, the merchant who bought him was found, but it seems that someone killed him, and your friend has disappeared. No way, Yuta. But it's not a report that he's dead. If he escaped, there's a possibility that he's not a slave anymore, so don't be so depressed. Yeah, if it's Yuta, he's doing well somehow. But I, I want to meet Yuta. When I say this with an honest heart, Renell looks a little troubled. Hmm, okay, I'll ask the agency to investigate. But don't expect too much because our intelligence network is poor. Still, I was pleased that there was hope. After that talk, I was summoned to the castle's office, though it seemed to be about work. Next week, there's a meeting of the leaders of the surrounding nations in this area, and I'd like Nagisa to be my escort. Me, an escort? Will it be okay? Of course, you won't be alone. Renel and Jayad will be with you, so don't worry too much. But why me? Of course it's because I'm proud of my country's half-radar. The summit of the surrounding countries is held in the neighboring country, Temera and we took the royal ride carrier called Domna to the country. How does this Domna work? It looks like it's floating a bit. I asked Renel, surprised to see an object the size of a school gymnasium floating across the ground. The ride carrier is made of levitating stone crystals, so it floats a bit and is powered by the same Lydia core as the magic rafts. To be honest, I didn't really understand, but I vaguely replied, Oh, really? There are more than 10 rooms available in this ride carrier for the royal family. It will take about 3 days to reach Temra by Damna, so we will be living here for a while. The king is accompanied by Renel Mi, Jihad, Delphine, the foreign minister and about 30 soldiers who are his bodyguards. The soldiers sleep in a capsule hotel-like place in the hangar where the magic rafts are stored. I was given a proper room, but I was a little distressed. Nagisa, we have some time before we arrive at Timura, so let's study. Renel's escort didn't do anything, but she said that to me when she saw me looking bored. Study what? You should know what's going on around here. Well, yeah, 
I honestly didn't want to learn that, but I was bored and had nothing better to do, so I agreed. First of all, this summit is being attended by a group called the Eastern Alliance, a coalition of 12 small countries. Coalition? Why would we need such an organization? It's to conduct diplomacy on an equal footing with the larger nations around us. If we don't have the power to fight, we can't talk, and we'll end up being threatened or crushed. I see. The center of the Eastern Alliance is Temera, a relatively large country within the small Eastern Alliance, about three times the size of Amuria. I listened to Renel's story, but I was not interested in it at all, and it barely entered my mind. So, the main topic of this meeting is the preparation for the Ruja Empire, a nearby country that has been acting suspiciously lately. What kind of suspicious activity? The most important thing is the expansion of the army. They're gathering a lot of magic rafts and riders. Wait a minute, you mean there might be a war? This is a meeting to prevent that from happening. If the Ruja Empire and the Eastern Alliance go to war, other neighboring countries will start to move in and we'll be in trouble. The unfathomable horror of war had me feeling a tingling, uncomfortable sensation throughout my body. C-31, the Iron Knights. C-31, the Iron Knights. After loading food and other supplies related to the magic rafts into the ride carrier, we set off for Kirk's. A large living room of about 20 Tatama mats was used as a meeting room. Everyone on board this ride carrier gathered and was discussing some of the first issues that needed to be decided. First things first, the name of the mercenary group. You certainly can't make a name for yourself without a name. I like flowers and birds. Rejected, it doesn't sound strong enough. Jean dismissed Nanami's idea without a second thought. Well, what do you propose, Jean? How about the Reaper Guards? Sounds strong. No, it's not cute. A mercenary group doesn't need a pretty name. You're right. But I'm not so sure about Jean's Reaper Corps either. I prefer a noble name, like Elegant Hunters or... That's my girl Alana. That's great. Liza praised Alana's idea without question. I have a feeling that no matter what Alana says, she's going to say the same line. How about the Dragon, Tiger and Phoenix Brigade? It was Pharma who suggested a stern name that didn't fit her character. It sounds a bit good, but when I think about it, it doesn't make sense. So, Yuda, what do you have in mind? When Alana asked I thought about it. I'm not one to have a naming sense, but I just said what came to my mind. What about the Iron Knights? Well, I was expecting it to be rejected. Everyone's reaction wasn't bad except... It's nice. It sounds strong. Yeah, it sounds like we've got class. It's not very pretty. But if Yuta says so, it's very good. I agree with Yuta's idea. No way. I think Master Alana's is the best. Only one person was against it. But a quick glance from Alana turned her in favor of it. And it was unanimously decided to be the Iron Knights. The next step is to choose a room, which is important because this ride carrier will be the center of our lives from now on. I already have a room of my own, so I'll take that one. Don't be so selfish. That's the biggest room in the back. I want to stay there. The ride carrier is mine. I have the right to choose my own room. That's right, you funny head. Shut up. Liza tangled with Jean to defend Alana. Who's a funny head? This is the new hairstyle in Calern, in the north. We're in the west of the continent. We don't want any fads from the north. Shut up. I don't know if you're male or female. You must be blind if you can't tell the difference between men and women. Go to. Even Jean, unexpectedly, is a little overwhelmed by Liza. Perhaps because he's not good at arguing with women. Well, it's not like we're going to get into a fight over this. So let's just have a fair random draw to decide. When I suggested this... Everyone seemed to be confused and didn't seem to understand what I meant. Well, there is no such thing as lottery in this world, anyway. As I explained, I wrote down the numbers on the paper. Wow, that's interesting. Earth culture has had a huge influence on Falva. But this thing is going to be popular too. As Alana said, there are a few similar cultural aspects with Earth. For example, in the cuisine, there is a Japanese menu. On the paper I wrote... There were numbers from 1 to 6, and it was decided that the rooms would be decided in the order of these numbers, and the result of the lottery was... Alana. Me. Pharma. Nanami. Liza. Jean. This means... See, God is watching. 
Of course I'm going to choose that back room. Damn it. There's something wrong with this lottery. Don't complain. You're the last one. So be quiet. Hmm. Come on. You'd a pick one. Well, I don't care where I go. But I think I'd like the front room with the best view. Damn. I was aiming for that room too. If you don't care where, give it up, Yuta. No, Yuta, you can't do what Jean wants. It's true that if I give Jean the room, the lottery will be meaningless. Jean, I'm sorry, but this is non-negotiable. Screw you. Pharma's next. Where do you want to stay? In the room to the right of Yuta, she said modestly. Next, it's Nanami, right? Nanami is, uh, fine in the room with Yuta. When Alana heard this, she complained. You can't do that, Naomi. If that's the case, then I will too. Yeah, I want to sleep with Yuta as usual. But then the room to the left of Yuta is fine. When she was told no, Naomi said she had no choice but to do so. Liza chose the room next to Alana's and Jean chose the largest room of the remaining rooms. This is the first time I've slept in my own room since I came to this world. It's not that I don't like sleeping with Naomi, but it's nice to be able to sleep alone. C-32, Combat Training C-32, Combat Training On the way to Kirk's, it was decided that Naomi and Pharma would practice with their magic rafts and conduct combat training in a wilderness canyon. Liza will fix any minor damage, so don't worry, just go for it. Nanami's Vajra and Pharma's Garuda grabbed towards Alana's Bursia with a light step. Alana avoided their attack and lightly pushed the twos back. The two of them lost their balance and tumbled to the ground. You have to keep your balance. The most important thing in a fight is not to lose your center of gravity, so you will be able to respond to unexpected attacks. Alana is a good instructor, and as she teaches them, their movements become much better, especially Nanami's growth is very fast. It's obvious why. She's a triple Highlander, and it looks like Vajra was a real bargain. With the two of them fully capable of riding the magic rafts, Alana and I decided to do some serious combat training. Vajra equips one-handed sword and shield. Garuda equips arrows. I thought that Garuda's flying ability was dangerous when I actually fought her. It's not that she can fly fast. But if she floats up to about 50 meters in the air, I can't do anything without flight gear. And yet, the other side is attacking with arrows. If a special metal is attached to the tip of the arrow, it will penetrate even S-rank armor and its power should not be underestimated. There are many times when Nanami's Vajra ability is also astounding, and even though she's holding back because of practice, there are many times when Alana Bursia is overwhelmed. Nanami is still going to grow, she's scary. But what am I supposed to do against a flying opponent? Well, we'll just have to use our flight gear. As Alana said, I don't think I can do anything without flight gear. I can't say that flying enemies won't appear in the future so I might want to think about how to deal with them. After the combat training, we decided to have a meeting. I want the flying magic raft too. I'd claim that in a heartbeat. A flying magic raft. Arrows or bow guns. And then there's the magic bullet. The arrow uses both hands, so if you equip it, you won't be able to equip melee weapons. Bow guns can be equipped in one hand, but they're not very powerful and you can only load a few arrows so it's only a temporary relief. What kind of weapon is this? Magic bullet. The magic bullet is a magical weapon that uses the Ludia core. It is small enough to be worn on the arm, but its power depends on the Ludia value, and it is so weak that even I, a double Highlander, can only produce enough power to frighten my opponent. It's rare to see a rider using one of these. Then it seems pointless for me to use it, since I have a Ludia value of 2. Ludia value 2. Yuta, what are you talking about? Alana says in surprise, come to think of it. Alana didn't know that. Oh, I have a Ludia value of 2. That's ridiculous. You can't ride a magic raft with a Ludia value of 2. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But he insists it's 2. Jean also agrees with Alana and says so. I'm pretty sure I measured it with the latest measuring equipment. People don't believe my Ludia value. Is it so strange? If you're so sure, let's take a proper measurement next time. There are probably facilities with measuring machines in large cities. I don't know if Lydia values matters that much. To be honest, I don't really care. Nanami isn't interested in Yuta's Lydia value either. Yuta is Yuta. That's what Nanami and Pharma told me. But Jean and Alana wanted to be sure. 
and they were ready to put me through the measuring machine when they had the chance. C-33, the Kirk's Republic. C-33, the Kirk's Republic. When we arrived in Kirk's, we immediately decided to sell ourselves as mercenaries. The Kirk's Republic is a democratic country without a king, whose main source of revenue is the production of ore, which is used to make the outer shells of magic rafts. We visited a military facility in its capital. I've never heard of the Iron Knights. Sure, we're looking for mercenaries, but we can't afford to hire people who we don't know where they come from. Hey, 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 the Iron Knights aren't horse bones. They're a mercenary group with two gladiators who were invincible in the Arpica Coliseum. Just have someone at the top handle it. You need strength. Jean said it forcefully, but the officers of the Kirk's army are looking at us suspiciously and don't seem to believe Jean's story in the first place. All right, I'll talk to the higher-ups, but I think they're probably going to turn you down since they've already got contracts with three mercenary groups. Apparently, they already have previous contracts. That afternoon, I was summoned by the Kirk's army to talk about the mercenary contract. Apparently, anyway, me, Alana and Jean visited the place. There were about ten other people in the room where we were called. First of all, I would like to thank you for coming to the aid of my country. I would like to accept all mercenary groups unconditionally, but we have a fixed budget and can't do that, so I'd like to make a suggestion. I'd like to make a contract with all the mercenary groups here, with compensation based entirely on performance. When the commander of the Kirk's army said this, the uncle, who looked exactly like a mercenary, gave his opinion. I don't mind that, but how much do I get paid? How about five millions for each enemy magic raft destroyed? Another 10 million as a bonus for every 10 magic rafts destroyed, plus the ability to receive supplies at Kirk's base. 60 million for 10 magic rafts. I'm not sure if that's a lot or a little, but the guys here seem to agree. Plus, I'd expect some kind of bonus for the most successful mercenary group. Gene suggested this in a loud voice. Hearing this, the commander thought for a moment and replied. Very well then, let's give out 100 million as a bonus to the mercenary group with the best results. This will motivate everyone. In this way, we have signed a mercenary contract with, however, it is a good idea. Because this means that if you are not useful, you will not be paid. And Kirks will be very happy because they have been able to sign up many mercenary groups that are a force to be reckoned with. It's Utah. What are you doing here? Yes, it's Utah. When I looked at them, I saw that they were my classmates, Naoshi Horai and Akane Mamura. What, you're both mercenaries? Well, the country that bought us soon lost the war and disappeared, so we were picked up by this mercenary group when we were in trouble. That's tough. I've heard that you've been a slave, but you've come a long way from being a con artist. What? Who's a scammer? Because you know, Lydia Value too. there's no way you can ride a magic raft. You were trying to trick Kirks into signing up as a mercenary group and make money. But too bad you can't cheat them out of a reward with a performance-based system. Who would do such a thing? How are you going to get results if you can't even ride a magic raft? You can't defeat a magic raft with your bare hands. It's really funny. I'm ashamed of myself for thinking you were kind of good before I came into this world. What, Akane, did you have feelings for Yuta? Don't say it. It's embarrassing. It's like saying you had a crush on someone with a Lydia value of two. That's right. Just as I was about to say something back, Alana stepped in front of them and said, I'm in love with Yuta. Do you have a problem with that? Alana has a high level of beauty that can be described as an exquisite beauty. When she said that, the two of them were unable to say anything back and fell silent. Hmm, the only thing you've improved on is your ability to trick people. It doesn't matter. Because our Beast King mercenary group is definitely the most successful. After all, there are two half-radars in the Beast King mercenary group. There's no way we can lose. We have a triple Highlander and a double Highlander. I thought about that. But I didn't want to say anything about it because I didn't think it would be good to show my hand too much. C-34, the first job as mercenaries. C-34, the first job as mercenaries. We were handed our first assignment as a mercenary group by Kirk's army. They want us to take back the Ruba fortress. Jean was a little surprised when I informed everyone of this. Recapture the fortress. Hey, that's a heavy request all of a sudden. It seems that this operation is not just a mission for us Iron Knights, 
but a joint operation with all the contracted mercenary groups. What about the strength of the fortress? About a hundred magicrafts, but they don't seem to have a complete grasp of it. We don't know what the enemy's strength is, but we have to go there anyway. That's pretty careless. It seems that about 30 Kirk's regular army magic rafts will also participate in the attack. So it looks like they don't want to completely abandon us. I think they want to test our strength. As Alana said, I think it's more of a test of strength than a way to discard us. Ruba Fortress is located 10 kilometers from the border of the Salation Empire, which is at war with the Kirks. We headed there with other mercenary groups and the regular Kirks army. Our strength is 30 Kirks regulars. 12 wolf hunters, 23 beast king mercenaries, 14 crash bunkers, and 4 iron knights with a total 83 magic rafts, which is not really powerful. But the Kirk's infantry force is estimated at 5, 0, 0, 0, and the enemy is estimated at 100 magic rafts and 150 ballisti. It's going to be a bit of a lopsided battle. What's a ballista? A ballista is a weapon used by infantry. Think of it as a stationary arrow. Arrows. 150 of them? I don't think it's as powerful as the arrows that Farmer's Garuda shoots, but it does enough damage to magic machines that we can't be too careless. We're outnumbered by magic rafts. And then there's the ballistas. As we neared Fort Ruba, a final strategy meeting was held on a Kirk's military ride carrier. We'll attack from the west, south, and east of the fortress at once. Shouldn't we be attacking from the north? One of the mercenaries from some mercenary group asks at the words of the commander of the Kirk's army. We don't have the strength to attack from four directions, and the north has hard defenses and a large number of ballisti. There's little advantage to attacking here, so it's better to abandon that side. I see, so how will the forces be distributed? We'll go with the regular Kirk's from the south, crash bunkers and the wolf hunters from the east, and the Beast King mercenaries and the Iron Knights from the West. When the commander of the Kirkus army said that, the leader of the Beast King mercenary group objected. Wait, we refuse to fight alongside the Iron Knights. Why? I can't trust my back to these stinkers. My friends tell me they're a bunch of crooks. So, well, are there any other mercenary groups that would be willing to attack the West with the Iron Knights? However, no mercenary group responded to the commander's words. Hmph, then it can't be helped. I'll only ask the Iron Knights to attack from the west. The Beast King mercenaries will join the attack from the south with the regular Kirk's army. Wait a minute! You want us to attack the west by ourselves? Jean protested involuntarily. Yes, we can't blame them. They don't want to fight with you. Is that the same with the Kirk's regular army? I'm responsible for the lives of my men. I won't take any unnecessary risks. You don't care about our lives. I was about to retort strongly, when Alana declared. Okay, the Iron Knights will attack the fortress from the west alone. Are you sure, Alana? I couldn't help but ask. Of course I wouldn't trust my back to these people. But remember, if you're struggling and in trouble, we're not going to help you. Ha 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 ha, it's only a matter of time before we're defeated if we're saved by four magicrafts. The leader of the Beast King mercenary group said that with a hearty laugh. Here's a reminder that even though it's a joint operation, the other mercenary groups are not on our side. C-35, the battle for Ruba Fortress. C-35, the battle for Ruba Fortress. We went around to the west side of Ruba's fortress and prepared to attack. Oh, can you all hear me? Alana, Bersia, I'm here. Nanami Vidra, I read you. Pharma, Garuda, copy. Jean, ride carrier, I copy you. Yuda, Arleo, copy. I don't know what the principle behind it is, but the magical technology called the spirit box has made it possible for magic rafts to talk to each other via ride carriers. Also, the Kirks gave us something called a beacon crystal to identify our allies, so we've installed that in each of our magic rafts. This beacon crystal shows the approximate location of your allies as dots on the crystal, so you can see their movements, albeit roughly. Wait a minute. There's something weird attached to Arleo's right arm. When I looked at it, I saw that there was a large watch-like device attached to Arleo's right arm. Yuda, you said you wanted a long-distance attack method. That's the magic bullet I told you about. This is the, how does it work? It's connected to the Lydia core, so it's like controlling a magic raft. You just imagine it and shoot it. I see, but don't expect it to be very powerful. 
It should only be used as a deterrent. Copy that. Five kilometers west of the Ruba Fortress. From here, the ride carrier was conspicuous, so we decided to get off and ride the magic rafts. Ride carrier, drop us off and stay in the back. All right, you four, take it easy. When I looked at the beacon crystal, I saw three dots moving together around my point. When you touch the beacon crystal, it seems you can zoom in and out, and a number of dots appear, based on the number and location. I can tell that they are friendly dots attacking from the east and south. In addition, the beacon crystal has a battle recorder function, and it seems that when you defeat an enemy, it is stored here, so that the number of defeated enemies can be confirmed and proven. It seems that the battles for the fortress has begun. The sounds of fierce fighting are beginning to be heard. I can see the enemy's magic raft troops in front of us, and their number is about 50 at a glance. Their number is higher than I thought. Pharma, take flight and prepare to fire your arrows. I'm going to charge into the center, so Nanami and Alana, take out the enemies from the left and right. I was confident that I was strong enough, so I decided that I would charge into the center and attract the enemy. That way, I feel like there's less risk of danger to my friends. As soon as I charged, four enemy magic rafts approached me. When I saw that all four planes were armed with long spears, I then attacked them at close range, swinging both tunfas. The enemy's magic raft is more fragile than I thought. A single blow to the body caused it to emit smoke and stop. One magic raft first. I turned my body and hit the left and right side magic rafts with the tanfa as well. Like the first one, the two magic rafts on either side made a swooshing sound and fell to their knees, motionless. When I hit the head of the remaining one, the head is blown off with a swoosh it falls over backwards, and it too stops moving. After defeating four enemy magic rafts, I looked around and saw that Nanami and Alana had also defeated several enemies. In addition, a second group of enemies was approaching, there were about 20 of them. Pharma, attack with arrows. Pharma began to shoot arrows at the approaching enemy magic rafts. The accuracy of Pharma's Garuda arrows is high. Every arrow that shoots hits. The arrows also seem to be very powerful since the pierced enemy magic rafts stopped moving. Seeing that the enemy was scared, Alana shouted. The enemy is scared. Let's finish them. Alana's Bersia said accelerating to charge into the enemy magic rafts. Nanami and I followed suit. After all, Alana's combat power is tremendous. In an instant, three magic machines are disassembled by Bersia's twin swords. In addition, Nanami's growth is remarkable. Nanami's Vajra is equipped with a one-handed sword in her right hand and a shield in her left. A good balance of offense and defense, with the shield preventing attacks and the sword cutting down enemies. Her movements were so seamless that I even thought that if I fought her for Real, I would lose. I can't afford to lose too. I kick the enemies away with the Tanfa while rotating my body. I'm getting used to handling the Tanfa. And I'm finally starting to understand the strength of this weapon. Power. Speed and versatility that allows the user to demonstrate its power in both offense and defense. I don't think I can lose in close combat. We were so focused on fighting that we didn't realize it. But the total score of the four of us was already over 50. A third of a hundred enemies is about 33. But something doesn't seem right. C36, more than expected. C36, more than expected. Something's wrong. There are too many enemies. Alana says this after decapitating the last enemy magic raft nearby. I'm sure you're right. I think we've already beaten a lot of them on our own. Maybe 100 enemy magic rafts of the enemy is a very wrong estimate. See, as if to prove it, the friendly forces in the east and south seem to be struggling a lot. When Alana said that, I checked the beacon crystal, and found that the points that identify allies were disappearing at an alarming rate. Yuda, let's get this over with quickly. If we don't, everyone but us is going to be wiped out. I thought you said you wouldn't help them. I'd like to. But it wouldn't be cool if the Iron Knight's first mission failed. That's true. Then let's get on with it. The only enemies in the west were the magic rafts near the fortress, and the ballista installed in the fortress. The fortress ballista looks nasty. Pharma, can't you get up and target them? I'll try. Pharma's Garuda rose steadily, rising higher than the walls of the fortress. 
The people who designed the fortress probably didn't expect that the walls would be attacked from above. The installed ballista seemed to be in plain sight from Pharma's position. Pharma slowly flicked her bow and then fired it at one of the ballistae. The arrow drew a straight parabola, breaking the targeted ballista into pieces. Great job, Pharma. You got it in one shot. Perhaps pleased by my praise, Pharma went on to shoot ballista after ballista. The ballista in the fortress also tried to fire back, but it seemed we were out of range and the arrows fell in front of us in vain. Oh yeah, I had a long-range weapon too, I'll give it a try. I held up the magic bullet and sent an image to the control sphere of aiming at one of the ballistae and shooting it out. I didn't know the range, and I didn't think it would hit, but a sound and light more intense than I imagined was emitted from the tip of the magic bullet. It became a large band of light, a straight line of light like a laser beam, and extended to the targeted ballista. Boom! The ballista shattered into pieces with a tremendous explosion sound. Utah! What was that? Alana exclaimed in surprise. I tried to shoot a magic bullet. While we were talking about this, the enemy's magic rafts that were near the fortress came towards us, perhaps surprised or angered by my attack. Well, I guess they couldn't ignore the fact that Pharma's arrows were destroying the ballistas. Utah! Alana! We've got company! Nanami warned us. Okay, one more shot at. I tried to shoot a magic bullet at the approaching enemies. But no light bullets came out like before. Hey, it's not coming out. With that much energy in the attack, maybe the Ludia core is about to burst. Burst? It's in a temporary state of restricted power. It should recover in a little while. I see, so that means I can't fire magic bullets in rapid succession. Enemies are here. Oh, that's right. Nanami called out to me again, and I turned to face the approaching enemies. Alana chopped up two enemies approaching from the right with her twin swords. Even though she was talking to me, her consciousness seemed to be watching the enemies properly. Nanami also used her shield to block the enemy attack with her sword, and then skewered them with her sword. I used the tomfa to blow off the heads of the approaching enemies, and then leapt to land in the middle of the group. The startled enemies froze when they saw me. I swung the tomfa at the group of enemies, which was full of gaps, and destroyed them one after another as I spun around. Everything alright? Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any more enemy magic rafts nearby. In the meantime, all the ballistae in the castle seemed to have been destroyed by Pharma and the west side of the fortress was completely silenced. C-37, unsolicited help. C-37, unsolicited help. After silencing the west side of the fortress, we headed to the south side to help, looking at the beacon crystal. The number of friendly troops on the south side had already been reduced to about half. As we approached the battlefield on the south side, we could hear the conversations of our allies on the Kirk's military channel set up in the spirit box. Stick to, what the hell is this? There are over a hundred magic rafts on the south side alone. Let's retreat, commander. No, we're already surrounded. There's no way to escape. Let's ask our allies for help. Where can we find allies with that much power? The rest of the troops are in a similar situation. Naoshi. Akane. Do something about it, your half radar. There's one enemy who's incredibly strong. Me and Akane can stop him for now but we need help. Shit, Kirk's army is quickly dying. It's not worth it. It seems that the ones surviving on the south side are the Beast King mercenaries. To tell the truth, I'd rather leave them alone. But, I'm pretty sure they're my friends. When I look, I find a black enemy magic raft that is fighting with two magic rafts of the Beast King mercenaries. Apparently, that's what No she calls a very strong enemy. It doesn't look that strong though. I'll take care of that black one and Alana and the others can take care of the small fry around it. Pharma, rise and attack, Nanami. I'll take the left, you take the right. I got it. Yes, I am going up. I headed straight for the black enemy magic raft, just as Naoshi and Akane were struck by the black magic raft and collapsed. I leapt in front of the black enemy magic raft to protect Naoshi and Akane's magic rafts. Ha, help us quickly. We're going to be killed. Get us out of here. I can't do it. I can't move. I don't care who you are. Just help me. I ignored them because it was too much trouble to reply to them. I decided to finish off the black enemy magic raft. 
The black enemy magicraft immediately slashed at me with the two-handed sword it was holding. I flicked it back with my tonfa. It bounced back violently, and I could tell by its subtle movements that the rider of the black enemy magicraft was flustered. I could feel it. The black enemy magicraft was flustered, but swung his sword wide to attack. I narrowly avoided the attack and landed a tonfa blow on its body. The black enemy magicraft fell to the ground. Making a dull sound, smoke started coming out, and it stopped moving. Wow, you took him down with one blow. No way. Naoshi and Akane seemed surprised, but I didn't want to waste my time with them. I silently left the area and began to eliminate the enemies. In about ten minutes, the destruction of the enemies on the south side was completed. The exhausted Beast King mercenaries were useless, and we took care of most of them. But the words from the leader of the Beast King mercenaries were, You've gone the extra mile. We're on a full performance system. Don't you dare take someone else's catch. Wow, how can you say that when you were about to be wiped out? You know what? You can't talk to me like that after I saved your life. I was about to complain about that. But Alana's words interrupted me. We don't have time to deal with these idiots. There's still the east side. It's true. It looks like they're struggling a lot over there too. So we need to go to the rescue. I did as Alana said. Stop dealing with the idiots and headed east. The number of allies on the east side had already dwindled to single digits. They're clumping together to prevent the enemy from attacking. But at this rate, it's only a matter of time. I immediately charged towards the encircling enemies. By the time they noticed us, I had slaughtered three of them with my tonfa. At the same time, Alana too, Nanami too, and Pharma destroyed three of them. In an instant, ten magicrafts were destroyed, and the enemy army was in chaos. Before they could mount an organized resistance, we took them down one by one. What the hell do you think you're doing? Don't take what's mine. After destroying the enemy in the east, the dialogue with the ones we saved was the same as with the leader of the Beast King mercenaries. What the hell? Nanami and the others saved you. Even Nanami was a little upset. After that, the fortress ballistas were also neutralized by Pharma's arrows, and the Ruba fortress was completely overrun. Then, the infantry of the Kirk's army rushed in and took control of the inside of the fortress as well, ending this operation. C-38 too much achievement. C-38. Too much achievement. After the operation was over, we returned to the capital of the Kirk's Republic. I was expecting to be summoned to the military headquarters immediately, and thank for our efforts in the fortress battle. I got to see the battle records. That's an impressive number of kills, but only if those are the real numbers. What do you mean? I couldn't help but ask. Other mercenary groups have reported that you've been taking credit for their work and even rigging the battle recorder to inflate the number of kills. I didn't do anything stupid like that. Who said that? Huh? But there are too many destroyed. What's this joke number of 152 destroyed magicrafts? I heard that the Iron Knights only have four magicrafts. Four magicrafts took out that many enemies. And the fact that we've conquered the fortress is more than enough proof. I've been informed that it was the Beast King's mercenaries that took it down. What? The Beast King mercenaries suffered an early defeat and were of little use. Humph, that's a different opinion from what the commanders in the field and the other mercenary groups are saying. Oh well, either way, I can't trust your defeat numbers at this point. Wait a minute, so you're saying we won't get paid for our work? Jean, who is sensitive when it comes to money, asked in a desperate manner. We can't pay you as it is but I have a suggestion. What do you mean? I want to give you an independent mission, and if you can complete it, I'll believe in the number of magicrafts you've destroyed and pay you for it. And of course I'll pay you for the new mission. Don't be ridiculous. You're using this to your advantage. Pay me for my work. If you don't do it, then I'm breaking my contract with you and I won't pay you anything. That's outrageous. Jean's anger was understandable, but it was a bit much. What should we do, Yuta? When Alana asked me that, I thought about it. I guess I'll just have to take that new mission. If I'm alone, the other mercenaries won't be able to lie. I'll take that new mission. Seriously? It's okay. It's hard to get results like this. And I was going to take the new mission anyway. And so I was given a new mission. Take back the border town. Jean reacts to my muttered words. This country's been robbed, huh? 
and they say there are at least a hundred of them. Oh, come on, we're gonna take them out by ourselves? It'll be easy for you guys. You've destroyed 152. Fuck. What's that? You don't believe us at all. Even though it was the sole mission of the Iron Knights, a small unit of five magic rafts and 500 infantrymen was to accompany us, as the Kirk's army had to control the town. So you're the Iron Knights. I heard you cheated in the battle to retake Ruba Fortress, but I hope everything will be okay this time. That's what the captain of the small unit says to me sarcastically. We didn't cheat in the battle of Ruba Fortress. I heard that there were reports from the Beast King mercenaries and others at. You don't believe our reports, but you believe what the Beast King mercenaries say? Jean retorted in a sarcastic tone. Of course, the Beast King mercenaries and Kirks have known each other for a long time. So who would you trust more? What an unreasonable story you're telling. At any rate, we Kirk's troops will be keeping watch in the rear, so quickly destroy the enemy. For the Iron Knights that boasted 152 kills in the Battle of Ruba Fortress should be a piece of cake. I was a little annoyed, but we can prove it with the results. There are no Beast King mercenaries here to give false reports, so it won't be a problem. C-39, Control of the Border Town. C-39, Control of the Border Town. Chapters 39 and 40 were sponsored by RxSD3R. Thank you for your generosity. A great number of magic rafts were stationed in the border town we were going to retake. It's not a hundred. There must be three hundred of them. The first thing I did was to scout the town, and it seemed that there were considerably more enemies than I had been informed. Is it bad? No, there don't seem to be any Highlander magic rafts, so it looks like we're okay in terms of strength. Most of them are Bourbon, a general purpose machine from Thalakia. Bourbon's performance is 1200 activation Lydia, 8000 maximum output, F ranked armor, and G ranked maneuverability, which is one of the lowest performance military magic rafts. Thanks for the information, Pharma. When I thanked her, Pharma's face turned red and she was embarrassed. As I returned to the ride carrier to begin the attack, Alana called out to me, Yuta, why don't you try using this weapon? What she showed me was a spear-like weapon with a large blade attached to both ends. What's that? It's a double spear. There are a lot of enemies this time, so I think this weapon is more suitable for annihilation than the Tanfa, which has a better balance of offense and defense. I see, I'll try it. On Alana's recommendation I changed my equipment from the Tanfa to the double spear. The strategy was pretty much the same as the fortress battle, me, Alana, and Nanami would charge into the enemy, and Pharma would shoot arrows at them from above. I'm not even sure if I can call this a strategy. When the enemy's magic rafts noticed our approach, they all started moving. We accelerated at once and rammed into the enemy group. I slashed the enemy's magic rafts while spinning the double spear. The mere touch of the double spear's blade would slash the enemy's magic rafts, and if the timing was right, it would split them in half. That's a hell of a cut. No, it doesn't normally cut that well. I think it's probably the effect of Lydia's augmentation. But I'm still curious about Yuta's Lydia value. Lydia values also influence attack power. Yes, it affects all the abilities of the magic raft. Yeah, even as we were having this conversation, we were slaying the enemies. Pharma's arrows, however, have a much higher rate of fire speed and accuracy than before. If she's careful... She's going to get the most kills. Nanami's swordsmanship has also improved greatly, and her dancing fighting style is probably based on Alana's, as she slashes through her enemies in rhythm. An hour after the battle began we had eliminated more than half of the enemies and their attacks began to slow down. As expected, the enemy is starting to get scared after this much fighting, Alana said as she saw the change in the enemy's movements. Maybe if we eliminate a few more they'll run. Nanami, I'm tired. I'd appreciate it if you could help me. I'm tired too. As Nanami and Pharma said, fatigue will accumulate. And after an hour of fighting, they're starting to get tired. Okay, let's give it one more try and force them to retreat. Everyone responded well to my words. Oh, and I resumed my attack on the scared enemies. After defeating more enemies, just when they were about to retreat, there was a magic raft unit approaching at great speed from the east. At first, I thought they were enemy reinforcements, but I recognized that magic raft. How come the Beast King mercenaries are in the picture? 
Yes, the unit was that Beast King mercenary group. I'm here in response to your call for reinforcements. That's what the leader of the Beast King mercenaries said. But I didn't ask for any reinforcements. No, I didn't ask for reinforcements, I said, and got a surprising response. Not from you, but from a junior officer in the Kirk's army who is accompanying you. What? It seems that the Kirk's army, which is accompanying and waiting behind us, has requested reinforcements from the Beast King mercenaries. Wait a minute, this is a solo mission for us Iron Knights. We don't need reinforcements. I really don't need reinforcements when the battle is already won. Humph, <laughs> you people who pretended to help us who didn't need help during the Battle of Ruba Fortress and then snatched our prey have no right to say that. No, no, no. If I hadn't helped you then, you would have been in trouble. After such a ridiculous exchange, the enemy forces, judging that they would be further outnumbered by the appearance of the Beast King mercenaries, immediately began to retreat. C40. The result of the mission. C40. The result of the mission. For some reason, the operation to retake the border town that was supposed to have been completed by us Iron Knights was supposed to have been retaken by the Beast King. Mercenaries. What do you mean? We're the ones killing most of the enemies. Just check the battle recorder and you'll see. Jean's angry protest was directed at the commander of the Kirk's army. Huh, you guys seem to have the technology to tamper with the battle recorder's numbers, so I wouldn't trust you with that. How can you tamper with a battle recorder? I've never even heard of such a thing. We're not interested in such methods either. But the number of planes destroyed this time was 221 which is an unrealistic number, and it's inconsistent with the fact that the NCOs in the field told us that the total number of enemies was about 100. If you were going to falsify the data, you should have used more realistic numbers. Why did the Beast King mercenaries come to reinforce me when I was on a solo mission in the first place? Isn't that strange? That's because the junior officers in the field thought it would be too pitiful for you guys to do it alone. Who told you to do all that extra work? What about the reward? I'll hold off on saying that the Beast King mercenaries did a good job this time. You can prove it in the next mission. What the hell is that? I can't accept that. Yuda, you should say something too. Jean, there's nothing you can say. Let's just back off here. But man, we're not getting paid. It's alright, we'll prove it next time. But commander, if we prove our strength in the next mission, you'll pay us for all the magic rafts we've destroyed. Hmm, of course I will pay you if I can prove it. Good luck with that. Quite frustrated, we return to our ride carrier. Yuta, you're being a little too good-natured. Jean's anger still didn't seem to subside. There's a saying in my country, even a Buddha's face is good three times. If the result is the same next time, we'll give up on Kirk's and move on. That's an interesting term. It means there won't be a fourth time. Well, there better be. There's a bit of something going on behind the scenes between the Beast King mercenaries and the Kirk's army. The timing of the reinforcements in the border town is too strange. As Alana said, it seems as if there was some force at work to undermine us. In fact, we could have given up on them this time. But we decided to follow the old Japanese saying and give them one last chance. That day, we celebrated our victory. Because we were sure we had won and we knew it ourselves even if no one else recognized it. We had a toast, but Nanami and Pharma were children, so we toasted with fruit juice, and I was given a light drink. It seems that in this world, 16 is the age of adulthood, so I'm just barely old enough to drink. Come on, what's with the Beast King mercenaries? We're a hundred times stronger than them. What the hell, Jean, you're the angriest one of all. Of course I am. I hate working for free the most. In response to Jean's anger, Alana has a calm expression on her face and drinks in a mature way. You're right, we don't have any income, but we do have something much more useful than that. What more important than money? Well, in a way. So what is it? Battle experience. Two major battles have greatly improved our skills. I'm sure that will be an asset for a mercenary group. That's true, but I also want money. Well, if Kirk's doesn't work out, we can always make money in the next one. There are plenty of countries. Yuta, you're such a positivist. I've heard that a lot. That's the man I fell in love with. No, you make me sound like a petty little man. I'm glad you're here, because I'd be broke without you too. Hmm, well, that's alright. But did anyone eat the meat I cooked? 
Jean said looking at the grill where the meat was cooking. I didn't eat your meat. Ho ho. I like my meat well cooked, so I guess Nanami ate the meat I carefully nurtured and cooked on the edge. I told you I didn't eat it. Don't lie to me, you greedy bastard. Ignoring Nanami and Jean's meat fight. Anyway, this may be the last time we'll be in Kirk's. With the way that Commander is acting, I'd say that's a good possibility. Well, even if that happens, it's a good thing. Because as Alana said, we're getting experience, which is more important than money. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C41, The Angel in Black. C41, The Angel in Black. The rapier pierces the enemy Magicraft's head, and the Magicraft, having lost its head, falls backwards helplessly. 100 enemy troops wiped out at once. No matter how strong the Elysian army is on the continent, it's too much. Especially that jet black magic raft. Is the triple highlander a monster? The admiration of the officer of the team army. A friend of mine who is accompanying me. Leaks out of the word box. I don't know what's so great about this. But it might definitely help me defeat the enemy more efficiently. Yuki you're getting pretty good at this. I'm no match for you. Amina. A double highlander who has been fighting with me since my first battle. Compliments me. I'm still no match for Amina. You have more kills this time than I do. You've killed two of the enemy's ace highlanders. I just happened to be the one who met him. If he had encountered Amina, you would have defeated him. I'm not buying you dinner, even if you say that. Amina and I get along quite well. And she has become my best friend since I came to this world. We spend a lot of time together, both in battle and in our personal lives. And we've come to know each other. Lady Yuki, Lady Amina, the general is calling for you. Please come to the command ride carrier later. I was sent to the Zimrian front, the fierce battleground of the war between team, a tributary of the Elysian Empire, and the kingdom of Hurridge. The war is already turning towards team, and those around me are saying that victory is only a matter of time. So I guess we're talking about returning home. I'd like you two to go take the Magic Rafts unit and head for the Salation Empire. This is a country that recently became a member of Elysia, isn't it? Yes, the Salation Empire is currently at war with the Kirk's Republic, but they seem to be outmatched and have requested reinforcements. I'd heard they had the upper hand until recently. Looks like the tide has turned with the arrival of a powerful mercenary group. A powerful mercenary group? It's not the Sword Saints. No, as expected, the Sword Sage's Sword Clan won't be fighting in such a small war. The mercenary group that is siding with the Kirk's Republic is called the Beast King Mercenaries. I've never heard that name before. It is indeed an unknown name, but it is said that in just two battles, they defeated a third of the total army of the Salation Empire. That's the kind of warfare that mercenaries are capable of. I hear the Black Haven's Highlanders of the Salation Empire have also been defeated. I think Yuki and Amina will be fine, but be on your guard. Amina and I led 50 magic rafts to the Salation Empire. The 50 magic rafts were the Elysian Empire's mid-range general purpose magic rafts, all of which had an activation Lydia value of 3000, an elite force with high performance for a mass-produced machine. Thank you Elysian army for coming all the way here to reinforce us. The commander of the Salation army politely bows down to me, since it is a vassal state of Elysia. I am treated quite politely. So what enemy do we have to defeat? Emina asked. To which the commander replied with trepidation. Can you first deal with the frontline troops of the Kirk's army that have crossed the border and invaded? All right. Let's head there as soon as possible. Then let a hundred magic machines from the Salation army accompany you. The offer was made immediately. But Amina replied with a calm expression. No, I don't need you to accompany me as it would be too difficult to fight. What? But the Kirk's have a huge army of over 200 magic rafts. No problem. The commander couldn't say anything more to Amina, who said so. Indeed, to be honest, I feel that the rest of the army is just a hindrance when it comes to coordination and such. We received information that the Kirk's army had invaded as far as a region called Kairuni, so we headed there immediately. You are free to annihilate the rest. That was all Amina instructed her subordinate riders before the battle. What about me? You'll be free to move around, and there's no danger of you wandering off on your own. Can I take that as a sign of trust? I feel like you're just abandoning me. I think you'll get more results if you move freely. You just put a lot of pressure on me. That's how you know you can do it. 
Apparently, she's being misled, but I'm pretty sure she trusts me. We deployed in squadrons of five magic rafts, spread out around the perimeter, and attacked a large force of over 200 magic rafts. I move alone, destroying any enemy I see. Enemy movement seems slow, as if they are moving in slow motion. First of all, enemy attacks don't hit me, and my rapier thrusts put enemy magic rafts out of action with a single blow. Amina also moves alone, and destroys the enemy magic rafts at a great speed. The riders under her command are also elite, and they are overwhelming the enemy's forces. Bang! The sound of enemies being destroyed flooded the surroundings. 200 magic rafts were turned into scrap in a matter of minutes, and our damage was zero. Is there any enemy that can fight on equal terms with Alicia? I had even started to think about such questions. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C42, Massive Eradication Operation. C42, Massive Eradication Operation. It seemed that there had been a major change in the battle situation, and the Kirk's army was in a panic, telling us to come to the command center. He didn't hesitate to call after treating us so badly. Maybe he doesn't think it's a bad treatment. Yuda's right. He's probably so empty inside his head that he doesn't even feel bad. When I came to the command center with Jean and Alana complaining about this, I found many people gathered there, including the various mercenary groups and the regular army. We received a report that the frontline army invading Salacia was wiped out. It was a large army of 200 magic rafts, but they were wiped out in a matter of minutes. That's what the commander reported to everyone. Well, so what I thought, realizing that I did not have good feelings about the Kirk's army. It is uncertain, but it seems that Salacia has called in powerful reinforcements. If we leave such a powerful force unattended, we will be in a dangerous situation in the future. Therefore, we have decided to crush that enemy reinforcement force with all our might. And we will carry out a large-scale eradication operation with all mercenary groups and the regular army here. How many enemies are there? The leader of the Beast King mercenary group asked. I heard that the reinforcement force is about 50 magic rafts, but about a hundred of the Salation army are accompanying them. What's our strength against that? 90 mercenaries and 150 regulars. Huh, that's a piece of cake. This is a chance to make some money. That's what the leader of the Beast King mercenary group says when he sees the difference in numbers. Are you forgetting the information that the enemy reinforcements wiped? Out 200 magic rafts without difficulty? Hey Yuda, you're still alive. You really do seem to have a lot of luck. When Naoshi and Akane found me, they called out to me. Well, you know, my luck has always been good. Looks like you guys are as lucky as I am. Luck? We're half radar. We survived on our own merits. Is that so? I heard a pathetic voice that didn't sound like a competent person saying, Anybody can help me and I wondered if he was surviving on luck alone. Which, why would you? No, we wouldn't say that. You must have mistaken it for someone else's voice. Well, okay. But more importantly, this time the enemy might be pretty strong. Tell your commander that it's not safe to keep dragging people down too much. At any rate, I only warned him because we were old classmates. The large-scale eradication operation was immediately put into effect, and we headed for the bordering Kyrene region which was to become our battleground. It's best to stay away from the Beast King mercenaries as much as possible. Alana suggested this to me as we were discussing the mission. Yeah, I don't trust those guys, and I don't trust Kirk's regular army either, so it's probably better to work alone. I think so too. The only people I'll be fighting with are the Steel Warriors. Nanami will feel safer if she's with everyone else. I don't like it when other people make fun of Nanami and her friends. I'm fine with that as long as I'm with everyone else. They all unanimously decided that the Steel Warriors will act alone in this operation. If true, it would be more dangerous for them to act alone. But it is also strange that they feel more secure in their current situation. Yuda, I think you should save the magic bullet this time for emergencies. That's what Alana advises me as I prepare to go out. Yeah, I'd be in trouble if I couldn't shoot when I wanted to. It's true that the magic bullets can't be fired continuously, so it's better not to use them in case something goes wrong, I agreed with the advice. The battlefield was going to be a large area of the Kyrene region. We received information that the regular Kirkus army would invade from the center and the other mercenary 
groups would proceed from the east to the center, so we chose the route of invading from the west without hesitation. Whoa, steel warriors, you're so scared you're going into a corner like that. The leader of the Beast King mercenaries is being sarcastic in the long-distance communication channel. I'm afraid we'll have to fight with some mercenary group. Jean's reply was even more sarcastic. It's the enemy reinforcements you should be afraid of, so just stay in your corner and shake. Jean ignored him. This time, because of the distance, we wouldn't be able to help the Beast King mercenaries if something happened to them. And we really didn't want to. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-43, The Battle of Kairuni. C-43, The Battle of Kairuni. Chapter 1 of 4 sponsored by King Pen. Thank you for your generosity. Having defeated a large enemy force in Kairuni, we had joined up with the Salation army and were preparing to invade Kirks. Yuki, you're a girl too, so why don't you dress up a little more even on the battlefield? That's what Amina said to me as I greeted her in the morning in my drab clothes and shaggy hair. I'm going to change into my military uniform anyway, and I want to look comfortable in my ride carrier. We, the senior riders, were not told anything in particular about our attire. But both Amina and I usually changed into our military uniforms because we said it would not be a good example to our subordinates. I've got men coming in and out of here. I already know. Yuki doesn't have any clothes at all, does she? Well, it hasn't been long since I came to this world. I see. Well, there's a nice store in Taito. Shall we go there together when we get back? Oh yeah, that's great. I've always wanted some clothes. Then we'll just have to kill the enemy and go home. While we were talking about this, I received an urgent call from the Salation army. I'm told there's a large enemy force heading this way. Does the large army include the Beast King mercenaries? Amina asked, and the commander of the Salation army answered after seeing the information from his subordinates. Yes, the Beast King mercenaries are included in that army. That's very convenient, Yuki. Get ready for battle right away. Let's clear out the Beast King mercenary group and return to the Imperial capital. She had a big smile on her face as she said this. We took up position at Kairuni, ready to intercept the enemy forces. It seems that the enemy forces are coming towards us from three directions. The movement of the enemy army was transmitted from the Salation army. Three ways. Do you know where the Beast King mercenaries are coming from? Our spies tell us that the Beast King mercenaries will invade from the east. How many enemies are coming from the other directions? From the center, the main army of the Kirks is over a hundred Magicrafts, and from the west, is this some kind of error or something? It seems that a mercenary group called the Iron Knights is invading alone. I'm getting reports of four Magicrafts. So, the Salation army should intercept the main army of Kirks in the center. We will divide the troops into two and deal with the enemies in the west and east. When Amina informed the commander of the Salation army, he instructed his men and me as follows. I, Yuki, and two squads will crush the Beast King mercenaries in the east, and the rest of you will defeat the enemies in the west, and then reinforce the center. Amina seems to think that the only strong enemy is the Beast King mercenaries. I think so too. When I moved to the east side and waited for the enemy, I saw about a hundred Magicrafts. That's the Beast King mercenary group. I heard from information that they are quite strong enemies. I have to be on guard. Yuki, take your squad and go around to the right. I'll take the left. Roger that. Be careful, Amina. You too. I accelerated at once and plunged into the enemy army. As I intended, the enemy concentrated on me. Then a squad of my men attacked. A squad of five Magicrafts attacked and suddenly crushed a double-digit number of enemy planes. I was also the target of attacks but I destroyed the enemy with my rapier. It's fragile. This is the Beast King mercenary group. No way is this the best they can do. I and a squad of my men had just taken out half of the enemy, and Amina would be communicating with us. Yuki, you're acting a little strange. The Beast King mercenaries can't be this weak. Maybe there's an error in Salacia information. I thought the same thing. The information was wrong. If that's the case... Where is the real Beast King mercenary group? That question was answered by a transmission from a subordinate who was sent in the west side. Is a monster. What is this strength? Zuzu. And the west squad was wiped out. Ta, help me. Ja, ja, Zuzu. And with that, the communication was cut off. No way. I should have known sooner. 
I thought there were too few enemies attacking from the west, but there's no way there are only four magic rafts. I'm sure the Beast King mercenaries are in the west. What do you say, Amina? We head west right away. Amina, what should we do? Amina, do you want to head west right now? No, we can't go help the West Squad right now. We began to decimate the enemy forces to the east, but some of them, seeing that they were outnumbered, began to flee. You got away? Well, okay, let's leave the little fishes alone and head west right away. I agreed with Amina's decision. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-44, Strong Enemies. C-44, Strong Enemies. Chapter 2-4 Sponsored by Kingpin. The other two will be released Sunday. Yes, that's the tenth one. I decided to use the double spear as my weapon for this fight as well. I prioritized annihilation because I often avoided enemy attacks and didn't have much of a chance to prevent them. But it was still nice to be able to kill enemies quickly and stress-free. Yuda, you look like you're doing well, but you need to keep your guard up. This enemy, unlike the Salation army we've fought so far, is very strong, with lean movements, coordination, and control. It's true, that my attacks have been dodged a few times too. Well, they're still not our match if we're careful. As Alana said, there were no visible struggles against such a strong enemy force. And Nanami and Pharma increased their number of defeats one after another. In the middle of such a smooth battle, I heard that nasty voice over the long distance communication. Gaga, Gaga, help me, we need reinforcements. We have a ridiculously strong enemy in the east. What are you doing, Iron Knights? Come and help us. No, Ta, help me. Zaza, it's the voice of the leader of the Beast King mercenaries. He is in dire need of help. I'm sorry, but we're too far away to help you. I replied coldly. Well, it's true. The Beast King mercenaries are making a strategic retreat. It's not our fault if we lose this battle. It's your fault for not coming to our rescue. Go ahead, run off on your own. I didn't want to deal with them anymore, so I replied that. Oh my god, the way he's acting, he's going to blame us for losing this fight. That's what I thought when Alana said that to me. I'm not sure if I should have said it a little more softly. No, it doesn't matter what I say, I thought to myself. I regained my composure and began to eradicate the remaining enemies. After that, I encountered some resistance. But it wasn't until I was struggling that I was able to destroy the enemies one after the other. And then the last enemy was shot with Pharma's arrow. Okay, annihilation complete. Now what do we do? Rest a bit and head for the center? Yes, let's take a break for now. There seems to be a strong force to the east. Let's get ready for anything. As I was resting a bit, having a drink and a meal, I had a strange feeling in my chest. Hey guys, wait a minute. Something's coming. What's the matter, Yuta? What are you feeling? Nanami doesn't feel anything either. What? I don't understand either. At the moment when Pharma finally said that, about ten magic rafts flew out of the forest. It's here. They're early. The enemy's movement was quite fast, especially the jet black magic raft approaching us at a speed I've never seen before. The jet black enemy craft swooped down on Nanami's Vajra and began attacking with its slender weapons. Vajra is also attacked from behind by a purple magic raft, not as fast as the jet black one, but quite fast, and Nanami is in trouble. I tried to move quickly to help, but five enemies blocked my way. Alana, like me, was tangled up in five enemy magic rafts and was unable to help. Pharma, rise and cover Nanami with arrows. Nanami, hold them off until we're clear. Ugh, yeah, against two strong opponents. Nanami was fighting an even battle. On the contrary, an enemy that can fight evenly against the triple Highlander Nanami is. We need to get this over with. I pierce a nearby enemy plane with my double spear, easily skewering it due to the fact that it was caught off guard. Alana also sensed the danger of this group, and hurriedly began to clear away the enemies around us. But just like before, these guys are no ordinary enemies, and they're not going to be easy to defeat. When I slashed at it with the double spear, it sacrificed its right hand to catch it, and one of the enemy planes hit me with its body while I was out of balance. Then two enemies attacked me with swords and spears. I managed to eliminate them. One of the enemy magic rafts moved back a little, probably upset that his comrades had been torn apart, 
so I closed the gap between us and pierced it with the double spear, only one left. In order to clear the last one, I accelerated and approached it. It didn't run away or avoid me, but came at me with a body blow. I was momentarily shaken by the unexpected action, my movement slowed down, and I was hit. Damn, you're stubborn! The enemy magic raft clings to me, but I pull it off and slam it into the ground. Kaya! I'm horrified to hear Nanami's screams. Nanami, you okay? Um, yeah, just grazed me a little, but this enemy is strong. Even though she was covered by Pharma's arrows, Nanami was still vulnerable to the attacks of the two enemies. I immediately tried to rush to her rescue. The next thing I saw, however, was a defenseless Vajra, its movements blocked by a purple magic raft, about to be pierced by the slender sword of the jet black magic raft. Nanami! I quickly readied my magic bullet, and sent the image of shooting through the jet black fuselage to the control sphere in order to avoid hitting Vidra. Sire! If anyone knows a better sound effect leave a comment. A line of light extends, piercing the shoulder of the jet black magic raft in attack position, and blowing off its right arm. The purple magic raft also leaves the Vidra in. Response. Nanami didn't miss that moment. And with minimal movement, she swung the sword in her right hand and pierced the body of the purple magic raft. At that moment I thought I heard some kind of scream. It was a loud voice, full of sadness and anger. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C45, Disappearing Slash Yuki. C45, Disappearing Slash Yuki. After wiping out the enemies to the east, we headed west in the fast ride carrier we had waiting in the rear. It looks like we're outnumbered in the center. We'll be wiped out if we don't quickly clear out the Beast King mercenaries in the west and head for the rescue. Amina said as she looked at the beacon crystal display. While the ride carrier is moving, we need to rehydrate and prepare for battle. The opponent is a strong enemy that decimated our elite troops. We need to be well prepared. When we arrived at the area where our squad had been annihilated, we boarded the magic rafts and searched for the enemy army. I found them, but there are only four of them. They don't seem to have noticed. Do you want to wait and see? No, let's attack. First squad will deal with the red one. Second squad with the white one, Yuki and I will deal with the gold one and the blue one. Under Amina's direction, her subordinates immediately began to move. I also went with Amina to the golden magic raft. As I accelerated and approached, the other side seemed to have noticed me and immediately counterattacked. Here I felt a strange sense of discomfort. A bad feeling or a strange sensation. Well, it must be my imagination. Now I have to concentrate on the enemy. I tried to pierce the golden enemy magic raft with my rapier. But the attack was blocked by its shield. I was surprised because it was the first time I had ever been blocked. In the gap between my attacks, Amina's magic raft, Shriaper, got behind the golden enemy magic raft. Amina attacks the golden enemy with her sword, but her attack is also blocked. This enemy is strong. Amina unleashed a series of sword attacks, and I matched them with a fierce rapier attack. However, the golden enemy magic raft continued to block mine and Amina's attacks with its shield and sword. This enemy is definitely the Beast King mercenaries. What strength. Amina was also in awe. Yuki, avoid it. In response to the voice. I barely reacted to the arrow fired from above. The arrow grazed Elvira's shoulder and stabbed into the ground behind her. Wait a minute, that blue enemy plane is flying in the sky. It's the first time I've ever seen a flying magic raft. Yuki, watch out for the arrows. Yeah, I got it. However, it was extremely difficult to fight the golden enemy magic raft while keeping an eye on the arrows. And the number of attacks made by Amina and I would be drastically reduced. Yuki, I'll stop the gold, you take it down while I do. Got it. Amina slashes at the golden enemy with her sword, and when she gets into a low posture, as if she was aiming for the moment when the shield blocked her, she moves around to the side and at once, she clung to the golden enemy magic raft. Now, I readied my rapier and was about to pierce the enemy's torso and knock him down. But at that moment, my Elvira was hit by a powerful impact. What? I can see Elvira's right arm is blown off, but I didn't know what the attack was. I regained my bearings and looked around, then I saw Shriaper being pierced by the golden. 
Enemy Magicraft Sword. No, no, no. Amina, the enemy's sword pierced the cockpit. I felt a chill and called out to Amina. Amina, Amina, come in, come in, come in. But there was no response from Shriaper. The blood drained from my veins. Despair and sadness flooded me, and I couldn't think of anything else. The golden enemy that had defeated Amina was coming towards me, stunned by the loss of my right hand and the loss of Amina. I was unable to move. Lady Yuki, while shouting, the high-speed ride carrier that was waiting behind me charged the golden enemy. The gold-colored magic raft took the hit and was blown backwards. Lady Yuki, please hurry up and board. I couldn't think of anything else, so I did as I was told and climbed into the high-speed ride carrier. The ride carrier let out a loud boom, and we were off. As it was, I retreated to the imperial capital of Cilicia. I was told there that the Battle of Chironi ended with the complete defeat of Cilicia. Then the news of Amina's death and the annihilation of her troops reached Alicia. Alicia is a nation that values its senior riders. And the death of only a double Highlander and her elite was reason enough to anger the Emperor. An army of Avengers was immediately sent from Alicia's to avenge them. Mr. Yuto, the army of 500 magic rafts was led by the strongest rider on the continent. Yuki, are you okay? Amina, Amina, in front of my eyes. Don't worry, now that I'm here, the Beast King mercenaries and the Kirk's Republic will be annihilated. This is the Emperor's order, so no prisoners or surrenders will be tolerated. Let's avenge Amina together. I nodded quietly. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-46. Goodbye Kirks. C-46. Goodbye Kirks. Chapter 3 of 4 sponsored by King Pen. The strong enemy in the purple magic raft was defeated by Nanami's blow. The jet black one escaped, but the west was completely subdued by the iron knights. I had planned to go to the center for reinforcements immediately after the battle. But as I was checking the defeated enemy planes, I heard a moan. It seemed to be coming from the purple magic raft that had tormented Nanami. Wait a minute. I heard something. Maybe the enemy is alive. When I heard Alana's words, I hurriedly approached the purple magic raft. Hey, are you alive? It was strange to ask that question after we had defeated them ourselves. But no matter how much of an enemy they were, if we defeated them, they were just injured. If he's alive, I want to help him. I think I heard a little bit of moaning. I pried open the hatched part of the purple magic raft with my Arleo. Inside was a woman lying in a pool of blood. I got off the Arleo and quickly approached the woman. Are you okay? However, there was no reply from the woman. When I put my ear close to the mouth area, I could hear the sound of breathing. It looks like she's alive, but her injury is very bad. Yuda, she's an enemy. Are you going to help her? She was an enemy until a while ago. Now she's just a wounded woman. That's the man I fell in love with. There's a medical capsule in the ride carrier. Let's get her there. We managed to get there in time, and the woman's condition was stabilized in the medical capsule. Great, can you fix anything with this medical capsule? It can handle most physical injuries, but it's an older model, so it will take time. This injury will take 10 days to heal completely. 10 days is a long time, but I'm glad I could help. Then we tried to head for the center, but before we could get there, the Kirks defeated the Salations in the center, and the Battle of Chironi ended with Kirk's victory. Those jet black and purple magic rafts you fought at the end, look pretty strong, but you held your own well, Nanami. When I praised her, Nanami shook her head and said, I was just fighting really hard, I don't remember how I was able to defend myself. I think Nanami would have been killed if Yuta hadn't saved her. I'm really glad I was able to save Nanami. So, who were these reinforcements after all? When Jean casually asked this, Farmer replied, It's hard to tell because the enemy's magic rafts had their national mark hidden and its color changed. But that was the Elysian Empire's intermediate general purpose magic raft. Jean's face changed when he heard that. Are you serious, Pharma? Yeah, definitely. I like Alicia's magic rafts. I know them well. I've heard that the Tyrrhenian Empire has become a vassal state of Alicia. But I didn't expect us to go to war with a vassal state. I wonder if the Kirk's army has that information. Alana also seemed to know about the Elysian Empire. I remember hearing about it somewhere too, but I can't remember where. No, they don't know. Kirk's intelligence department seems to be incompetent. 
If they knew, they'd be more panicked. I agree that the Kirkus military intelligence is incompetent, though I think the entire military is incompetent, not just the intelligence department, to be exact. I could tell from her expression that Alana meant what she said. Yes, I have a feeling that they won't pay the reward again this time for whatever reason. I think the Beast King mercenary group is manipulating them. Hey, Yuda, if Kirks doesn't pay up this time, I'm leaving this country. I know, Jean. I've said it before three times in my limit. And as expected, the tussles were even more forceful this time, enough to leave us dumbfounded. Refusing to reinforce the Beast King mercenaries who were fighting well against a large army, avoiding the battle in the center and fleeing to the west where there were no enemies, pretending to fight and only reporting the defeat of the enemy. The words no longer brought any emotion to my heart. Is that your assessment of the Iron Knight's performance in this battle, Commander? Yes, I'm afraid the Iron Knights will not be rewarded again this time. Okay, then I am breaking the contract. I can't fight for this country anymore. Well, that's too bad. I personally would have appreciated you guys. Well, free mercenaries, do as you please. I have a hard time understanding what he was appreciating. I don't know if a strong enemy will come after we're gone. If you regret it then, it will be too late. Jean seemed to have said that because he knew that the reinforcements in Salacia were the Elysian Empire, but it didn't seem to have any effect on the commander of the Kirk's army. When a strong enemy comes, the Beast King mercenaries will take them down, because unlike you, they have real power, real ability, then you'll have to depend on the Beast King mercenaries. This is how I decided to leave Kirk's after three battles. I don't have very good memories, but it might have been a good experience. Also. That enemy woman is still in our ride carrier, not handed over to Kirk's, as it would be dangerous to take her out of the medical capsule now. After all, we're just working for free, and with the ally riders as baggage. It is true that there was no reward, but we were able to receive supplies, so it wasn't too much of a loss. Oh, that's right. The enemy is a senior rider of the Elysian Empire. Can't we get a ransom or something? I don't like the idea of a ransom because it makes me feel like a criminal. You're such a good boy, Yuta. You should learn a little from him. Huh. Now, where do you want to go next? When Alana asked that, Jean quickly replied, I wasn't expecting to leave Kirk so soon, so I haven't thought about it yet. Well, how about a small group of countries in the south? There's a lot of skirmishes there. Well, yes, there's not a lot of money to be made, but there's also not a lot of bad countries like Kirk's, so that could be a possibility. Alana and Jean are discussing, but I'm not familiar with geography or the state of affairs in this world, so I can't offer any opinions. Alana and Jean decided that we should head south in search of our next employer. It was five days later when we heard the news that the Kirk's Republic had fallen. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-47, where is my revenge? C-47, where is my revenge? Chapter 44 sponsored by Kingpin. Once again thank you for your generosity. My Elvira, which had lost its right arm, was repaired by a mechanic from Alicia's. The mechanic looked at the broken parts and said with a dubious expression, What kind of weapon could break the SS armor of Elvira like this? I couldn't see the enemy's weapon either. What the hell was that? How's it going, Yuki? As I was checking the repaired Elvira, Yudo-san spoke to me. Yes, no problem. Well, that's good to know. I'm leaving now. Can you come with me? Of course I'm coming. To avenge Amina's death. Yuto nodded when I said that. The attack on the Kirk's Republic and the Beast King mercenaries was a complete siege and annihilation operation. I'm not going to let any of you go. And I'm not going to accept any surrenders. This is total annihilation. Surrounding the Kirk's Republic and attacking it from eight directions to destroy the enemy. It was a simple but impossible mission without absolute strength. But Yuto's army had the power to carry it out, and the ability of the continent's strongest riders was real. We overwhelmingly overran the Kirk's Republic and destroyed the enemy's magic rafts. The Kirk's Republic only resisted at the beginning, but when they were driven to the capital, they waved the white flag and desperately wanted to surrender. Of course, it was pointless to surrender in this situation, where the Emperor had ordered complete annihilation. The capital city has fallen and the Kirk's Republic has been conquered. Most of the enemy's magic rafts have been eradicated and the leaders of the Kirk's Republic have been captured. However, there was one thing that remained on my mind, 
that golden magic raft, and its companions were nowhere to be found in the enemy army. Where did the Beast King mercenary group go? Then I received word that the leader of the Beast King mercenary group had been captured. Where is the leader of the Beast King mercenaries now? He's in the central square of the capital. It looks like he's about to be executed. I hurriedly headed there to check and see if I could get to the end of my revenge. Two men were tied up in the central square. Which one of them is the leader of the Beast King mercenaries? I asked the officer on guard. This is the commander of the Kirk's army, and the leader of the Beast King mercenaries is the man tied up over there. I spoke to the leader of the Beast King mercenary group. Do you know who I am? Huh? I don't know. I am the rider of the Jet Black magic raft that fought you in Kyrene. Jet Black, could it be that you've been hurting us so much? Were you the rider? Damn it. What are you talking about? We've been defeated by you. Huh? What are you talking about? We, the Beast King mercenaries, were beaten to a pulp by you guys and ran away. I don't understand what he's talking about. Are there no golden magic rafts in your group? When I said that, the leader of the Beast King mercenary group started laughing vigorously, as if something had hit him. Ha ha! I'm not sure if it was the four magic rafts, gold, white, red and blue, that beat you up so badly. That's right. That's the Beast King mercenaries, right? Ha 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 ha! That's funny! This is exactly what digging a grave is. Listen, I'll tell you, they're not the Beast King mercenaries. They're a mercenary group called the Iron Knights. Iron Knights! They're ridiculously strong! We knew we couldn't win if we tried to compete with them. So we bribed Kirk's military intelligence, other mercenary groups, and regular soldiers in the field to take credit for their work behind their backs. I didn't think the enemy knew about it. This is a masterpiece. The man next to me, the commander of the Kirk's army, I believe, shouted loudly when he heard what was said. Wait a minute, you. What are you talking about? Tell me what this is all about. I told you. I saw it at the Battle of Ruba Fortress. The Iron Knights are the strongest mercenary group full of monsters. We can't compete with them head on. So we've been sneaking around behind their backs. Commander, you're a fool. If you hadn't kicked them out, you wouldn't be in this mess. Ha 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 ha. You. Oh, you fooled me too. It's too late. They're already gone. Let's both be executed in peace. Fuck you. Because of you. I have a wife and kids. That's too bad. You should be ashamed of yourself for being so blind. Damn, that joke of Iron Warriors defeats Count was real. Oh my god, I'm, I'm going to, those monstrously strong guys. It's time for your execution. The officer in charge of the execution said coldly and nonchalantly, the method of execution is burning at the stake. I didn't want to see that, so I left the place. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-48 a disturbing atmosphere slash Magisa. C48. A disturbing atmosphere slash Magisa. When we arrived in Temera, we immediately entered the castle where the conference was held. The meeting will be attended by myself, Renel, and Nagisa. Me? Yes, I want to show you off. This king thought so, but I don't hate such peaceful thinking. The meeting was held at a large round table with twelve seats. The king sat at one of the seats, and Renel and I stood behind him waiting. It's funny, the meeting's already started and only about half the people are here. It's true, as Renel said, there are a lot of empty seats. I'm sorry I'm late. Then one of them came into the conference room, but no one else came after that. What do you mean, for countries are absent? Eight countries participated in the summit, which was scheduled to include twelve countries, and it was an elderly man who pointed this out. King Arpa, the four absent nations, have just announced their intention to withdraw from the Eastern Bloc in a communication. What the hell? What do you mean by that? Lord Veda, the elderly man known as King Arpa shouted in surprise. The Ruja Empire is involved. They want to divide us. Well, if that's the case, then war is inevitable. Wait a minute. Isn't this a meeting to avert war? I'm getting a really bad feeling about this. If the four nations that have withdrawn are going to side with the Ruja Empire... We're going to be at a significant disadvantage. We might want to consider alliances with other countries. What about the Emo Kingdom? They don't get along well with Ruja and they might be on our side. I think we'll move in that direction. But does anyone object? No one expressed any opposition to the question. 
since there is no opposition, I would like someone to represent us in forming an alliance with Emo. But I think King Amuria, Majidano, would be the best choice here. Yes, I've heard that King Amuria and King Emo are old acquaintances, and I can think of no one more qualified. It seems that some important work has fallen to the king. I wonder how he will respond to it. Okay, I'll take care of that for you. Hey, hey, dad, it's not that easy, Rennell protested in a whisper. In the end, the atmosphere didn't seem to be right for showing me off, and the meeting ended with a discussion of alliances and military cooperation for defense. Back at the ride carrier, the daughter struck the father king. Dad, why are you accepting such an important role so easily? It's inevitable. How could I refuse in that atmosphere? And when they said you and King Emo are old friends, it only meant you know each other in a bad way. Mom told me you two didn't get along. Gosh, well, that's true, but he and I are both grown up, so let bygones be bygones. That's just your opinion. You don't know what he thinks. Ugh. Apparently, Rennell had the advantage in the argument, and the king was tense. Still, Rennell was desperately trying to figure out how to persuade King Emo in the end. She is a good daughter, after all. He loves fruits, so let's bring him some rare ones as gifts. What's the point of trusting the fate of the country to some fruits? It has to be a big gift, like a monopoly on the metal trade. Well, well, how about the mining rights of Meyer? If you give that away, our income will plummet. Yeah, that's right. For now, it looks like Rennell can handle it. Since it was closer to go from Temra to Emo than back to Amuria, we decided to head to the Emo kingdom on our own. I'm sorry, Nagisa. I've been working long hours. That's fine, but are you okay? Are you sure there won't be a war? I don't want a war either, so I'll definitely stop it. Renel said so, but a strange feeling of unease and discomfort flooded my heart. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C49, The Gentle Giant. C49, the gentle giant. Hey, check this out. The Kirk's Republic was destroyed right after we left. Jean happily reported this after reading the information paper he had purchased in town. Did the Alicia Empire destroy them? When Alana asked this while reading a book, Jean replied with a big smile on his face. The strongest rider on the continent came from Alicia. Kirk's didn't had a chance. Yuto, he's a real monster. Alana, do you know him? I had a run-in with him before. Even Yuta will lose? I don't know. Knowing Yuto's absolute strength, I think Yuta could handle him. I guess it's because I'm in love with him. I felt uncomfortable being there, so I decided to go towards Nanami and Pharma, who were playing outside the ride carrier. We were resting in a forest after a long journey. There is a beautiful spring in the forest, where Nanami and Pharma are bathing and playing. Yikes! Suddenly, I heard a scream. That voice was Nanami. I hurriedly ran toward the voice. When I looked, I saw a large bear-like man standing right in front of Naomi and Pharma. I jumped in between them. Stop! I shouted to the man, shaking a little. Oh, oh, go, sorry, I scared you, sorry. The man said so sadly. So, he's not a bad guy. Um, what can I do for you? I asked, and the guy looked like he wanted to say something. You won't understand unless I tell you. The man began to speak as if he had made up his mind. I was worried when I saw that you came into this big box where a lot of animals live. Apparently, he came to see if we would kill the animals in the forest. Don't worry, we don't kill animals. The man smiled happily as I said this. Oh, Lorgo. Okay, I'm Yuda, and they're Nanami and Pharma. Yuda, Nanami, Pharma, remembered. Oh, I'm dumb, but I can remember people's names. My mom taught me that I should at least remember people's names. Lorgo looked scary, like a bear. But the more I talked to him, the more I could tell he was a good guy. The animals in this forest have been hurt badly before, and I couldn't do anything for them. That's why I rushed here today, to protect the animals. But Yuta and the others are good people, thank goodness. Well, Lorgo is kind. Me. Kind? Yes, Lorgo is kind. Kind he he owed is kind. Lorgo was so happy with my words that he repeated the word, kind, over and over again, smiling. Why are you so happy? My mother told me a long time ago to be a kind person. I didn't know how to be a kind person then. Lorgo was smiling as he said this, but now he began to shed tears. What's wrong with you all of a sudden? 
Did something sad happen to you? Mom, I remembered Ode's mom is gone. Ode, misses her. I don't have a mom or dad. Pharma, no mom, no dad. Ode's dad died last month, so no dad, no mom, Pharma and Ode, the same. I see, but I'm not lonely. I have Nanami and Yuta now. Pharma has both Yuta and Nanami? Ode has no one, Ode, lonely. Lorgo, how about you become friends with me so you won't be so lonely for a bit? Really? You're going to be my friend? No one has ever made friends with me because I'm so ugly. I'm glad. Then be my friend too, even though I am so ugly. Pharma is not ugly. And I'm happy to be friends with Pharma. Oh, don't just leave Nanami out of this. Let's be friends with her too. It's the best day of my life. I've made more friends than I can count. Lorgo's smile looked really happy when he said that. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C50, The Gentle Lord. C50, The Gentle Lord. King Pen sponsored another four chapters. Only three releases today since I'm busy, the other two will be released tomorrow. I don't care what you say, you eat a lot, Jean says so in a dumbfounded way. In fact, I invited Lorgo to dinner to celebrate us becoming friends. Yummy! It's been a long time since I've had something this good. Well, there's plenty to go around, so you can eat, I said, and Lorgo responded with a smiling expression. Ah. Uh, Lorgo, that's Nanami's. I'm sorry, I'll return it. You don't have to give me back what you put in your mouth. You can have this one. Oh my god, that's for Pharma, isn't it? Okay, what do I do? No more Lorgo. Lorgo, you can have some of mine. Really? I want to eat more of it. But I feel sorry for Pharma's lost food. I'm sorry for you. I've made some extra food for you. So don't look so sad. Jean, who had seen the situation, went and cooked some more and brought it to him. He's a kind guy, after all, isn't he? I got a lot. Nanami, Pharma, let's eat together. Lorgo said to them happily. The scene, which was quite funny, naturally brought laughter from everyone. Lorgo, are you close to home? Lorgo replied to my question while munching. Near, right there. Okay, I'll give you a lift later. It was already getting dark, and it would be dangerous to move through the forest. Thank you, so much, Ode's house. I invite everyone, though there is nothing. It's my dream to have friends over to my house. I'll visit it when I drop you off. Lorgo smiled happily when I said that. Surprisingly, Lorgo's house was a small castle. This is Lorgo's house. Yes, it's my house. Lorgo, who are you? I'm the lord of this place since last month. He told me that his father died last month, so he took over the family. I'm surprised that Lorgo has such a family background. However, when Lorgo led me into the castle, I felt a great sense of discomfort. It was too quiet. I wondered if everyone had gone to bed early, but it didn't seem to be at that level. Moreover, the inside of the castle was a little rough and untidy. Lorgo, this castle is it empty? Last month, Ode became lord and everyone in the castle went away with the money and stuff in the castle. Ode, now I live here all by myself. The people at the castle fled with the castle's valuables when Lorgo became lord. They're terrible people. You didn't get mad at those guys? I'm not smart, I'm not good at work, I can't do anything. So everyone got angry and left. I'm not angry at anyone, Ode. Is just sad. What a sad story. I feel a little bad because I just found out that Lorgo is a good guy. As Lorgo said, there was nothing in the castle. That's how much household goods and things were taken. The only things that were there were Lorgo's bed and an old wardrobe. I'm sorry. There's really nothing. Hospitable. I can't do. Don't worry about it. Hospitality is all about feelings. And I'm sure Lorgo's feelings are well understood. Yuta, Ode, let's stay here today. Yes, it would be nice to stay in a castle. Nanami and Pharma suggested that. It is true that there is nothing to do but stay here. But is where I sleep, so you can use my bed. Lorgo tries to offer his own bed but... No, we can borrow some scrap wood or something from around here. And I'll have a bed ready for us in no time. Nanami, Pharma. Get some sheets and blankets from the ride carrier. As Jean said this, Nanami and Pharma ran to the ride carrier. Gene is surprisingly handy. He made good use of scrap wood and prepared an improvised bed. Come on, Lorgo, we can all stay here. When Gene said that, Lorgo smiled happily. 
I wish Liza would come over here. As Naomi says, Liza is the only one left on the ride carrier. She usually doesn't get involved with us unless she has to, so I'm a little worried. That girl likes to be alone. A little more camaraderie would be nice. Alana also seems to be worried for her. Then we all lay down on the bed and listened to Lorgo's story. He didn't have much to say about his experiences, but he seemed happy to be talking to us. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-51, The Work of a Lord. C-51, The Work of a Lord. When I woke up from my unusual and not very comfortable bed, Nanami and Pharma were already up and making breakfast for everyone. That's unusual, you two cooking together. Jean usually cooks our meals, and I couldn't help but tell them. Just get the plates ready Yuda, because I made the most delicious food. It seems that Naomi has confidence in her cooking, and she says so happily. However, when I ate I found that. Hot! Wait a minute, Nanami. What the hell did you put in this? Nanami food was ridiculously spicy. Even Alana, who loves spicy food, frowned and I was in agony after taking a bite. What? It's the red spice that Jean always uses. How much did you put in there? One bag. You idiot! That's like putting a pinch of spice in your food. If you put a bag of it in, it's bound to get spicy. Because Nanami thought it would be tasty. Jean, don't be so upset with Nanami because she made it for a good cause. When I said that, Jean was like, I know that too, and as he got up from his seat he said, Damn, I'll make it again. Sorry, wasted food, Nanami says sadly, but don't waste time eating it all, Lorgo said and brought all of Nanami's food in front of him. Lorgo, don't do this. This spiciness is out of the ordinary. Lorgo just smiled and didn't stop eating. Yeah, hurts a little, but is so delicious. Lorgo's face is bright red and he's sweating as he eats. Take it easy, Lorgo. Nanami was worried and said so. But Lorgo smiled as best he could and said, I'm fine. No, I think he's clearly pushing it. But I guess that's Lorgo's kindness. Lorgo, give me some of that. Yuta, don't worry. I can eat all the food. No, I just want to eat. Then I brought the food to my mouth. A ridiculous amount of stimulation spreads in my mouth. No way, Lorgo that guy. How can he keep up eating like that? As if my actions were contagious. Alana also took a bite of Naomi and Pharma food. It's not that bad once you get used to it. Even so, Alana's forehead was sweating unceasingly. Naomi and Pharma also feel responsible, crying and eating spicy food. They don't seem to like spicy food and stopped after one bite. I'm hungry. Do you have anything to eat? It was Liza, who was alone in the ride carrier. There you are. That looks good. I'll take some. Ah. Uh, Liza. It's... Before I could stop her, Liza brought Nanami's very spicy dish to her mouth. Delicious! That tastes amazing. Can I have some more? We watched in dismay as Liza ate Nanami's extremely spicy food without a care in the world. I had just finished breakfast and was thinking of going for a walk when the gates of the castle were violently banged. My lord! Come on out! Lorgo answered the call and went outside. We were curious about what had happened because the people were so swarthy so we went along with him. Oh, came out, what's wrong, what's going on? I told you about the canal in the rice field and the well in the village. What do you mean you haven't done anything yet? I don't know how to do, you don't know how to do it. If you're a lord, do your job like a lord. We're in trouble. Oh, do. Lorgo wants to meet the needs of his lordship, but he really doesn't know what to do. Hey guys, that's enough, Jean said to them as if he couldn't keep quiet about the people blaming Lorgo. What the hell you stranger shut up. Just tell us what it is you want him to do, and we'll do it for you. You guys? The canal in the rice field collapsed during the last heavy rains, and the well in the village also collapsed, so there is no drinking water. When Jean heard this, he turned to us and said, Hey Yuda, Nanami, Alana, Pharma, can you get the magic rafts? Okay, but what are we doing? Didn't you hear? We're repairing the canal and the well. Well, it's true that a magic rafts can do construction work. But I wonder if this is something that an amateur can do? Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-52, the power to protect. C-52, the power to protect. When I brought my magic raft, Jean was measuring something. Yuda, can you make a ditch between here and there? Nanami removed that big rock over there. 
Alana leveled that hollow you see over there, and Pharma fixed the village well. Come with me. I obediently followed the instructions. It seems that Jean is also giving Pharma detailed instructions on how to fix the well in the village. We followed Jean's lead, and to our surprise, the repairs to the canal and well were really completed. Does Jean know anything about construction? No, a merchant is only as good as his knowledge and experience, so I've studied a lot of things, though I never thought I'd actually use my knowledge of construction. Lorgo seemed to be grateful and bowed to Jean several times. Oh, Jean, wow, oh, I respect you, respect. The Lord was very grateful, but the result did not seem to affect the people. Humph, you finally fixed it. You really are a useless Lord. You'd better respond faster next time. What's with that tone? Don't you guys have any words of gratitude? I was so angry that I couldn't help but say so. It's natural for a Lord to work for his people. If you want me to be grateful, you'd better respond sooner. Jean's fist flew at the people who shouted that. Don't take it for granted that people will do things for you. It doesn't matter what position you're in. You think it's normal for a lord to do something for his people. Some lords make their people work like slaves and don't give them enough to eat, and they starve to death. But only they eat rich meals every day. How fortunate are you? I'm sure he didn't treat you like slaves. He's just a little clumsy, that's all. I don't know why I found Jean's words so compelling. The people sensed this and returned to the village without saying anything back. Jean, no, hmm, well, I agree you're not cut out to be a lord, so I won't say anything bad about that. But you might want to think about returning your lands back to the king. Ode, is renting this place? No, not you. Your ancestors. I don't know, but I promise that I would protect the people. You're a good person. I have the power to protect. I want to show you. Come with me. Then Lorgo took us somewhere. It was the basement of a castle. This is the only place I can go. As he said this, Lorgo held up his hand to the shiny stone. A large door was opened and there was a round, pale blue magic machine. What is this, Lorgo? It's my magic raft, and it protects my people. Wait a minute, this is the magic raft Ganesha, a high-level Highlander exclusive machine with an activation Lydia value of 15, 000. I can't believe I'm seeing a very rare magic raft. Only few of them exist on the continent. That's what Pharma explained to me. TSK, wait, you mean. Lorgo, are you a Highlander? I don't know, Highlander, but my dad said so. That fact was enough of a surprise for everyone. If you're a Highlander, you need more dignity. You must speak back to your subjects. But, and, not but. All right, I'll train you up a little bit. Just follow me. Yeah. Jean took a bewildered Lorgo and headed outside. I'm surprised that Lorgo is a Highlander. At Alana's words, I expressed my own thoughts. I'm more surprised that Jean is so meddlesome. That's what I thought, too. His angry words were very powerful. Maybe he experienced it firsthand. Are you saying that the story of the Lord who treated his people like slaves was Jean's real experience? I don't know, but it would make sense if it were. Well, I didn't know anything about Jean before we met so maybe it was real. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-53, Parting with the Giant. C-53, Parting with the Giant. Jean and Lorgo's indescribable training continued into the night. All right, you can say it. I'm starting to feel like I can do this. Then say it again. Oh, I'm a lord then. There's more to it than that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's good that Lorgo is gaining confidence. But I don't actually think his personality is going to change that easily. Jean, I think it's time to eat. At Nanami's sorrowful request, the training session came to an end. Jean had prepared a rather sumptuous meal, probably in recognition of the fact that he and Lorgo would be parting ways today. Lorgo, we're leaving for the south tomorrow, so this will be the last time we're eating together like this. When I said that, he gave me an exquisitely sad look. Oh, Delone again? Sorry, but we can't stay here forever. Well, I can't help it. I'm going to miss you, but Yuda and the others have things to do. For a moment, I almost asked Lorgo if he'd come with me, but he's the lord of this place. I can't interfere with that. We stayed at Lorgo's castle that day as well, planning to leave tomorrow morning. We and Lorgo talked all the way to sleep. I knew Lorgo was a good guy, and I'm glad we became friends. The next morning. Dear Lorgo. Take care. 
Nanami, take care too. Lorgo, eat your dinner. I'm going to eat my food, Pharma. Take it easy. Call me if you need anything. Alana, okay, I'll contact you. Tell them to get off their asses. Don't be scared. Yeah, I'll try my best, Jean. Um, be well. I wish I could have talked to Liza more. Lorgo, wherever you are, we'll be friends. Yeah, Yuda and I are friends. We got into the ride carrier and left Lorgo's castle. Lorgo kept waving his hand all the way until we were out of sight. That was a funny guy, Jean says wistfully and Naomi tells me. You should have invited Lorgo to join the warriors. Yeah, he's a Highlander, he'd be a great asset. Jean agreed with her before I could answer. I thought about that, but Lorgo's the lord of that place, and he's got his own agenda. It's just a role. Maybe he's not ready to be a lord. I agree, but I can't ask him to leave everything and come with me. Well, yeah, I wonder what that guy would have thought if we told him to follow us. I'm not sure, but I think Lorgo would have been happy. When I think about it, I still regret that I didn't invite him. With such a feeling of bewilderment still lingering, we headed south. We stopped at a bar on the way to have a light lunch out, as the atmosphere was getting a bit strange. The taste wasn't great, and as I was eating, I thought that I would have been better off making something to eat in the ride carrier. At the same time I heard loud talking from a seat a little farther away. Didn't you guys take part in that looting job in the neighboring territory that Gaboro invited you to? I wanted to, but my magic raft broke down. It's a shame, because it's good work. It's really good work, isn't it? When the Lord is a fool and there are no vassals or soldiers we can loot all we want. So how many of you ended up participating? I heard about 30 magic rafts. Oh man, I wish I could have been there. We silently got up from our seats and approached the men who were talking. Hey, can you tell us more about that? Jean asked the men. Ah, uh, what the hell are you guys trying to fight? Alana kicked them without mercy. She's strong even if she's not in a magic raft. We're asking you to elaborate on what you were just talking about. When Alana asked this, she pulled out a knife and flicked it at the neck of one of the men. One of them, shaking, began to speak. A bandit head named Gaboro, who has this area as his territory, came to me with information that there was a territory that was left with only the Lord, and he was gathering people to attack the territory. Isn't that territory just north of here? That's, it is. I knew it was Lorgo's territory. Oh no, Lorgo is supposed to be trying to protect his people, but with his personality. I'm not sure if he can even fight a bandit. We have to save him. We quickly returned to the ride carrier and headed north to Lorgo's territory. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-54 New Friends. C-54 New Friends. Chapter 44 Sponsored by Kingpen. Thanks for the support. When we entered Lorgo's territory, we could see that it had been ransacked in places. It seems that the bandits have already started looting. There he is, Ganesha of Lorgo. It's already almost wrecked. Ganesha was being attacked one-sidedly by quite a few magic rafts. He tried to protect the people of his domain by fighting with his magic raft, but he didn't know what to do. Yuda, Arleo, ready! Alana, Bersia, ready! Nanami, Vajra, ready! Pharma, Garuda, ready! We jumped out of the ride carrier and started attacking the bandits' magic rafts that surrounded and attacked Lorgo. What the hell is wrong with you people? You've come to steal what we have. I heard a shout from one of the thieves' magic rafts. We're not with you. We're here to save our friend. I replied as I smashed two magic rafts with my double spear. The thief's magic rafts were even weaker than the magic rafts of the Salation army that we fought before. They were so fragile that they would stop working after a light hit, and their movements were awkward and slow. When I thought that a Highlander's aircraft had been beaten to shreds by such weak opponents, I realized how long Lorgo had been under a one-sided attack. Lorgo, you okay? Yuda, Ode, tried to protect everyone, but I don't know how to do it. Ode, Ugh, even through the magic raft. I could see that Lorgo was crying. I said, it's all right now, you don't have to cry. While I was consoling Lorgo, the thieves' magic rafts attacked me. Two of them attacked me from both sides at the same time. I pierced the one from the right with the double spear and the one on the left was smashed in the face by Arleo's elbow. One of them came from further back, swinging a sword, but was pierced by Pharma's arrow. 
Alana and Nanami moved quickly to destroy the thieves' magicrafts one after another, and as they passed by, the thieves were unable to do anything. Who the hell are you, against so many magicrafts? From the dozens of magicrafts, only three were left, including the one that looked like the boss. We are the Iron Knights, a mercenary group. The Iron Knight, TSK, for such an obscure mercenary group. We're still nobodies. But if we keep making a name for ourselves like this, I think we'll become famous one day. While blowing off the head of the enemy boss's magic craft, and chopping off its arms and legs to put it out of action. The other enemy machines were cleared out by Alana and the others. Once all the bandits were taken care of, I approached Ganesha. Lorgo opened the hatch and came out. Ode, Ode, Yuta, Ode. He wanted to say something, but didn't seem to know what to say, so instead I shouted to Lorgo. I'm sorry, come with us. Join me, Lorgo. Ode, is stupid and slow and annoys Yuta and the others, Ode. I don't care about that. Lorgo is Lorgo, you're my friend companion now. When I said that, Lorgo looked up and shouted back excitedly. I'll be one of you, Ode, Yuta. Ode, quit being a lord. Lorgo chose to quit being a lord and become one of us. Thus, we welcomed Lorgo into the ranks of the Iron Knights. We immediately made arrangements for the relinquishment of Lorgo's domain, informing the king in formal writing. Jean took care of all the paperwork and stuff, he can really do anything. Look, if you send this letter out, you'll no longer be lord of this place. Jean made one last check. Lorgo made his intentions known with a face full of hesitation. I can't be a lord, I can't be a nuisance to the people. I want to be friends with Yuta and the others. Jean nodded and handed the letter to the courier he had requested to come, paying him in advance for the delivery. The courier immediately went to the king. I've heard that it's rare for anyone to relinquish a territory. I think the king would be surprised. Lorgo, we can be together forever. Come on, we have to find a room for Lorgo. Accompanied by Nanami and Pharma, Lorgo was pulled to the ride carrier. When I saw Lorgo's happy expression, I truly felt glad that I invited him to join the Iron Knights. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-55, The Free Prisoner. C-55, the free prisoner. I feel like I've been asleep for a very long time. I'm in a daze and my recent memories are fuzzy. Where am I? I look around, but I'm in a strange room. Though considering that I'm sleeping in a medical capsule, it looks like I've been treated for injuries. I exited the medical capsule and tried to walk out of the room, but realized I was naked and looked around the room for clothes. At that time, there was a sound and the door of the room was opened. It was a young man who came in. When he saw me naked, the man looked flustered, closed his eyes and apologized. Sorry, I didn't know you were up already. He handed me a simple white dress without looking at me. I put it on and asked the man a question. Where am I? Ride Carrier Medical Bay. What am I doing here? You were badly injured. I was treating you. I'm glad to see you're better. You saved my life. I want to thank you. No, we're the ones who hurt you. Wait a minute, you said you hurt me. Those words triggered a little bit of memory. As I recall, I was in a battle with the Beast King mercenaries. Are you from the Beast King mercenaries? I exclaimed, looking around the room for some kind of weapon. But the man shook his head and denied it. How come the name of the Beast King mercenaries came up? I was killed by the Beast King mercenary group's magic craft. We're the Iron Knights. Why are we talking about them? Iron Knights, what's that? The mercenaries, the ones who defeated you, remember? Then that golden magic machine. That's Vidra, my friend. Foo, okay, I understand that you Iron Knight defeated me, but I don't know why I'm here. You were badly injured and needed to be treated immediately, so you were put in a medical capsule for treatment. Wait a minute, that's why you saved me, the enemy? It doesn't matter if you're an enemy or not, you're injured and it's normal to help. I'm not sure I understand what this guy is saying. Well... He saved my life and will probably get a ransom from Alicia. Okay, you want a ransom? That's a wise decision. I'm a double Highlander. I'm sure they'll give you a hundred or two hundred million easily. Ransom? We're not criminals. We don't need ransom. We're not going to hold you. You're healed now, so you can leave anytime you want. What is this guy saying? That he helped the enemy without getting any benefit from it. That's impossible. There's no such mercenary. There must be something more to it than that. Are you hungry? 
If you're going to leave here, why don't you at least eat? Although I was wary of the enemy's invitation to eat, my stomach reacted honestly. I convinced myself that replenishing my energy here was an important act to return to my homeland, and accepted the offer. The Kirk's Republic has been destroyed. As we ate, I listened to what happened after I was put into the medical capsule. Yes, it seems that someone from Alicia, the strongest rider on the continent, came and quickly destroyed it. I don't believe that Yudo-san is. How did that happen? It's impossible for Yudo-san to be in the war of a vassal state, no matter how much he wants to. I don't know about that. Because as soon as we rescued you, we cancelled our contract with Kirks and left the country. The man with the weird pointy head said indifferently as he chewed on a sausage. Well, I guess I'll find out when I get back to Alicia. But more importantly, you guys are so natural. Even though you're eating with the enemy, aren't you wary? I couldn't help but ask if it was because there were children present. Or because the atmosphere was so homey. You said you were an enemy. But that was while you were under contract with Kirks. And now that Kirk's doesn't exist, you're not really an enemy, are you? Well, maybe it's just a dry feeling peculiar to mercenaries. But the fact that I was defeated by one of you doesn't go away. Don't you think I have a grudge against that person? When I said that, for some reason, everyone's eyes were drawn to one girl, who got out of her seat and walked towards me. Gosh, I'm sorry. Nanami was desperate too. With her head bowed, the girl apologized to me. No way. Could it be that you are the writer of that golden magic raft? The girl who introduced herself as Nanami gave a small nod. I was shocked that the writer of that powerful magic raft was such a young girl. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-56, First Feelings. C-56, First Feelings. It is normal to be defeated and beaten in war, and it is impossible for me, as a professional soldier, to hold a personal grudge against them. But to be beaten by a girl like this. For the first time I was shaken by an indescribable emotion. Fight me again, I said without thinking. What, you want to play with Nanami? Fight me in a mock battle. Hey, what are you talking about? I'm not going to accept a match like that for less than a gold mine. The pointy-headed man interrupts the conversation. And I certainly don't see any reason to accept such a match. But my emotions won't stop. All right, I'll pay you 500,000 gold coins just to play and another 500,000 if you beat me. All right, Nanami, give her a squeeze. EW. No way. The pointy head was on board, but Nanami was having difficulty, and adding more money didn't seem to change her mind. Why don't you want to fight me? Because you're strong, and I know who you are, so it's hard to fight you. You can't fight someone you know. You're still a kid, even for a mercenary. It's a mock battle. Don't your friends fight each other in training? We do, but you don't have a magic raft, so how do you fight? Please lend me someone's magic raft. As soon as I made my request, the red-haired woman declared. I'm not lending you my bursia. The girl, who is a beastie, refuses to budge. I don't want anyone to ride my Garuda. It's true that for mercenaries, the magic raft is an important tool of business, and I'm well aware that they don't borrow it. If it's my Arleo, I can lend it to you, but I don't know if you can ride it. Can I borrow it? Yeah, but you probably won't be able to ride it. I'm a double Highlander. I can fly most magic rafts, so I'll be fine. But you know, my Arleo is... Okay, if you want to use it, you can borrow it. But whether you can ride it or not, you'll have to pay 500,000 gold coins for the loan. Fine, I'll pay you 500,000 gold coins. If you can't ride it, you lose, is that okay with you? Of course. In that case, I'll take my loss. No, that's why, Arleo is... Yuda still wanted to say something, but the pointy-headed man went on and on. All right, let's get to the hangar. Nanami, you get ready. No way. The magic raft that was loaned to me was the white one that I saw in Kairuni. I remember it was moving well. I can fight with this. I opened the hatch and got inside. Then I immediately placed my hand on the control ball and tried to activate the magic raft. No way, the magic raft does not respond at all. Hey, what's going on? Hurry up and start it up. I can hear the pointy-headed voice from outside. Why isn't it working? Don't tell me this is a dedicated triple Highlander plane. I've been had. The pointy-head knew I couldn't ride it, so he gave me those conditions. Hey you, you set me up. 
I yelled that at him as I opened the hatch. Set you up? What are you talking about? This is a triple Highlander magic raft. You knew that, and that's why you made the conditions you did. Come on, Arleo's rider Yuda is not a triple Highlander. What? No way. Well, why don't you ask him what his Lydia value is? When I asked him, Yuda replied in a matter-of-fact manner. My Lydia value is two dot. Are you kidding me? No one believes me, but it's true. It's hard to believe that people with a single-digit Lydia value even exist. But what does it mean that I can't even start up a magic raft that a single-digit person can use? Well, the match is over. 500,000 gold coins for the match. 500,000 for the victory reward. And 500,000 for the Arleo lending fee. Making a total of 1.5 million gold coins. The pointy head said this with a smirk and a disgusting smile on his face. I'll go to the nearest town and withdraw the money from the ladle bank. He was quick to act when it came to paying the bill, quickly drove us to a nearby town, and dropped us off in front of a branch of a ladle bank. When I entered the ladle bank, I handed my card to the receptionist to make a withdrawal. I decided to withdraw the money for the trip to Alicia as well, and told the receptionist that I wanted to withdraw two million gold coins. I'm sorry, but your card is no longer valid. What? Why is invalid? Your account has been frozen due to your death. Where did you get this card? The receptionist looked at me suspiciously. She said I'd passed away. Oh dear, apparently you're supposed to be dead back home. That's what the pointy-headed man said. Maybe he was right. What should I do? There are no facilities in Alicia this far south on the continent. It has become difficult to return to Alicia, let alone pay the 1.5 million gold. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-57, paying with her body. C-57, paying with her body. In the living room of the ride carrier, one depressed woman, Alicia's senior rider, who was badly injured by Nanami, was in trouble because of Jean's unreasonable debt. In addition, her account has been frozen due to the death of the owner, and it seems that she is penniless and cannot even return to her country. What are you going to do, sister? You have to pay what you owe, Jean told her with a businessman's face. I know, I'll pay you properly, but I can't pay you right now because I don't have any money. How about if you drive me to Alicia? I'll pay you 1.5 million plus. No, 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 we're going south now, the other way. So how do I get to? Well, if you don't have the money, maybe you can pay with your body. What are you doing? You can't be that obscene to me. I thought that was a terrible idea, so I complained to Jean. Jean, that's a bit harsh, you should think of a different solution. What's wrong with you guys? I'm asking her to work and pay us back. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? You want me to work? Help you with your mercenary work? That's right, you can't do anything but ride magic rafts. She didn't argue with him, as he seemed to have a point. Okay, I'll take you up on that offer. Okay, here's the deal. 10,000 gold a day, plus food, room, and board. I'll prepare a magic raft for you, and you can use the amount minus the rental cost to repay the debt, and when the debt is gone, the contract is over. Isn't 10,000 gold a day cheap? Hey, don't you know the daily wage of a commoner? Even a very well-paid, high Lydia value person can earn a thousand gold in a day. I certainly don't know the salaries of the common people, but, by the way, how much did you get from Alicia? I get 3 million gold a month as a base salary. And then bonuses for wars and other practical work. 100,000 a day. That's amazing. But this is not Alicia. And if you think about your position, you will understand that the conditions I mentioned are not bad. Jean's powerful words seemed to convince her. And she accepted the terms. However, Jean's trap was also laid in this proposal. The most she can pay back in one day is practically 500 gold. Jean tells me this just as she is returning to her room. Yes, the magic rafts for the double highlanders are expensive. So even if we buy and sell them when we no longer use them, we should get 9,000 gold for a day's rental, plus 500 gold for food and room. So 9,500 gold. Wow, 500 gold a day to pay back 1.5 million, that's... It'll take 3,000 days. No, I think that's a bit excessive. You idiot. She's a double Highlander. You can't get that kind of talent very often. Let's have her work for the Iron Knights for a long time. That's true, but I don't think you're a good person. 
Well, whatever the case, we were going to welcome a new member to the Iron Knights. On that day, we decided to hold a welcome party for her, and a slightly more luxurious meal than usual was prepared. Anamina, I'm going to work here for a while, please take care of me. She doesn't know yet that it's going to be quite a while. I'm Yuda, nice to meet you. When I introduced myself, everyone followed suit. I'm Jean, I'm going to use you, so be prepared. I'm Lorgo, and I'm glad you're here. I'm Nanami. Amina is very strong and reassuring. I'm Pharma, nice to meet you. I'm Alana. Whatever you do, don't mess with Yuta. Hi, I'm Liza. Nice to meet you. After the introductions were complete, Amina asked me this. I'm not familiar with the relationship between men and women, so I just want to make sure. That's correct. Yuta and I have such a deep relationship, you shouldn't interfere. No, Alana is just Yuta's property. The relationship between owner and property is a very deep relationship. The relationship between Nanami and Yuta is much deeper. What kind of relationship? We've taken a bath together. What? What do you mean by that? Nanami, explain it to me. Amina, who had been listening to this exchange between Alana and Nanami, said to me with a straight face. I'm sorry. Are you the kind of person who would take possession of a woman and even bathe with a girl? No. No, is not a mistake, but I will keep my distance from you. Wow, I'm not sure if I've been despised even more. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C58, shopping time. C58, shopping time. We came to a large city to purchase a magic raft for Amina, who joined the Iron Knights. A city this big probably has some double Highlander magic rafts for sale. I don't know. I suppose there are Highlander magic rafts, but there's no general demand for double Highlander ones. Merchants sell them because there are some rich collectors. I'm sure you're right. We do have a potential collector in the family. Certainly, Pharma seems to have that quality in spades. After going to several merchants, we finally found someone who dealt with double Highlander magic rafts. We do have double Highlanders magic rafts. Go check it out. I went to the back and found about five magic rafts stored there. That one and the one in the back are double Highlander only magic rafts, both of which are top quality products. So I recommend them, though they're pricey. Okay, Emina, since you're using it, you get to choose. What? Are you sure? But the higher the price, the higher the cost of renting the magic raft. So if you're thinking of paying us back, I'd recommend a cheaper one. That doesn't have to be a dedicated double Highlander magic raft. You decide for yourself. I understand that the cost of renting a magic raft will be high, but I still want to choose one that will allow me to get the most out of it. Oh, Jean's trying to get Amina to make her own choices like this so she doesn't complain about the high cost of renting a magic raft. Can I test ride it? When Amina said this to the merchant, he was seriously surprised. You're a double Highlander. Well, that's fine, but don't move too hard. Amina tested the two dedicated double Highlander magic rafts and chose the slender, frail-looking green one. I like this one. It has more power than it looks and it's very maneuverable. This is Artemis, a magic raft that specializes in mobility with a startup Ludia value of 21,000, maximum output of 2 million, armor B rank, mobility SS rank. It is capable of stealthy actions that make it difficult for the enemy to find you. That's quite an amazing ability, so I'm guessing the price must be high as well. Jean asked the merchant in a deliberate tone. No, it's a good magic raft, but there's not much demand for it, so I'd say 200 million. 200 million. At that price, it must have been sitting in this warehouse for a long time without a buyer. It seems that Jean's point was right on the money, and the merchant's expression changed abruptly. Yes, it's certainly hard to sell. But you know it's a bargain compared to how well it performs. Magic rafts are expensive to maintain. If it's been unsold for years, it must have costed a lot of money, right? If you don't sell it soon, it's going to become unprofitable and you're going to have to take it off the market. It seemed that Jean was the better merchant, and the negotiations were led by him from start to finish, resulting in the price of 200 million dropping by half to 100 million. Okay, I got it. Amina. Can you get in and carry me to the ride carrier? Thus, we were able to purchase a dedicated double Highlander magic raft for an unbelievable price of 100 million. We finished our shopping, 
But Liza wanted to buy some parts for her magic raft, so we went to the magic raft market. Ten blocks of magnetite, fifteen blocks of tektite, and three dozen nanotubes and elemental rope. That'll be thirty-two million gold. Jean, pay him. Oh, come on, Liza, do you really need these? I bought them because I needed them. Now pay up. Here's thirty-two million. When I asked her about it, she replied. You can't bargain for materials because the market is fixed. Well, that's how it works. Isn't that the latest bow gun launcher? Amina said excitedly to Liza in front of one of the weapon shops. Yes, I'm pretty sure it's a high-powered, rapid-fire, automatic loading system, but I hear it's as powerful as the arrow at that size. I want to equip my Artemis with it. I don't mind, but Jean, what are you going to do? It's going to cost 50 million. 50 million for a weapon is fine. But the rental fee will be high, so be prepared. This is a good thing for Jean, who wants to put Amina in debt. He seemed to agree reluctantly, but there was a smile on his face. This means that Amina will be unable to return to her country. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-59 Health First. C-59 Health First. After the shopping was done, we could have gone straight back to the ride carrier. But Jean said there was a place he really wanted to go. So we all went there. I've always wanted to come here. It was a rather large facility with a large YU symbol on the sign. Oidi Spa. I know it's an entertainment center that's recently opened branches in many countries. But what does it do? When Alana asked, Jean began to explain happily. Oidi Spa has dozens of baths, massages, food stalls with delicacies from all over the world. And the sauna is rumored to be the best. Jean's explanation reminded me of a familiar entertainment facility in Japan. Oh, so this is a health spa. As expected of an earthling, you know what you're talking about. I heard that the owner of the OED spa is from Earth. I'm familiar with the health spa because my parents love saunas and I've been there many times. It's certainly a good place to get a little refreshed. What? This place is mixed bathing? I walked into the OED spa and was surprised to hear that men and women take baths together. It's a little embarrassing, but... What, they have separate baths for men and women on earth? Yeah, not many mixed bath houses exist. That's boring. I'm a boy too, and the thought of mixed bathing makes me blush as I imagine Alana and Amina naked. But when I actually went inside I found... What, you have to wear a bathing suit to get in. It was indeed a mixed bath. But it was a bath where you had to wear a bathing suit. What, did you think it was naked? How can a man and a woman who don't know each other take a bath naked? No, sure, but... Oh, Yuda, did you want to see me naked? I'll show you whenever you want. Nanami will show too. It's not that I want to see. No, I want to see. But that's not what I meant. Pharma, who didn't want to show her beast man characteristics, was reading a book alone in the restroom, while the other members were enjoying the dozens of baths available. As a Japanese person... I was a little concerned about Nanami swimming in the large bathtub, but in this world, it's not against etiquette, and it's accepted as a matter of course, and I was refreshing my body in a massage bath with bubbles gushing out. Hey you, I'm going to take that bath now, so please get out. I was suddenly approached by someone I didn't recognize. When I looked, I saw a woman with long, blonde hair and a great style, standing there looking down at me. There's plenty of room in here. Why do I have to get out? I argued, because there was plenty of room in the massage bath, which was not designed for one person. It's disgusting to be in the same bath with a stranger of the opposite sex. Can't you even imagine such a thing? I was here first. If you don't want to go in with me, wait till I get out. What a selfish woman. Anyway, I'm not leaving yet. Well, then I'm going to have to use my powers, Arthur. So I called out for someone and a beautiful, tall man with silver hair came swooping in. Hello, Madam Linicarlo, what's the matter? This man won't give up his bath. Get him out. Yes, Madam. As he said this, the beautiful man grabbed me and tried to pull me out of the bath with all his might. Hey, stop it. Hearing my voice, Alana came running over. What are you doing to my Yuta? With that, she gave the beautiful man a merciless kick in the face. Ack. Hey, what are you doing? Kicking the only thing that Arthur can be proud of to others, his well-shaped face. If this face is distorted, there will really be nothing good about Arthur. What are you going to do when that happens? I don't care. 
It's bad enough you misbehave with my Yuta. I don't know whose Yuta he is, but I've lost my patience. Let's duel it out. Fight with us. A duel, okay. But what's your weapon of choice? I don't use barbaric weapons. The only thing to compare is your spirit and endurance. Wow, interesting. What exactly is your method of dueling? That's it. That said, Linicarlo pointed to the sauna room. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C60. Fierce battle in the sauna. C60. Fierce battle in the sauna. Alana, this is your first time in a sauna, right? It's my first time. But it's only hot, right? I don't mind the heat. I can handle it in the summer. No, it's not the same as summer heat. You have to be prepared for it. Well, even so, I think I can beat that gutless young lady. The rules are simple. Two on two death match. We enter the sauna at the same time and the last team standing wins. The loser does whatever the winner says. If you lose, I'll make you dance naked. Huh, that's my line. If you lose, you'll have to get down on your knees. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be on my knees. But I braced myself to not lose. Me, Alana, Linicarlo and Arthur entered the sauna at the same time as the start signal. The moment we entered, an intense heat enveloped our bodies. Alana, it's cooler down there, so let's go to the bottom. Okay. We whispered to each other and sat down in the lowest seats. Linicarlo and Arthur didn't know it and moved to the top seats. Hmm, sitting down like that. Your deep-rooted civility is evident in your actions. She seemed to be very confident. But within five minutes, her relaxed expression had disappeared and she was sweating and breathing heavily. Hmm, I've reached my limit. You have to stay until the end. Yes, okay, leave it to me. With that, Lina Carlo ran out of the sauna. As expected, the young lady dropped out quickly. But she didn't think much of the handsome man who accompanied her, Arthur who is enduring the heat with a great deal of huffing and puffing, is ruined. What's the matter, Arthur? Have you reached your limit? Don't call me Arthur, you lowlife. What do you want me to call you? Mr. Arthur. Well, Arthur. Arthur, why do you have to say it twice? I'm sure you'll be fine. You're so red, you look like you're about to pass out. Are you okay, Arthur? Ha, huh, I'd be lying if I said I was fine. If I said I was at my limit, it would be taken as weakness. But... I'm not going to get out of here before you do, for Linicarlo's sake. The moment he shouted that, Arthur collapsed and fainted on the spot. Of course, Arthur was taken out of the sauna by the doctor, and we won the sauna endurance battle. You better not think you've won. No, in reality we won. It's a three-round game. We only lost the first round. So what's the second round? It's a breath hold contest. You dive into the bath and whoever can stay in there the longest wins. It was already a hassle, so I accepted the challenge. Yuda, holding his breath, is good at. I'm not particularly good at it, so I let Lorgo play the game for me. As a result, Linicarlo gave up after about 20 seconds, and Arthur tried his best for two minutes, but he fainted and came back to the surface. He was taken away by the doctor again. It's not over yet. Let's do the third round. There's no need for a third round. In the third round, the points are tripled. So whoever wins this one wins. What do you mean? Points. Just do it. It's the third round. It's a real pain in the ass. And it doesn't seem to matter what I say. I'm going to accept the third round. You know, you've been a complete mess for a while now. Maybe you should start playing to your strengths. I kindly told her so. Because if she loses at something she's good at, even this arrogant young lady will have to admit defeat. The thing I'm best at. Are you suggesting that I compete in the thing I'm best at? Yes, it would be quicker. Hmm, you're going to regret those words. Because in the thing I'm best at, I don't need to compete. The outcome is already decided. Just say it, and I'll accept whatever you want. I said that because I felt like I could beat the naive young lady at anything. But what Lina Carlo was good at was something I hadn't expected. I'm best at magic rafts. The third round will be a magic rafts match. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C61, Thunder Emperor. C61, Thunder Emperor. It was good that Lina Carlo and I decided to have a magic raft match. But everyone else didn't want to leave yet because they hadn't enjoyed the OED spa. Well, I still wanted to stay here too. So I told the lady that the magic raft match would have to wait until tomorrow. Okay, but we're going to have to stay with you to make sure you don't run away. 
So we decided to have a drink after the bath. And for some reason we ended up at a food stall area where you can enjoy food and drinks from all over the world. Who are these people who are gobbling up the food I ordered as if it's theirs? Jean looks at Lina Carlo and Arthur and asks. They're going to have a magic raft contest with us tomorrow. So they're accompanying us until then to make sure we don't run away. A magic raft game? What the hell are you doing playing a game that's not even worth one gold? Jean lamented in exasperation. What are the rules for tomorrow's magic raft game? We don't really care what the rules are, but... When Alana spoke to her, Lina Carlo replied as she gobbled down her meal with a vigor that you wouldn't expect from a young lady. Oh, you're so confident, you think you can win under any rules? I'm confident I can beat you no matter what the rules are, so I'll take you on in whatever you are good at. Are you all riders? If that's the case, I'd be happy to take on all of you by myself. Well, that's interesting, but I'm not into a lot of people messing with one person, and since there's two of you, we'll just have a normal two-on-two -two match. You'll regret it. I hope you don't end up wishing you'd all fought together later. Lina Carlo seemed pretty confident, but we have a triple Highlander, Naomi, and two double Highlanders, so I don't think there's any way we can lose. But her confidence was really bothering me. Miss Lina Carlo, do you really intend to fight an equal match with such a lowly man? You're playing around too much. There's no way he can win. Arthur advises that as if he was a fan of Lina Carlo. But it's hard to hear that we're not a match for her. However, the moment they heard Lina Carlo's name, the reaction of Alana and the others changed at once. Wait a minute. Oh, are you the Thunder Emperor Lina Carlo? Alana raised her voice in deep surprise. Oh, you know my name, then you know who you recklessly challenged. Ha! Huh? What's the matter, is Lina Carlo famous? I asked Jean in a dumb tone, and he muttered a few words with sweat pouring down his forehead. She's one of the twelve heavenly masters. What is that? It's the collective name for the top twelve strongest riders on the continent, including Yudosan from my home country of Alicia and the strongest mercenary, Sword Saint Veft. It seemed they were very famous and Amina explained it to me right away. What do you say? I can change it to all of you now. She said this with a relaxed expression on her face, and I flatly replied, Keep it that way. Let's play two against two. When Lina Carlo heard this, she looked surprised. Have you been listening to me? I am the Thunder Emperor Lina Carlo, one of the twelve heavenly masters. I don't care if you're strong or famous. I don't want to play a game where a bunch of people are ganging up on one person. If we're going to fight, let's do it on even terms. You're a funny guy. I like you. I'll ask your name. I'm Yuta. Yuta, I'll remember that name. Miss Lina Carlo, you don't have to remember the names of those lowlifes. Arthur, shut your mouth. Afterwards, after a lot of drinking and eating, Lina Carlo and Arthur said they were going back to their own ride carriers and left. Ah, uh, they made us pay for the food here. I'll be waiting for her tomorrow. I didn't notice that she left so brazenly. Well, I'll meet her tomorrow. So why don't you bill her then? If we lose the fight, they're going to bury the hatchet. Yuta, you better win tomorrow. What? I'm supposed to fight? Unfortunately, the only one who has a chance against Lina Carlo is Yuta. So I think Yuta should fight her too. Amina, who was listening to the conversation, asked in surprise. Wait a minute, isn't Nanami the strongest member of the Iron Knights? Yuta is stronger than Nanami, he even beat Nanami, he's probably the strongest of the bunch. Sure, I've beaten Nanami in mock battles, but I don't know what would happen if we fought for real. Lydia value 2 Yuta is the strongest, this is getting more and more confusing. You're an idiot, no one believes Yuta's Lydia value is 2. Yes, I too believe that it definitely has at least as much Lydia value as a triple Highlander. Jean and Alana still seemed to be suspicious of my Lydia value. I was actually planning on going to measure Yuta's Lydia value tomorrow, but you accepted a strange match. Apparently, according to Jean's schedule, tomorrow was the day to measure my Lydia value. Well, I'm not interested, so I don't really care. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C62, Duel in the Canyon. C62, Duel in the Canyon. King Pen is back with another four sponsored chapters. Thank you for the support. The location of the fight with Lina Carlo was in a canyon some distance from the city. Even if we fought a little harder here, it would not be a nuisance. Oh, I'm impressed you didn't just run away. Of course. 
you're going to pay for the food and drinks yesterday. It seems that the cost of food and drink is more important to Jean. Ha, huh, fine, I'll pay if you beat me. When Lina Carlos said this with a relaxed expression, Alana pointed out bluntly. It's a sure thing. We're going to win today's game and make yesterday's food and drink bill disappear. I'm concerned about the fact that we're talking about paying for food and drinks. But a fight is a fight. Let's be serious. It was going to be a two-on-two -two fight, with Lina Carlo and Arthur on the other side, and me and Nanami on this side. When Lina Carlo and Arthur appeared in their magic rafts, Pharma was impressed. It's the magic raft sent here, and the magic raft Odin. I'm happy to see two very rare magic rafts at the same time. Arthur's magic raft had a slightly unusual appearance, with a lower body shaped like a horse similar to the imaginary race of centaurs that appear in fantasy games. His weapon is a long, thick spear, like those held by medieval knights is held in his right hand and in the left hand he has a small shield. Lina Carlo's magic raft has a solid body shape with black and yellow coloring, and although it doesn't look like it moves very fast, it does look powerful. Her weapon, however, is a cane-like object with a long stick decorated with a large jewel on the end and I can't imagine how it would be used. What do you want, two against two at the same time, or one against one in order? I don't want to make a mess, so let's fight one on one in order. Okay, then Arthur will be the first one to go. Nanami, you want to go first? Yeah, Nanami's got it. So the first battle was a one on one between Nanami and Arthur. All right, then, I'll be the referee, and when I give the signal the battle will begin. Jean calls out over the ride carrier's external output sound device. After some distance, Nanami's Vajra and Arthur's Centaur stared at each other, in silence, and then Jean's call to begin sounded. Start! The first to move was Arthur's Centaur, who rushed towards Nanami's Vajra. What was surprising was his speed. His horse-like appearance was no mean feat, and he approached Nanami at once. His speed was then she had imagined and Nanami had to use her shield to block him. Sentir's spear and Nanami's shield collided violently, and Nanami's vidra was blown backwards by the tremendous power of the spear with the added force of the charge. Yikes! Nanami! Nanami! Be careful! Sentir ramming force is powerful enough to deal a fatal blow to a triple highlander, Pharma tells her in a loud voice. Well, you did a better job than I expected of blocking Arthur's Sentir's thrust. I wonder if you're as powerful as a triple highlander. Lina Carlo spoke over the external output sound of her magic raft. Before Vidra could stand up, Centaur spun around to get some distance again. And when he was within a certain distance, he accelerated and executed a second lunge towards Vidra. However, perhaps it was her innate sense, but the same attack did not work on Naomi twice. She dodged the charge by the slimmest of margins and spun around to cut off one of Centaur's legs with her sword. What? After one of his front legs was cut off, Centaur lost his balance, and slumped forward. How did you know that Centaur's weakness was his legs? With the loss of one of his legs, Centaur can no longer charge. Centaur managed to get up, but he could barely keep his balance. Vidra approached Centaur and cut off his remaining front leg. Centaur lost both his legs and was unable to stand up. So the fight ended there. Nanami wins, Jean declared and the first round ended. How dare you, Arthur, think that you can be my knight in shining armor? I'm sorry, Miss Lina Carlo. Well, that's okay. I was planning on fighting alone from the start, so no problem. Looking at the current battle, Lina Carlo's voice didn't sound anxious or upset. The fact that she didn't even waver against the triple highlander Nanami was eerie. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-63, Lightning Strike, C-63, Lightning Strike. Arthur and Nanami's fight was over, so Nanami continued to fight with Lina Carlo. I'll have it done in no time. Let's get started. She said she'd get it done in no time. Nanami, be careful, she's strong. I know, you're strong enough to deserve respect, but I'm going to show you that there are some things in this world that can't be overcome with a little strength. As in the earlier battle, Nanami and Lina Carlo glanced at each other a little, and then Jean called out for the battle to begin. Start! Unlike earlier, Nanami moved forward with her, shield in front of her, ready for Lina Carlo's attack, which began at the same time as the start signal. Nanami, be careful! 
There's a rumor that Lina Carlos Odin has an unidentified long-range attack, Alana advises her. What does unidentified mean? I thought so, but I soon saw it. Just as I thought Odin had pointed his staff at Nanami's Vidra, there was a powerful flash of light and Nanami's shield was blown away. The arm that held the shield was also torn to shreds, and Vidra had been severely damaged by the blow. I couldn't see anything. Nanami was puzzled, but did not give up on the game. She lowered her stance and approached Lina Carlos Odin. A flash of something struck Nanami, but she avoided it by a paper-thin margin. Then Odin was within Vidra's attack range, and Nanami tried to pierce its head with her sword. Odin grabbed Vidra's right arm, which was holding the sword. It's been a long time since anyone got this close to me. You're strong enough, you should be proud of yourself. The moment Lina Carlo said this, a dazzling flash of light shone, and Vidra's head had been blown off. As it was, Vidra slowly collapsed to his knees. The winner is Lina Carlo. Ah, oh, what a way to break it. It's going to be hard to fix. Liza blurted out. But I'm more surprised by the outcome of the match. Triple Highlander Nanami lost so one-sidedly. Well, now it's your turn, Yuda, since you've made me learn your name. Let me have a little fun with you. Okay, let's do it. I don't know how far I can go, but I'll give it my all. Yuda, how are you going to prevent Odin from attacking like that? Alana asked me, but I didn't know what to do either. Then I looked over and saw the shield that Nanami's Vajra was equipped with. The shield was blown off, but looking at it, the shield itself was not damaged. If I hold the shield tightly, I can block that attack. Nanami, may I borrow Vajra's shield and sword? Yeah, sure. Take care of Nanami's enemies. I'm on it. I replied lightly to Nanami and equipped myself with Vajra's shield and sword. How long do you think that'll hold? No, I'm going to win. If you beat me, you're strong enough to be one of the twelve heavenly masters. I don't know how great that is. I just heard the term. Twelve heavenly masters. Yesterday, your ignorance is nothing to brag about. Then you can taste the power of the twelve heavenly masters for yourself now. As she said this, Lina Carlo naturally kept her distance. I guess she's not so good at close combat. Okay, so it's the final round, and whoever wins this one wins the game. So don't complain, Jean reminded her. Start! As soon as the signal was given, I quickly set up my shield in preparation for Odin's long-range attack. For a moment, I saw Lina Carlo's face, which I shouldn't have been able to see. She was smiling weirdly. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C64 Full Force Mode C64 Full Force Mode I waited for Lina Carlo to make her move. Odin's staff was pointed at me and I strengthened my grip on the shield. I thought during the battle with Nanami, Odin's attacks seemed to have a slight time lag between them, so once I block the first attack, I can approach her and set the pace of the fight. Zoom! The mysterious sound that I heard in the battle with Nanami rang out. Instantly, I felt a strong impact on the hand holding the shield. Damn it! It was quite a shock, but I think I managed to block it. I was about to sprint towards her before the next blow came. Oh dear, I'm sorry you thought I couldn't attack you in rapid succession. Reacting to Lina Carlo's words, I quickly readied my shield again. Instantly, an incomparably strong impact struck Arleo. Ack. Incredibly, the shield I was holding was blown to pieces. When I looked at Odin, the staff in his hand was still pointing in my direction. I felt that I was in trouble and immediately took evasive action by rolling forward to the right. Thud. There was a cracking sound like a thunderbolt, and the ground in my location was gouged out. It was a very powerful attack, and I couldn't predict what would happen to even the sturdy Arleo if he took a direct hit. There was no shield to block the attack, so I had to avoid the attack by looking in the direction of Odin's staff and anticipating the attack. I looked at it, and for some reason the cane was pointing down. I think I can get close to her now. I took my chance and started running. However, it seems that it was a trap. Suddenly, a buzzing sound like static electricity began to rumble around him, and then there was a crunching sound like a thunderbolt, which impacted Arleo. GGH, what's with the lightning attack that just struck the entire surrounding area? It's really amazing that you can withstand Tempest. It's impossible to avoid Tempest, which is a ranged attack that hits a wide area. I can't wait to see how many shots you can take.
Ranged attack, that's a foul play. I hear the same crackling sound as before, like static electricity around me. It seems that it's not a lie that it's a ranged attack. And if I look closely I can see small lightning bolts all around me. Then there was a crunching sound like a thunderbolt. And I was shocked. Damn, no, I'm gonna get hit if I don't. What am I supposed to do? Yuta, you forgot to concentrate your Lydia. I huffed at the sound of Alana's voice. That's right, I hadn't had a chance to fight any strong enemies lately, so I forgot. Wait, you're lying, you endured Tempest without even concentrating your Lydia? Linicarlo was more than a little surprised by Alana's words. I won't let you concentrate your Lydia now. I can't even avoid her attack. This is why I put my left hand out in front of me and caught Linicarlo's attack with my hand. A strong discharge of electricity overlapped, and Arleo's left hand was blown off. Yuta, I've lost my left hand and I'm in a desperate situation. But with this blow, something has changed in me. I've lost the thread of tension, or rather, I've entered a strange state of relaxation, and that state led me into a state of concentration. There's a pale aura around Arleo. Looks like Yuta's entered a concentration state. Alana replied to Amina's words. What is that pale aura? Linicarlo seemed surprised to see this scene. I'm slowly approaching Linicarlo. There's no point in trying to deceive me with your strange tricks. Then she pointed her staff at me and fired an attack. I avoided it by a thin margin. As I continued to dodge the attacks, Linicarlo pointed her staff downward, ready for a ranged attack. The tempest is unavoidable. She certainly thought it was impossible to avoid but my senses told me that I didn't need to avoid it. The sound of a thunderbolt was heard then she attacked. However, when the attack touched Arleo's pale aura, it was repelled with a sizzling sound. No way! I can't believe you just repelled Tempest. Because it is a ranged attack, Tempest's attack power is scattered and weak. That's why it doesn't seem to work against Arleo, who is in a state of Lydia concentration right now. Triple lightning then! Then Linicarlo pointed her staff at me. I held up my magic bullet and released it just as Linicarlo released her lightning bolt. The magic bullet scattered the oncoming thunderbolts and blew away Odin's right shoulder. Ah, I approached Odin, who had lost his balance, and swung my sword at him, sending his head flying. It's over! Yuta wins! Jean declared as he saw that Odin was out of action. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C65, new client. C65, new client. Please don't add more. Work by destroying not only Vidra, but also Arleo like that. Liza tells me in a sincerely disgusted tone. That's the man I'm in love with. He really defeated the Thunder Emperor. Alana praised me. Hey, who are you really? You're dealing with one of the twelve heavenly masters. What's with that last attack? It doesn't make any sense. Amina asks me this as she shakes me. But I don't know how to explain it, so I just have to keep quiet and let her shake me. Linicarlo got off the magic raft and approached us. I thought she would be depressed because she lost, but... It's quite a feat to draw against me. What? I won the fight. What are you talking about? I was still able to fight, but your buddy just stopped the fight on his own. That's invalid. So this fight is a draw. Yes, it's funny that the judge is one of the parties in the first place. You lowlifes. Arthur agrees with Lina Carlo. You should have told me that first. But, a draw against me is a great thing, and in recognition of that result, I'm going to hire you. What do you mean? Hire. You're mercenaries, right? That's why I'm saying I'll hire you. Wait a minute, don't decide on your own. Do you even have the money to hire us in the first place? Gene pointed out that he thought it was contradictory that someone who didn't want to pay for food and drinks would hire mercenaries. Hmm, you don't seem to know that I have another identity other than the Thunder Emperor Linicarlo. Before Linicarlo could tell us who she was, Alana started to explain first. As the third princess of the Kingdom of Meltaria, she is the commander of the Meltarian army and the Magicraft unit. In the war with the neighboring Drakia Empire, it is said that the number of enemy Magicrafts that have been destroyed is in the hundreds, and the neighboring countries fear her as the god of destruction. As a female writer, I know a little about her. Oh, you're very knowledgeable. But that's not the latest information. I'm no longer the commander of the Magicraft unit. You're not a commander, and you're hiring us. 
I'm hiring you as the third princess, and as royalty, at least I have the money to pay you. Hmph, yeah, but we're more expensive than most mercenaries. Probably because he missed out on making money in Kirk's. Jean seems to be blowing it with Lina Carlo. I've seen what you can do, and I understand that you need to be paid a lot of money. 300 million, for a three-month contract is a good price. Hmm, sorry, but that still won't move us. Then I'll pay you 500 million. You can't complain about this amount. You're a pretty good negotiator, princess. I can't believe you raised your offer so much in one shot and left no room for negotiation. What do you think, Yuda? I think it's not a bad price. If the amount is reasonable, I see no reason to refuse. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a bad deal. We'll take it. I saved myself the trouble of looking for a client, so I'm happy with the result. But princess, how dare you, a royal, be so stingy with the cost of food and drinks? In response to Jean's question, Arthur excitedly explained. We originally came to the city in search of mercenaries, but Miss Lina Carlo gambled away all the money we brought. No, I don't think it's a reason to be proud of. Don't worry, you'll have the money when I get back home. I'll pay for your food and drinks. In response, Amina voiced her doubts. I'm more interested in the reason why Princess Lina Carlo, who is so strong, needs mercenaries. It's true that if you're that strong, you don't need to hire mercenaries. I'll tell you more about it later. It's not something I want to ramble on about here. Thus, the next job of the Iron Knights was decided. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-66 Alliance Negotiations Slash Magisa C-66 Alliance Negotiations Slash Magisa The royal capital of the Emu Kingdom, Rurbul, we came to this country to form an alliance with the Emu Kingdom. I'll talk to King Ama first, and you wait here father. But Renel, if I, the king, don't go, there can be no negotiation. What if father offends King Ima by suddenly visiting him? I'll go settle things first, and then you can negotiate in earnest. Mm, well then I guess I'll let you do that. Although it seemed a little unclear, the king, who trusted his daughter, listened to Renel's words honestly. As an official envoy of the Union of Eastern Nations, King Ima did not refuse to meet with her. The visit went smoothly and she was promised a meeting, but for some reason I had to be present at the meeting. I can understand why Delphine would be present as an escort, but I don't understand why I would be there. King Emu is waiting for you in the audience chamber. Please come with me. One of the guards led us to the audience chamber. You must be Princess Renelle. It's been a long time since we've met, though the last time I saw you, you were such a small child you wouldn't remember me. King Emu called out to her as soon as she entered the audience chamber. Renelle didn't seem to remember, and she faked it with a bitter smile. My mother has told me that King Emu has been a great help to us. Ruri had told you that story. Well, sit down and let's talk. He seems like a very friendly and nice person. I wonder how the king could have fallen out with such a nice person. King Emu has a very kind smile. It's like... No, now is not the time to think about that. How long has it been since Ruri had died? Five years. She was a truly beautiful and wonderful person. Oh yeah, Renelle's mom passed away. Sure, she was mentioned in passing, but I never saw her. So, King Emu, let's get down to business. Oh right, you're visiting as ambassadors for the Union of Eastern Nations, aren't you? Yes. In fact, the relationship between the Union of Eastern Nations and the Ruja Empire is deteriorating. In order to restrain the Ruja Empire, we want to establish an alliance with the Emu Kingdom. I see. Is there any chance you'll think about it? An alliance with the Union of Eastern Nations is 100% unlikely. That much I can tell you, 100%. How can that be? It's simple. I don't trust the Union of Eastern Nations as an organization. However, the kingdom of Emu is hostile to the Ruja Empire, and if there is a mutual interest, being allied with someone you don't trust is detrimental, even if they are your enemy's enemy. Why is it so hard to trust them? Princess Renelle, you already know that some countries have left the Union of Eastern Nations, don't you? Yes, four countries have left. Do you know why? It was a plot of the Ruja Empire. That's true. But how much damage can the Ruja Empire do in such a short period of time? So, what do you mean by that? 
It's impossible to do that without having collaborators within the Union of Eastern Nations. I'm sure those collaborators are still working to break it apart. No way. Are you saying it's impossible that the Union of Eastern Nations was so solid that it could be trusted? Renell's face changes, as if she has an idea. You see, there can be no such thing as an alliance with such an organization, because there are no advantages, only disadvantages. Renell couldn't say anything more. I'm sure it's a very good motive. But I don't like the look on King Ama's face when he talked about the Union of Eastern Nations. He had such a kind smile on his face. I couldn't help but feel a little nervous. Then why not form an alliance with the Kingdom of Amuria? You're suddenly saying that Ima and Amuria should form an alliance? I'm sorry, but that's not possible. The countries are too different in size. But Amuria is a trustworthy country, and you know that better than anyone. Hey, Nagisa, what are you talking about? Renel still at me, but I didn't stop speaking. Renel's mother? No. King Ima had a very kind expression on his face when he was talking about Ruriha. That's the kind look you get when you're thinking of someone you love. How can you not trust a country that had a loved one, and a daughter of a loved one? Nagisa, you're being rude to King Ima. Apologize. Ignoring Renel's words, I continued to say more. But why am I so angry? What about you, King Ima? Is what I'm saying wrong? I wonder why women are so good at seeing through the essence of things. Indeed, I loved Ruriha. She is still the most important woman in my life. Ruriha's daughter in Ruriha's country? Surely I can trust her. Fine, I'll make an alliance with Amuria. That idiot Majni is here with you, right? You can call him here so we can formalize our alliance. Renel was surprised when she heard those words. I didn't expect it to work out this way either, so I was lost in thought for a while. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-67, to the Meltaria Kingdom. C-67, to the Meltaria Kingdom. There are three sponsored CH in the queue that will be released later today. I was too busy yesterday to tell them. This CH was fled at 2 a.m. and couldn't do more. I scheduled my releases at 8 a.m. my time zone for those who don't know. We were headed to the Kingdom of Meltaria, Lina Carlo's home country and we were about to board a ride carrier to get there. Wait a minute, your ride carriers are the editor type, right? Lina Carlo's question, which I didn't quite understand, was answered by Alana, the original owner of the ride carrier. Yes, it's an editor type, second generation. Then it can be connected to my ride carrier. Yes, it might be possible, but I think we'll have to move them separately. There's only two of us here, and it's hard to maneuver, so I'm sorry but I'm going to have to hook you up. It seems that the same type of ride carriers can be connected to each other, and Lina Carlo is trying to make it easier for her to maneuver. And while you're at it, may I also ask you to repair my magic raft? Liza, can you do it? Ugh, you want me to repair four magic rafts by myself? Yeah, I'm sorry, but you're the only mechanic, so I can't do it. Oh, that's too bad, you'll have to pay for the repair separately. Hey, Liza, let's give it our best shot. Jean said blackly when he heard that the repair cost was extra. I'll take the bonus. And with the increase in the number of magic rafts, it's going to be hard for you to work alone. So think about getting some mechanics to help you. You're right. I feel sorry for Liza in this situation. So we'll have to find another mechanic. When I expressed my opinion, Liza looked at me seriously and said, I'd be most happy if you'd stay away from Lady Alana. She blushed a little and shouted at me, Take it easy, I was so careful, what's wrong with you? Then, without question, Lina Carlo connected the ride carriers and started relaxing in our ride carrier as if it were her home. Why are you lounging around here, you stupid princess? The relentless Jean complained straightforwardly even to the princess. It's boring because there's nothing over there. Lowlife you should be grateful that the beautiful lady Lina Carlo is relaxing with you. I could eat three bowls of rice with the sight of Lady Lina Carlo relaxing. Hey Arthur, don't say that because it's perverted. Arthur was a little depressed when Lina Carlo warned him with a serious face. I'm guessing, by any chance, you're not trying to steal my food, right? Oh, I'm not that shallow. Well, you can invite me to dinner if you insist. You're a client, so I'll at least feed you. 
but it wouldn't hurt to show a little gratitude or something. For what it's worth, Jean is kind, and he's going to make sure she eats dinner. I'm sure you'll be grateful, though you won't say it. I don't know what you mean. I imagine that Lina Carlo has been gambling all her money away and hasn't been eating properly, but her appetite is really good. She gobbled up Jean's food with relish. Here's another one for you, sister. Oh, thank you, I'll take it. Nanami was so concerned that she shared her portion with Lina Carlo. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about the job, Lina Carlo, since the last job wasn't a very good one. I naturally asked this in the course of our dinner conversation. Yes, that's fine. But if you asked me, it's still no deal breaker. You're worried about that. We'll honor the contract once it's made. Jean replied without a pause. Then I will tell you, I am ashamed to say, that the situation in the kingdom of Meltaria is currently unstable. What, is there a civil war going on? No, the king is in a critical condition. He doesn't have much time left. The king is Lina Carlo's father, right? Yes, father is dying, so there's a lot of confusion about the succession. Lina Carlo looked very sad. I knew it was hard to see her father in such a state. Wait a minute, you didn't hire us to fight your own war for power, did you? Alana asked back in surprise. No, I'm the third princess, ninth in line to the throne in the male-dominated Meltaria, and I'm not aiming for the throne despite my status. Why don't you? If this continues, the first prince, Mushim, will become king. Why shouldn't the first prince be king? I don't mean to speak ill of my brother, but he's a scum. No, he's an outcast with no humanity. If he becomes king, Meltaria will be ruined. I think Lina Carlo is mostly right, but such a strong condemnation of her brother is. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-68, The Royal Palace Conspiracies. C-68, The Royal Palace Conspiracies. After three days of travel, we arrived at the royal capital of the Maltaria Kingdom. We parked the ride carrier in a vacant lot near the royal palace, and we headed for the palace on foot. In the meantime, Yuda, Jean, and Alana, please come with me so that I can introduce you to the people in the palace. What do we really need to make them aware of that? We can't have unknown persons wandering around the palace. That's true, so Lina Carlo took us to a certain room in the royal palace. There's a meeting going on right now with all the major players to discuss the throne, so we should head there. No, I don't think a mercenary is allowed to show up at a meeting like that. I told Lina Carlo that because I felt it was out of place. I don't care, most of the people there are my enemies, so I don't need to worry about them. We care. As expected, the people in the room reacted in a blatantly unpleasant manner. What's with those filthy people? Who gave you permission to enter the sacred roundtable conference room? An old man with the appearance of a raccoon and the look of an evil officer shouted at us. It's me, Prime Minister Brown. Hmm, Princess Lina Carlo. I'm troubled that you would bring such lowly people to this place. Who are they? I've hired these mercenaries, and they're important guests, so please don't be rude. Lina Carlo's words were not responded to by the person called Prime Minister Brown, but by a young man nearby. Mercenaries? Bullshit! Lina Carlo! Are you going to ignore the previous rule that forbids the heirs to the throne from seizing control of the army to prevent civil war? Oh, Brother Bildello, they are indeed mercenaries. But I only hired them to talk to me, and the proof is that there are less than ten of them. Or are you so weak-minded as to fear that a single-digit mercenary is an army? Less than ten, even if it is. Bodello words were interrupted by the figure behind him. Why not, Bodello? It's just a joke from my little sister. Let's cut her some slack. But brother Mushim. Oh, so this is the first prince of Mushim that Lina Carlo was talking crap about. I'm not sure what a mercenary group of less than a dozen people can do. Scum is scum after all. We have an army of 2,000 magicrafts. Oh, Brother Bildello, I thought it was forbidden for the heir to the throne to seize control of the army. What do you mean by an army of 2,000 magicrafts? Nah, it's nothing. I just misspoke. Oh, really? It's a good thing, then, that the current commander of the magic machine unit crews is not someone under Brother Mushim and he controls of the magic raft unit behind the scenes, is it? I see. It seems that the reason why Lina Carlo was forced to resign as the commander of the magic machine unit has something to do with this area of the story. 
Well, Lina Carlo, if you're going to go that far, you must at least have some proof. Lina Carlo! You! The other party is trembling with anger, and is about to grab. Lina Carlo so I unconsciously went in front of her to protect her. Get out of my way, mercenary, or I'll kill you. I'm not interested in sibling rivalry. But I don't want to see a man assault a woman. Ho ho, don't think a mercenary like you can be a shield. When Mushim and Bildello grabbed their swords and looked like they were about to pull them out, a young man sitting at a table in the back of the room stopped them with a loud voice. Please stop that. This is the sacred round table. The two princes seem unable to ignore the man's words, and their movements come to a halt. Humph, we certainly can have the blood of the lowly staining this place. With that, the two men put their swords away. Linicarlo did not swear at the young man, but obeyed him and took a seat at the round table in a quiet manner. Who is this person that the two princes and princesses can't ignore his words? I know he's one of Linicarlo's relatives, but who is he? Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-69, The Crown Prince. C-69, The Crown Prince. Today's sponsors are Squish with three chapters and KO's Sturms with one chapter. Thank you for the support. How long are those mercenaries going to stay here? We stood behind Lina Carlo and watched the meeting from the sidelines and lost track of when to leave the room. I hope you don't mind that he's my escort as well. Apparently Lina Carlo wanted us to see this meeting, or so she said and maintained this situation. Humph, accompanying royal guards are allowed under all circumstances, but I hope they're at least knights or regular soldiers. It seems that the presence of royal guards is pretty much guaranteed, and even we mercenaries were allowed to be here. I will now proceed with the topic of this discussion, the succession of the throne. When Prime Minister Brahm said those words, Lina Carlo immediately spoke up. I don't know if we need to discuss the succession to the throne, the crown prince has already been named. I think it's best if crown prince Yudin takes over the throne. Humph. No matter whether it was Yudin who was nominated by Father King, he said it in a daze on his sickbed, it's impossible that Father King really meant it. Why is it impossible? I am the first prince. How can I not be named the crown prince? I don't understand why Yudin, the third prince who can't do anything, would be nominated. I think it's just that our father had a good eye for people. What the hell, Lina Carlo? Are you implying that I'm inferior to Yudin? You can take it that way. You can't be so sure just because you have a slightly higher, Lydia value. To stop the siblings from arguing, Prime Minister Brum suggested. How about this, then, the crown prince or the first prince succession to the throne will be decided by voting. Lina Carlo reacted strongly to Prime Minister Brum's words. I disagree. The will of the king is absolute. The crown prince should be the king. I say the will of the king is questionable. I vote yes on the voting resolution. Mushum wants to be king so badly that he agrees to the idea himself. I agree with you. It is Mushum who is fit to be king. Bildello followed Mushum and argued in favor. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, then, let those of us gathered here vote on the pros and cons of the resolution to vote for the throne. When Prime Minister Brahm said this, most of the people present raised their hands. It has been decided that the succession to the throne will be decided by vote. Lina Carlo looked very grim, but said nothing more. It was decided that the voting resolution would take place in ten days and that the voting would be carried out by the five dukes and the four adult members of the royal family, excluding the parties concerned. It's all going as I expected. If this continues, Mushum will become king. But according to what you just said, it will be decided by a vote. I don't think it means that Mushum will definitely be the king. You're an idiot, Yuda. Votes for the country's top officials are usually decided before they're even held because there's already some sort of faction. Jean is right. Of the four royals who are entitled to vote, the second prince, Bildello, and the second princess, Linda, will definitely vote for Mushum, since they are at Mushum's beck and call. And of the five dukes Brahm, the vizier, and Duke Karen, Mushum's father-in-law will vote for him as well. The Duke of Holomel, who has business interests with Mushum, is also expected to vote for Mushum. That's five votes. I guess he already won. I think the other side knew that so they made sure it would be that kind of vote. Jean's words seemed to be what Lina Carlo and Alana were thinking as well, and the air in the room dulled. You must have an idea, Lina Carlo. 
Lina Carlo answered Alana's question with a blank look on her face. Honestly, at this point, the only people who are certain to vote for Crown Prince Yudin are I and First Princess Rhyderia. However, the two dukes, Duke Laidmart and Duke Baralma, do not think well of Mushim, and if persuaded, they should vote for Yudin. That's still one vote short. Yes, so we really need to take one of their votes away from them. Are you trying to convince the second princess, or the second prince? No, those two are just like the Mushim. They are scum who think that everyone but royalty is insects, and the people are slaves. They think that if Mushim becomes king, they will be able to do whatever they want, and they will not turn to us. That would make it one of the three dukes. The Duke of Karen, Mushim's father-in-law, is out of the question, and Prime Minister Brown who has been his educator since he was a child and considers Mushim like his own son, is also not going to turn to us, so the target is, I see, greed for greed. Alana said, as if she understood the whole story so far. Yes, the Duke of Holomel, with whom he only has a business interest, would turn to us if we offered him more beneficial terms. I know what you're talking about, but what exactly are we, the Iron Knights, going to do? I'm starting to get worried because I feel like I'm getting caught in the royal family turmoil. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-70, Royal Duties. C-70, Royal Duties. In the meantime, I'll give you 100 million in advance for the commission, plus the unpaid food and beverage bills and the cost of repairing the magic raft. Lina Carlo handed Jean a large bag of money as she said this. Oh, it's very good of you to pay up, Lina Carlo. Of course I do. I'm a woman of my word. Sister, can you introduce me to them? The young man who brought the money Lina Carlo gave Jean asked, tugging on Lina Carlo's clothes. As I recall, he was the one who stopped the two princes at the meeting. Ah, yes, these are the Iron Knights mercenaries Yuda, Jean and Alana, and this is my lovely brother, the Crown Prince, Yudin. Stop talking like that, sister. It's embarrassing. Why are you embarrassed? It's the truth. I was just wondering. This money that Yudin brought, could it be Lina Carlo's money? Yes, my sister told me to prepare that for you. Hey Lina Carlo, you don't have any money, do you? No, it's just that I didn't happen to have any, so I had Yudin pay for me. You can't just come home and not have any money. Tell me the truth, you don't have any money. It's true, I don't have any right now, but don't worry, I'll have my royal allowance for the next term soon. I hope our fee is safe. It's not like you can't pay us because Mushim becomes king. Gentlemen, let me talk to you about it. Actually, there is a reason why my sister doesn't have any money. My sister personally pays the bereaved families of the soldiers who died in the war every year, so she is always short of money. I'm surprised that Lina Carlo has a side like that. Yes, Lina Carlo, why are you doing that? It's a matter of principle. It's not right that people should be forced to fight for the convenience of the royal family and die in the process. But we should at least take care of the families left. Behind. It's the least we can do. I think I may have misunderstood her a bit. At least I got the feeling that she cared about human life. That's right, low lives. Master Lina Carlo didn't gamble away her savings for personal gain. She only took a chance because she was in need of money to hire mercenaries and support the bereaved families. I don't know why it annoys me when Arthur says it like that. I'll believe it when I see it. But whatever you do, make sure you pay us. Well, leaving the money aside, we need to figure out a strategy for the future. Alana put the derailed conversation back on the right track. Well, if we're going to bring the Duke of Holomel on our side, what exactly are we going to do? I have an idea. I hear that the Duke Holomel's territory is currently experiencing massive economic losses due to a large number of brigands running amok. The amount is 30 billion gold. So how about getting his vote in exchange for solving the problem? I see, we don't have the money to buy him off, but we can do something about that. Yes, so I'll leave it to the Iron Knights to take down the thieves. What? We're going to defeat the thieves on our own? Yes, I have to persuade the two dukes at the royal palace, and if I go to Duke Hormel's territory at this time, they might be suspicious. I'm sure you're right, but how powerful are the thieves? It seems that the thieves are mainly the remnants of Stilgar, which was destroyed by the Meltaria in recent years, so they are quite tough. It seems that Duke Holomel's private army is no match for them, so you must be on your guard. Humph, work for what you're paid, you lowlifes. 
Go beat the bastards. What are you talking about, Arthur? You're going too. No. I don't understand. I don't think it's fair for them to be on their own in a strange land. So you're going to help them. That's, he he he, it's good to have you, Arthur Chan. Arthur hung his head in disgust as Jean held him by the shoulders. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-71 Red Square. C-71 Red Square. I was getting ready to head to Duke Holomel's estate when I noticed a large crowd of people in the square near the royal palace. I was curious, so I asked Lina Carlo about it. What are they doing, Lina Carlo? I don't want to explain too much, but it's a public trial. Why don't you want to explain the trial? Because a trial is a public execution in all but name, one of the shames of our country, a vice that will be absolutely abolished when Yudin becomes king. Public executions. There's a charge written down over there. I think you'll understand a little better if you read it. As Lina Carlo said this, Jean read out the charges. What is this? These men are to be executed for spreading bad news about the first Prince Musham. Anyone who disagrees must prove it with a valid argument. I don't get it. What does prove it with a valid argument means? In the past, we had to prove it with arguments. But now we have to prove it with things. The Magicraft was standing in front of Lina Carlo's gaze. Hey, do you want me to fight with a Magicraft and win? That's what I'm saying. Most of the people who are stuck there are people who can't even ride a magic raft. That's not a trial by any means. The reasons and everything are absurd. Is it only the person accused of the crime who is allowed to fight with the magic raft? No, you're allowed to represent the accused as a defense attorney. If that's the case, why doesn't Lina Carlo just go poof and defend them? Since Arthur and I are public figures who are supposed to be impartial, we are forbidden from being trial lawyers. Otherwise we would go right ahead and destroy that executioner's magic raft. There are some weird, fair-minded rules here. So how do I become a defense attorney? Yuda, are you really going to be a defense attorney? All I have to do is defeat that magic raft, right? But if the defense attorney loses, he will be executed for the same crime. It's too bad they're going to execute them just for badmouthing the prince. I'll go defend them. Whether they trusted me or were angry at the unreasonable public execution, Jean and Alana didn't stop me. I walked into the square and approached the enforcer. He had set up a platform in the middle of the square and was shouting to the crowd on it. Hey, is there anyone here to defend them? We're about to have all these people hang. It's okay if you don't have a magic raft. We'll give you one, so don't hesitate to defend them. I did not hesitate to raise my voice. Yes, I'll defend them. When I told the executioner that, the crowd all looked at me at once some with curious expressions, others with pity and concern. You can't be serious. Defending them means you're guilty of the same thing. Crime? What kind of crime have those people hanging there committed? They just told the truth. No. What the hell are you doing? Do you mock Prince Mushim? No one is making fun of Prince Mushim. Or do you think it's true what they say about him? Come on, I'll give you a chance to explain yourself as a defense attorney. You can take the magic raft over here if you want. I don't need it because I have my own. Don't regret it. Prepare the executioner's magic raft. The defense attorney's testimony seemed to be unusual, and the crowd around us began to make noise. It was like a big event, and more and more people were gathering around. Wait a minute! As the executioner was preparing the magic raft, first Prince Mushim appeared from the royal palace and said, well, well, Prince Mushim, what can I do for you? Hey, you're going to fight that defense attorney? Ha! Huh. I may look like this, but I'm a mid-level rider with a Ludia value of 3,800, so rest assured that I won't fall behind those low lives. Ha! Huh. Look closely at who that man is with. The executioner who was told this shakes his head when he sees Lina Carlo next to me. Princess Lina Carlo, do you think that a rider who is allowed to stay by the side of Lina Carlo one of the twelve heavenly masters, can be beaten by a mid-level rider, fool, I'm sorry, oh well, I'll provide the rider to fight that defense attorney, yes sir, hey defense attorney, one question, are you sure you want to take on the defense of all those criminals, yes, I will defend them all, hmm, good, then I'll get you the best executioner I can, as he said this, he rattled off instructions to the person at his side, which seemed to be preparing something for him, Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-72, Objection. C-72, Objection. 
I went back to the ride carrier to get Arleo, and when Nanami saw me getting in she called out to me. Yuda, where are you going with Arleo? I'm going to defend someone. Defend? Yes, innocent people are about to be killed, and we're going to help them. Nanami's coming with you. But it's a proper, official fight, so you'll just have to watch. I want to help innocent people, too. In the end, Nanami invited Pharma to come and observe my defense. Neither of them seemed to have the slightest thought that I was going to lose, and they happily mingled with the crowd and looked at me. The defense was to take place in a large open space near the square, and as I waited there, the magic craft of the executioner who was to be my opponent arrived with Mushim and his group. Wait a minute! Why are there twelve of them? The executioner's magic rafts are lined up in front of me. In front of the magic rafts, the riders who piloted them were also neatly lined up, an intimidating sight, and I protested impatiently. What are you talking about? You said you would defend all the criminals. There are twelve criminals, so there will be twelve executioners. Yes, the logic is right, but why do I have to fight them at the same time? This didn't seem to sit well with Lina Carlo, and she protested. Brother Mushim, your logic is atrocious at best, then we'll have more attorneys. Lina Carlo, do you really think that's acceptable? He already agreed to defend all the guilty. You know the rule of one defense attorney for one criminal, and you can't withdraw your defense once you've accepted it. So what are you going to do? Come on, you can't reason with. Apparently, the rules don't allow me to overrule this situation, and I prepared to fight those twelve magic rafts. Lina Carlo, that's enough. I'll just take out all twelve of them. Yuta, those twelve enforcers are no ordinary riders. They are the elite of the kingdom SS. All of them are above half radar, and those three in the middle are Highlanders. Can Lina Carlo fight all those guys and win? That's right, you're good enough to draw with me. It's true that I can fight all of them and win, then you can do it too. I won't say anything else. Go kick the shit out of all those enforcers. Yes, let's do it then. As I was about to get motivated and board the Arleo, I was approached by the executioner in the center. Yudakun, aren't you Yudakun? Mikej, Mikej Mamoru, it's been a while since I've seen you. I was worried about you because you were bought by some unknown merchant. I didn't recognize him right away because his hair had gotten longer, and he seemed very different from his old self. But it was my classmate, Mikej Mamoru. I'm not very close with Mikej but I was a little happy to see him again after a long time. You were bought by Meltaria? Yes, I'm a member of the Meltaria Kingdom's SS now. But more importantly, are you by any chance the one I'm about to fight? Yeah, I'm the lawyer. It's reckless. There are 12 elite members of the Kingdom SS, and with all due respect, you're no match for them. It's not too late for you to surrender and beg Prince Mushum's forgiveness, and maybe he'll spare your life. I'll even help you with that. Sorry, Mikeage, I'm not going to abandon someone who's about to be killed for a few bad words, and I'm not going to lose. But your Ludia value is, Mikeage, what's the point of having a low Ludia value? Why can't I try to do the right thing? Besides, I'm stronger than you think. Okay, I won't stop you now that you've said that, I'll do my best to fight you. Yeah, I won't cut corners either, so don't make excuses later if you lose. Mikeage walked towards his own magic raft without looking back the second time I've had to fight a classmate. I still don't feel very good about it. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-73, defense completed. C-73, defense completed. I boarded Arleo and confronted the twelve executioners. I am the kingdom's SS, Captain Bill Kia, Lydia value 18,000, and I shall demonstrate by my power the legitimacy of this sentence. Defending Attorney Identify yourself by name and show your intent. I don't know, maybe it's a kind of self-introduction. I had no choice but to say the same thing. I am Yuda of the Iron Knights. I will demonstrate their innocence with my power. What are you talking about? With a Ludia value of two, you can't even move a toy. How can you ride a magic raft? It doesn't matter what they say. But this time there was a guy there who knew my Ludia value. Mikeage followed the captain. Captain, what I'm saying is true, I can assure you, I was there when it was measured. What the hell, Mamoru? If you say so, it must be like that. But a Ludia value of two is. If that's true, what are we going to fight now? It's not even a battle. Ha! Huh? I don't care what the Ludia value is. Take him down. 
Mushum seems to be short-tempered, and he doesn't want to watch such an exchange, so he tells them to start fighting right away. Then let's hear the arguments, counsel. Upon the signal begin your plea. The official in the center of the room was holding a yellow flag, which would probably start the battle when it was waved. The yellow flag was waved and at that moment, the magic rafts of the executioners started to move all at once. I raised my right hand to the captain's magic raft, pointed my magic bullet at it, and fired it at his neck. Who? The captain's magic raft neck was blown off. He fell to his knees and collapsed on the spot. The other enforcer stopped moving, staring at the captain's broken magic raft, as if they couldn't understand what had happened, and I took advantage of the opportunity to accelerate and close the distance to Mikeage's magic raft. Mikeage was also shocked that the captain's magic raft was disabled by a single magic bullet, and he couldn't react quickly enough when I approached. I hit the defenseless Mikeage with the tonfa and the body of the magic raft dented. He collapsed backwards with a thud. After the Mikeage was defeated, the other enforcers finally cooled down and attacked. First, I destroyed the head of the magic raft that attacked me with the sword by poking it with the tonfa. Then I avoided the attack of the enemy who attacked me from behind with a large axe and blew its head off by hitting it while spinning. I hit the leg of an enemy magic raft approaching from the right to stop it from moving, and then I crushed the head of the enemy plane with a knee kick as it gets into a low stance. After twisting my body to avoid the simultaneous attacks of the two magic rafts, I blow off the head of one with my right tonfa as I thrust it up from below like a boxing uppercut and rotate the tonfa in my left hand to deliver a powerful blow to the body of the other. Having defeated the Highlander, which was the main force at first, the remaining enforcers were slowed down by fear and agitation. Normally they would be able to fight a little more, but they feared the enemy and were rushing in without coordination. While moving, I rotate my body and swing my tonfa to destroy more and more enemy magic rafts that come near me. The next thing I knew, there was only one enemy left. The last one has already lost its will to fight and is only slowly falling back, not willing to attack. I think the battle has already been decided, but I thought it would never end if I didn't defeat it, so I gave the neck of the magic machine, which was too scared to do anything, a quick poke with my tonfa to disable it. You idiots! Twelve magic rafts in such a short time, and you're all elite members of the kingdom's SS. To the surprise Prince Mushum, Lina Carlos said proudly. You seem surprised, Brother Musham, but I'm afraid you miscalculated by underestimating him, a rider who could tie with me. I've never heard of such a mercenary other than the sword saint. Why don't you declare the outcome of the trial? The crowd is waiting for it. As Lina Carlos said, the people watching the trial were looking at Musham with great interest. Musham seemed to feel some power in their gaze, and reluctantly said these words. Acknowledging that the defense's argument is valid, I find all those here not guilty. The moment Musham said that, there were loud cheers from the crowd. Some of them were probably the families of the innocents, and I was very happy to be able to help them. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-74, to the Duke of Halamel's domain. C-74, to the Duke of Halamel's domain. I'll take care of it. You'd better do it right. Because if you win over the Duke of Holomel, but I don't get the votes of the other two dukes, we're screwed. I know, I'll take care of that. I won the battle as a defense attorney and headed to the Duke of Holomel's territory with a good feeling. After the battle, Mike had said he was afraid of the punishment for losing. But Lina Carlo told me that even in this country, Highlanders and half raiders are valuable human resources. And no matter how mad Musham is he will not give them a big punishment. I was relieved. We were led to the Duke of Holomel's domain by Arthur, who was very unhappy. Here Arthur your food is ready, don't be so depressed, come and eat with us. I'm good, I have no appetite. You're a completely different person when you're around Lina Carlo. I can't do anything without Master Lina Carlo. just leave me alone. Don't be a baby. Who's this mission for? Is it for us? No, it's for your precious Lina Carlo. Get a grip. Do your job and get Lina Carlo's praise. When Jean grabbed Arthur's collar and shook it, Arthur's eyes changed color as he said enthusiastically. I see, if I complete this mission properly, Master Lina Carlo will praise me. Yes, she's going to make me her personal knight. He's a simple guy.
So, what's the deal with you and Lena Carlo? Bo ha 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 Me and Master Lena Carlo have a strong bond. Arthur replied as he swallowed his food in a panic when Jean suddenly asked him that. No, that's not the point. What's your official position? I'm an apprentice knight, the second son of Count Rick Kramer. Apprentice knight? That means you're half a knight. How rude! I was the top student at the Knight Academy, even though I look like this. And if I entered the civil service, I would have been a knight in no time. How come you're not even a knight yet? It can't be helped, Master Linicarlo doesn't approve. So a soon-to-be knight in shining armor is wandering around with royalty. No! I'm not obsessed with the royal family. I want to be with Master Linicarlo. What's so great about that insane princess? She's just a naive person with a high Lydia value and a lot of pride. Don't you understand that lovely beauty, that purity of heart and modesty? No, I don't. And I'm pretty sure there's no such thing as modesty. Humph, you're a very blind man. I think Lina Carlo is actually a nice and kind girl, even if she is a bit competitive. When I said that, Arthur happily agreed. Yes, Master Lina Carlo is very kind. Sometimes she shares her extra sweets with me. And sometimes she gives me books that she no longer needs. I'm not talking about that kind of kindness. It took us about two days to reach our destination, the Duke of Hormel's domain. By that time, Arthur had become quite familiar with us, and he and Pharma in particular seemed to be on the same page, and they often talked about magicrafts together. I think the strongest magicraft is Yuto's Arleo. I admit that Arleo is a great specimen, but Linicarlo's Odin is no slouch when it comes to attack power. Yes, but in terms of overall strength, he can't beat Arleo. No, Master Linicarlo, it's still the same story about magicrafts. And before we know it, it's all about Master Linicarlo. But I think it's good that Arthur is opening up. What about my Arleo? I've been a little curious about the performance of Arleo for a while now, so I decided to talk to him about it. To be honest, I'm not sure about Yuta's Arleo. As Liza said, if you just look at the specs, it looks like an ordinary magic raft. It's hard to understand how that magic raft could have beaten Master Linicarlo, or even draw with her. What determines the performance of a magic craft in the first place? I'd say it's the Ludia core first, then the elemental line, the inborn, the exoskeleton, well, 90% of the time it's the Ludia core. I don't understand what a Ludia core is. To tell you the truth, no one knows anything about it. It's a mysterious component that we don't know anything about in terms of structure or principle. We just know how to use it. It's like a battery that works even if you don't understand the principle. The parts of the magic rafts other than the Ludia core can be repaired with today's technology. But once the Ludia core is destroyed, it can never be put back together again. So if the Ludia core is destroyed, it means the death of the magic raft. Well, in most cases, the magic raft itself will be disabled before the Ludia core is destroyed. It is true that magic rafts seem to be surprisingly fragile, because just blowing off their heads will cause them to stop working. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-75, in the midst of disappointment slash Yuki. C-75, in the midst of disappointment slash Yuki. This CH was sponsored by Squish and an anonymous supporter. Thank you both for your generosity. I still couldn't accept the fact that Amina was dead. Back in the Imperial capital, I spent many days locked in my room, doing nothing. Iron Knights! I mentioned the name of the mercenary group that I heard from the head of the Beast King mercenary group. I made a report to the army, and there was no information at all, as if they were an unknown mercenary group. It seems that the army, which believes that they have already avenged Amina by destroying the Beast King mercenary group, will not move, but I will never forget. I had made up my mind that I would definitely hunt down the Iron Knights even if I have to do it alone. Mr. Yo came to see me one day and said, Mr. Yuki, His Majesty the Emperor wants to see you. I wondered if he would be angry with me for staying in my room forever. With that worry in mind, I headed for the audience room. Dear Ms. Yuki, you asked for information on a friend of yours who was sold to a slave trader. Mr. Yo talked to me on the way to the audience room. You found Yuta? No, we haven't found him yet, but we're starting to get some leads. Where is he? It seems that your friend, who ran away from the slavers, 
worked for a while on a slave trading ship, then entered a small country called Lutuan, and had some trouble with the Lutuan army. Trouble with the army? I hope he's okay. That's still unknown. We're sending special forces to Lutuan right now to gather information, so please be patient. Oh, Yuda, if you were with me right now, this sad feeling would be healed a little. I wish I had you by my side right now. I heard you've been in a bit of a slump lately with what happened to Amina. Have you calmed down a bit? The emperor doesn't seem to be angry, and he said so gently. To be honest, I can't say I'm back on my feet yet, but I think I've regained some composure. It's not a big task, but I found some interesting information in the old archives. It says that there is a shrine of the legendary great sage deep in the forest of Diabol. I'm thinking of sending a survey team to find out the truth behind it. The legendary great sage. Yes, the great sage Raphishal, who, truth be told, was the first person to build a magic raft. I'm sure you're having bad thoughts when you're stuck in your room. Can you join the survey team? Yes, that would be a good idea. I'll leave the arrangements to Eo and he'll tell you the rest. Thank you for your kindness. With that, I left the audience chamber. Thank you for participating in the search for the great sage's shrine, Miss Yuki. No, it's just a change of pace. Anyway. Have you decided on the members of the survey team yet? Yes, we have three scholars, twelve riders, twenty mechanics, and about fifty guards already in place. It's bigger than I expected. Diable is a scary place with a lot of scary legends, so a small survey team would be too scared to go there. What scary legends? It is said that in the past, it was a place where giant beasts lived, and they ran rampant in herds of thousands or tens of thousands. Giant beasts are said to be extinct now so I don't think there are any that survived. I couldn't imagine what a giant beast would be like, but I figured that with my magic raft, I wouldn't have to fear any enemy. The riders of the survey team consisted of ten Highlanders, two double Highlanders and an elite group. Including me, the force was more than thirteen Highlanders, enough to subdue any small country, according to Yo. Yuki the Triple Highlander, I'm Mary, my home country is the United States and you're from Japan like Yuto. Oh, yes. Well, not just the Japanese people transported in this world. Hey, 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 don't just get along with other Earthlings. I'm Enrique. Nice to meet you, Yuki. Nice to meet you, too. At the meeting of the survey team, the two double Highlanders spoke to me in a friendly manner, but the ten Highlander riders only greeted me stiffly and did not seem to open up to me. There seems to be a huge difference in status between Highlanders and double Highlanders in Alicia. I've heard that there are hundreds of Highlanders compared to only a few dozen double Highlanders, and I wonder if that difference in numbers is what is making them so different. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-76, The Person I Love. C-76, The Person I Love. Chapter 1 of 4 sponsored by Kingpin. Thank you for the support. Today only two fourth chapters will be released, the other two will be released tomorrow. The Duke of Holomel's residence was a gorgeous, opulent mansion. So, Princess Lina Carlo sent you, what can I do for you? The Duke of Holomel had the appearance of a great nobleman. He had a round, fat body, a long beard, and narrow, sharp eyes. He didn't look very friendly, even though he was smiling. I have a secret letter from Princess Lina Carlo. Please take a look at it. Arthur handed over the letter he had received from Lina Carlo. I've heard about the vote on the succession to the throne, but I've never heard of me voting for Yudin in exchange. You'll have to defeat the brigands that are running rampant in my territory. Ha 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 ha. Funny, really funny proposal. The best deal a poor princess with no money could come up with. Arthur looks disgusted by those words. He was about to grab the duke, but Alana caught him by the scruff of the neck and restrained him. Fine, sure, if one vote can wipe out those bastards, it's a win-win. I'll take the offer. As planned, the Duke of Holomel came on board with Lina Carlo's proposal, and now all that was left to do was to defeat the bandits. All right, the fish is on the hook. We just need to pull it out. So let's split up and find out more about the thieves. Me and Yuda, Jean and Amina, Arthur and Farma, Lorgo and Nanami. Hey, why is it Alana and Yuda? Can it be Nanami and Yuta? Yes, Alana, that combination is unbalanced. What kind of informations are Lorgo and Nanami going to obtain? Hey, Jean, you sound like you don't think Nanami and Lorgo can do anything. No, I meant gathering information. I didn't say they couldn't do anything. 
Nanami wasn't the only one who wasn't satisfied with the combination that Alana had come up with, so we decided to be fair and use the lottery to decide. In order to avoid any danger in a strange place, it was decided that Alana, Amina, and Arthur, who had self-defense skills, and Jean, who could avoid danger with his mouth, would be split up and the pair would be decided by lottery. And so it was decided. Alana and Nanami, Amina and me, Arthur and Pharma, Jean and Lorgo. Then we'll meet at this square in the evening. I nodded at Alana's words and we headed off in different directions to gather information. Amina, how are you getting used to being in the Iron Knights? Well, I guess I've gotten used to it. Speaking of which, do you have any hobbies, Amina? Hobbies? You're not interested in my hobbies. You don't have to force me to talk about them. No, it's not that I'm forcing you, but we're friends and we should get to know each other a little better. Yeah, well, you're the leader of the Iron Knights, so it's not surprising that you'd think that. My hobby is shopping. I like to look around for clothes and accessories. Oh, really? Well, let's do a little shopping now, shall we? What are you talking about? We have to gather information about the thieves. Yes, but we can gather information while we shop. Yeah, but I owe you guys a lot of money. Oh, right. Well, if it's not too expensive, I'll buy it for you. Wait, wait, are you trying to get a piece of me or something? You know, well, I think Amina is beautiful, but I have a girl I love. Who is it? Maybe Alana or... No, I like Alana, but that's not the point. Then who is it? Maybe Nanami. I don't think that's a good idea. No, we're separated now. I don't even know where she is. I haven't told her I love her properly, so I don't think she thinks about me. That's right. I'm just a classmate to Yuki Shuryuki. I wonder what would have happened if I had confessed to her on the last day of the school trip. I'm sure you'll be able to find her someday. And then you can confess your feelings to her then. Amina said softly, probably worried that I looked a little sad. Then, feel free to let me shop with your money. Come on, let's go. Amina's expression brightened, but I was a little worried about the contents of my wallet. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-77, a popular person. C-77, a popular person. Hey, I'd like to ask you about the bandits that have been tearing up the area lately. I spoke to the wives who were whispering in small voices around the living well water. But for some reason they didn't answer me and went away in disarray. By the time I got here, I had encountered similar scenes many times and had yet to get any information. It's funny, we're supposed to be having trouble with the bandits, but all the citizens are uncooperative. That reaction makes me think they know something but don't want to talk about it. I guess, as Amina said, they don't want us to find the bandits. On the contrary, I get the vibe that they don't think well of us. Hey, you want to hear about the bandits? The ones who called out to me were a group of three people who looked like they belonged in a bad neighborhood. Yes, but do you have any information? Oh, I'll tell you a good story. I just can't talk about it here. So come with me to that back alley. Yuda, don't you think these guys are a little suspicious? Amina warned in a small voice. Sure, they're suspicious. But if we keep going like this, we're not going to get any information. All right, well, listen to me, but be on your guard. I told Amina that I understood and headed into the back alley with the three of them. When they came to the alleyway, the attitude of the three men suddenly changed. Hey, it looks like you're doing some research on the bandits. Don't do anything unnecessary. All three of them have knives. Does that mean you're acquainted with the bandits or something? Amina, who had quickly stepped in front of me, put her hand on the hilt of the sword at her waist and asked, That doesn't matter. If you don't do what I say, I'll hurt you. The moment the man said that, Amina pulled out her sword and in a split second, she had flicked the three knives away, as expected of an ex-soldier. Damn, how dare you? Just answer the question, are you with the bandits? I'm not a bandit, but I am indebted to them. They share the money and food they take from the lords, and we need them more than the evil lords who torture us with high taxes. Well, it seems that the bandits are sharing the money and food they took with the people, and they seem to be much more popular with the citizens than that evil-looking lord. You can't just take something from someone for any reason, just tell me what you know. With a sword at his throat, the man shakily replies, Oh, we don't know anything because the bandits come without warning, hand out money and food, and then go away. You don't even know where they come from? I don't know. 
Rumor has it that there's a hideout up on Mount Dina. Hey, what the hell are you saying? I don't have a choice. I'm scared of her eyes. Do you have any other information? For example, tell me how many members there are, how many magic rafts they own, and anything else you know. I really don't know anything about this. Give me a break. Amina, they really don't seem to know, so we'll just leave it at that. When I said that, Amina put her sword away. It was almost evening, so we decided to leave the guys alone and head back to the meeting place. Arthur and Pharma were already back at the rendezvous point, so I quickly asked what they found. How did it go, Arthur? Did you get any information? Well, I did a lot of canvassing, but for some reason the people didn't want to talk about the bandits, so I got nothing. We're in the same situation, and we haven't gotten any information, so hopefully Alana or Jean will come back with some informations. As I said this, Alana came back with a sullen look on her face. Alana, how did it go? It doesn't help that the people in this town don't talk at all when it comes to the bandits. In fact, they treat us like we're the bad guys for trying to find them. I guess we are. I suppose we can't expect much from Jean either. Oh, what can't you expect from me? Jean and Lorgo appear. Jean, how'd it go? I've got it all. The location of their hideout, the numbers of the bandits, and even their leader. Both Alana and Amina were surprised by his response. How did you get so much information? When I asked, Jean pointed his thumb at Lorgo and said, I used this guy. Lorgo, what did you do? I was just standing there, cracking my knuckles when Jean told me to. I didn't do anything. I imagine Lorgo silently cracking his knuckles. Those of us who know Lorgo might not think anything of it. But those who don't know him might be terrified of what a big man with the appearance of a bear might do to him. I knew, Jean was going to pull through. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-78, The Bandit's Hideout. C-78, The Bandit's Hideout. Once we got the information, we went back to the ride carrier to discuss our tactics. It seems the leader of the bandits is a man called Lion King. Lion King? Why do they call him that? I asked Jean. They say he always wears a lion mask to hide his face. I can think of several reasons why he hides his face. But I can guess why someone who does something bad would hide his face. What's the reason? Well, it's possible that he has a big scar or burn on his face that he doesn't want people to see. But it's more likely that he doesn't want anyone to know what he looks like. Isn't it normal not to want people to know your face when you're doing something bad? Do you think the average thug has the common sense to not want his face to be known? My guess is that the leader of the bandits is someone famous in this country. Or at least someone that everyone knows if you mention his name. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a huge problem? Yeah, it's a big problem. That's why he's hiding his face. Gene is amazing sometimes. I don't know how you can predict so much with so little information. Gene had even grasped the spots where the bandits would appear and the exact location of their hideout. The cave in the middle of Mount Dina is their hideout. I heard that they have about 30 magic rafts, so you guys should be able to win easily. How could you get that kind of information from people in this town? Alana said to Jean with admiration. They were so scared of Lorgo that they couldn't give me a straight answer. How did you get the information then? Alana asked suspiciously. I've collected a lot of small pieces of information, scrutinized the inconsistencies and uncertainties and turn them into one solid piece of information. Ugh, Jean, tell me something I can understand. The owner of the field told me that he would give me all the fruit from one of the trees, but only one of the four trees would bear good fruit. He wanted me to ask the workers in the field to find out which tree produced the best fruit, but the workers were told not to tell me which tree produced the best fruit. So I decided to ask each of them a small question, one to tell me the height of the good fruit tree one to tell me the color of the leaves of the good fruit tree, and one to tell me the color of the leaves of the good fruit tree. Putting all this information together, I can figure out which is the good fruit tree. That's what I mean. I see, so they're not comfortable spilling out the details, but comfortable with sharing a little information. Alana seemed to understand. Now that we know where they're hiding, it'll be quicker. Let's storm that place and round them up. When I said that, everyone nodded in agreement. M.T. Dina was a few hours away by ride carrier from the town where we had gathered information. Jean would take care of the transportation, and we riders would take a rest in the meantime. We're about to reach Mount Dina. Jean, shouldn't the ride carrier wait around here? Yeah, they're probably already on guard. 
We decided to hide the ride carrier in the forest at the foot of Mount Dina and from there we would advance quietly with the magic rafts. The five of us who were going out were me, Alana, Nanami, Amina, and Arthur, while Lorgo and Farma were to stay behind as escorts for the ride carrier, just in case. Yuda stop. In a canyon about ten minutes from the ride carriage, Alana suddenly said, I panicked and stopped Arleo's steps. What's up, Alana? Look over there. There are magic raft sentries. When I looked closely, I could see the figures of two magic rafts on the cliffs a few hundred meters away. Sentries, should we just get rid of them? No, they'll notice if we're not careful. And it's better if they don't notice us yet if we want to catch them all. I'll do it, wait here. Amina said and approached the sentry's magic rafts with Artemis. With a buzzing sound, Artemis' figure assimilated into the surrounding landscape. At a quick glance, it was impossible to tell where Amina was. Artemis's ability to camouflage is awesome. As I watched, one of the guard's magic rafts suddenly fell to its knees and collapsed. The other guard noticed this and approached the fallen magic raft. But as soon as he did that he felt his body stiffen and he collapsed as well. When Artemis's camouflage was deactivated she appeared on the cliff and waved at us. Seeing this, we began to move forward with caution. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-79, Battle in the Cave. C-79, Battle in the Cave. As Amina moved further from the cliff where she had defeated the sentries, toward the middle of Mount Dina, she saw another sentry's magic raft. Looks like that's where the bandits are holed up. Magic rafts are standing guard over the entrance to the cave. The hideout is probably there as Alana said. Two guards Amina, can you do it again? Copy that. I'm on it. With that Artemis activated her camouflage and blended in with the scenery around her. We'll go in after Amina takes out the guards. Are you sure you want to be found now? I can see glimpses of infantry. So there's probably a limit to how much we can hide. And if they're going to find us anyway, it's better to subdue them all at once. Indeed, it's impossible to take out all the infantry without being detected. In the same way as before, one of the guard's magic rafts collapsed. The moment the other guard looked at the fallen magic rafts its head was blown off. Artemis appeared, pointing the bow gun attached to her left arm at the magic rafts whose head was destroyed. Okay, let's go. Ignore the infantry and prioritize destroying the magic rafts. We entered the cave in the order of me, Nanami, Alana, Arthur, and Amina, as the entrance allowed only one magic raft to enter at once. The cave turned out to be a large space, with a lot of cargo in it, and a few magic rafts. The bandits were running away, making a lot of noise, and the magic rafts came out with weapons to intercept us. Alana and Amina, you take the right magic side, Nanami and Arthur, you take the left side, and I'll deal with the middle. We scattered in three directions and began to attack the enemy's magic rafts. I hit the body of the magic raft that attacked me with a long spear with my tomfa and crushed it. Then I kicked the approaching magic raft with a two-handed sword and took it out of action. I twisted my body to avoid the attack of a large axe that rammed into me from the front. Then I crushed his legs and head rendering him unable to move. Enemy magic rafts attacked from both sides at the same time. Turning my body and swinging the tanfas, I destroyed their heads almost simultaneously. I took out all the nearby enemies and looked around. It seems that Alana and the others have already taken out their opponents. It would have been impossible to escape from the cave, which had been conquered within minutes. Who are you? The Duke of Holmo's private army? While shouting this through the external speaker, a lion-like creature appeared. It was a white magic raft with a head that looked like a no, we're mercenaries, I replied. So you've been hired by the Duke of Holmo? Not exactly hired. We came to take you down in an exchange. In exchange? If you weren't hired that means there's still room for negotiation. How about we just talk, no loss to you. I'm not going to negotiate with a bandit. You should just surrender. Alana retorted to the bandit's suggestion immediately. Hmm, sorry, but I can't let you catch me. So if you're not willing to negotiate I'll fight you to the death. As he said this, the lion's magic raft held its sword and adopted a fighting stance. Alana, wait a minute, let's just talk to him. We can catch him afterwards. I was curious about what he had to say because I had a feeling that he wasn't a normal bandit from what I heard about his reputation in town. When I said that, the lion's magic machine relaxed its fighting stance. 
It's not the kind of thing you want to talk about in a magic raft, so if you don't mind, I'd like to come down and talk to you. Fine, but it's just me and one other person getting off. I don't want anything to happen to us, so I'm going to ask the rest of you to stay in your magic rafts. That's fine, I'll have my men move back as well. The figure that came down from the lion's magic raft was wearing a lion's mask, just as Jean had informed us. After confirming that the other party got off his magic raft and that the bandits were backing away from the area, Alana and I got off as well to listen to what he had to say. First of all, let me say thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make my point. That's very polite of you to say to someone who destroyed most of the magic rafts on your side. Alana's sarcastic words did not anger the lion mask. Instead he remained calm and collected. What I have to say is more important than a few magic rafts. Why are you talking to us mercenaries about something so important? If I don't you'll capture me, because I've seen the battle and I don't think I'm a match for you. Oh I see you tricked us. I'm sorry, but I had to do it. He seemed to be smiling a little at this point, though I couldn't see the expression on the face of the man in the lion mask. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C80, Lion King. C80, Lion King. This is Chapter 44 sponsored by Kingpen. Thanks for the support. The leader of the bandits, known as the Lion King, began to speak. The story of the Lion King goes like this. Once upon a time, this area was a small country called the Kingdom of Stogar. But twenty years ago, the king was killed and the young and beautiful queen was taken hostage by the young and ambitious Duke Halamel of Meltaria, who wanted to expand his own territory. Eventually, the queen responded to the frantic proposal of Duke Karen of Meltaria, who fell in love with her beauty, and she became his wife and bore him two children. However, a few years ago, she fell ill and died. Interesting story, but what does this have to do with us? In response to Alana's question, the Lion King continued his story. The queen was loved by the people of Stogar. And this did not change even after the country disappeared and she became the wife of a nobleman from another country. The queen loved and cared for her people. Before she passed away, she left these words to her son. The people of old Stogar are suffering from oppression. And I hope that something can be done. When Alana heard this, she seemed to have realized something. You're the son of the queen? I'll leave it to your imagination who I am. But you can be sure I'm someone who can't leave the people of this land suffering under oppression. I understand what you're saying, and I understand that you're not ordinary bandits. But we can't betray our client, and in order to do that, we need to destroy the bandits in this area. I'm sorry, but we can't just let you go. Well, then what are you going to do, capture me? Pretend to be dead, the bandits have been eradicated and you've been defeated by us. If you do that, you'll be fine. I was suggesting that partly because the Lion King was more likable than the Duke of Holomel. We just need to get him to vote for Yudin, not to destroy them. If you don't mind me asking, why are you so supportive of the Duke of Holomel? Our employer is Lina Carlo. Soon there will be a vote for the succession to the throne between Yudin and Mushim, and in exchange for his vote we have to defeat the bandits. Okay, we'll pretend to be dead, but can you do me one favor? What do you want? I would like you to arrange a meeting between me and Prince Yudin. It would be possible since you have a connection with Princess Lina Carlo. Wait a minute, what's in it for us? It's not worth it to lose out and then ask the client to do something impossible. First, I will pay you 200 million as a small token of my gratitude. And I promise you another, vote for the succession to the throne, Duke Karen's vote. I've heard of Duke Karen, but he's one of the people who will be voting for the succession to the throne this time. If he promised me that vote then it looks like Alana's right about the Lion King being the son of the Stogar's queen. Not bad. What do you think, Yuda? I think Lina Carlo would agree if the story about the vote is true. Yeah, I'll accept your offer. I promise you won't regret that decision. This is the end of my talk with the Lion King. I get my money, and the promise of a vote. What a great outcome. But if we were to report that I had destroyed the bandits... I doubt the Duke of Halamel would believe us so easily. I have an idea. I explained to Alana and the Lion King the method of reporting to the Duke of Hormel that I had been thinking about. Bringing back the head of a magic raft is a novel idea. It reminded me of how people used to take credit for old battles in my home country. I don't know how you feel about that. 
but it might be enough to prove that we took you down. Fine, take as much evidence as you can. We cut off the heads of all the bandits' magic rafts and brought them back skewered on spears to create a cruel feeling. The Lion King was to accompany us to prepare the money for our payment and to meet with Yudin. How long are you going to wear that mask? Alana pointed out to the Lion King as we returned to the ride carrier and took a break. Ha huh, yeah, I guess there's no point anymore. With that, the Lion King took off his mask. Lord Theseus, it seems that Arthur knows the identity of the Lion King. The Duke of Karen's son, Theseus, at your service. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C81, reporting the results of the investigation. C81, reporting the results of the investigation. When we made our triumphant return to the Duke of Hormel's mansion, we all deliberately formed a conspicuous formation with our magic rafts and returned with spears pierced through the heads of the bandits' machines. Duke Hormel, as promised, we eliminated the bandits. I reported this as I arranged the heads in the garden of the mansion. It's certainly the head of the bandits' leader magic raft. But why only the head? What happened to the body of the machine and the bandits' rider? I'm sorry it was a fierce battle and we killed all the bandits. We the Iron Knights have no mercy for our enemies. We couldn't carry all of the enemy's bodies in our ride carrier. So we only brought back the heads. Well, 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 you have done a great service. And now this territory will be at peace. Please do not forget your promise. I know, and I promise to vote for Yudin when the time comes. Now that the mission was complete, Duke Hormel invited me to a victory party. But I politely declined, feeling guilty that I hadn't really eradicated the bandits, and also because I had Lord Theseus waiting on my ride carrier. That went well, now let's head back to the capital. I'm sorry, but before you go back to the capital, can you please go to my parents' residence so that I can get you the money? It's a bit of a detour, but it won't be too much trouble. At the request of Lord Theseus, Jean, who was piloting the ride carrier, smiled and said, He he he. I'll take all the detours I need for the money. The Duchy of Karen, where the family home of Lord Theseus is located, is only a few hours detour away. When Theseus arrived at the Duke of Karen's mansion, he asked us to wait for a while. But Jean was worried that he would run away. Yuda and I will follow you. Theseus agreed without showing any signs of displeasure at his words. Theseus, I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? A middle-aged gentleman with gray hair and a dignified, aristocratic appearance approached us in the house. Father, I've been touring the country for a bit of social study. Well, I'm sure that's what you did. Who are those men there? These are some of my recent friends, and they are very skilled riders. So you're a skilled rider? If you're that good, I'd like to have you in the service of the Karen family. Father, please don't take my friends. Ha ha ha, I'm just kidding. Go ahead and take your time. After saying that, the middle-aged gentleman walked to the back of the mansion. That's the Duke Karen, who seems to be a very pleasant person. It's a small token of my promise, take it. Theseus went into his room and brought out a large bag, which he handed to Jean. He he he, I like a generous man. In the meantime, please take care of my meeting with Prince Yudin. I was just wondering, isn't it possible for a man of Theseus' rank to visit Yudin on his own? When I expressed my honest question, Theseus replied with a subtle expression. I've been having a lot of problems getting close to Yudin. What problems? Prince Mushim is my brother-in-law. You know the rest. I see. It's a complicated relationship. Can we stop by the backyard before we head back to the ride carrier? What are you doing? It's been a while since I've been home, so I thought I'd stop by and say hello. In a corner of the backyard, there was a magnificent stone monument. Theseus stood in front of it and closed his eyes quietly. Mother, please wait a little longer. I will surely save the people of Stogar. It appears to be the grave of Theseus' mother. His face was full of sadness and determination. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C82, The Crown Prince and the Lord. C82, The Crown Prince and the Lord. We went back to the palace and visited Linacarlo right away. That was quick. So how did it go? No problem. I made Duke Hormel promise to vote for Yudin. Well, thank you for your efforts. We have been successful in persuading the two dukes. We just have to wait for the voting day. So, Lina Carlo, I need a favor. You want me to do something for you? Okay, go ahead, say it. There's someone who wants to talk to Yudin. 
Can you do that for me? Who is it? I can't let strange people get too close to the crown prince. No, the person I'm talking to is probably someone Lina Carlo knows. I don't think he's a bad guy, and it's something that could benefit our interests. If you insist, I'll at least give him a chance to talk, but who is he? I can't tell you that because he asked me to keep quiet until he can meet Yudin. All right, I'll trust you guys. So where should I bring Yudin? He's waiting at our ride carrier, so bring Yudin there. But he wants us to be very discreet. All right, then, I will visit the ride carrier with Yudin this evening. Now it looks like we can fulfill our promise to Theseus. I don't know what they'll say to each other, but it will happen. That evening, as promised, Lina Carlo and Yudin came to visit the ride carrier. Arthur was asked to stay at the ride carrier with Theseus until then, as we didn't want him to do anything unnecessary. So it was you, long time no see, Princess Lina Carlo, and Crown Prince Yudin. Lord Theseus, I had no idea you were waiting for me. Prince Yudin, thank you for coming. So, Theseus, why did you want to meet Yudin? Lina Carlo suddenly got to the point. I have a favor to ask of Prince Yudin. Please, is there anything I can do for Lord Theseus now? It's not you now, it's you as the king, the son of Duke Karen. No, I don't think that's what Prince Musham's brother-in-law should say. My request is for a uniform tax rate for all of Meltaria and a ban on the persecution of the citizens. I've heard that some nobles treat their people very badly. Yes, Duke Holomel's domain is particularly harsh, with an 80% tax rate, an obligation to provide free services to Duke Holomel, and a ban on travel to other territories. This is unacceptable. But why do you want me to do that? I think you could tell Prince Musham. Do you think the Musham will agree to this proposal? That's true. My brother doesn't have a heart for the people. I understand. When I become king, I promise to set a uniform tax rate and issue a decree prohibiting the persecution of the people. Thank you. Now I can comfortably persuade my father. What do you mean by persuade? I will persuade my father that his vote should go to Prince Yidin. That's what I'm hoping for, but is it okay? Yes. Don't worry. I'd like you to be my king. The secret meeting between the crown prince and Lord Theseus seemed to end on a mutually satisfactory note. Lord Theseus had to go back home again to persuade his father, Duke Karen. You've done well to get not only Duke Holomel's vote, but also Duke Karen's vote. Ha <laughs> ha, I appreciate the compliment. Arthur, I'm not talking to you, Yuda. No, the Iron Knights, you've done well. Don't you get a bonus or something? I'd be happier with that than with words. Jean replied to Lina Carlo. I'll think about it once Yudin is safely on the throne. Thus Yudin was one step ahead in the voting for the throne, and all that was left was to wait for the results on the day of the vote. I hope everything will go well. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C83 Enemy Attack Slash Megisa C83 Enemy Attack Slash Megisa During the signing of the alliance, King Ema and King Majni argued quite fiercely. But Rennell's words, good adults don't fight like children, calmed them down, and the agreement was successfully signed. I didn't expect that bigot to agree to an alliance with Amuria. It's all thanks to Nagisa. You should thank her, father. Thank you, Nagisa. No, I didn't. I think the Eastern Alliance will be safe now. But King Ema said that there are countries within the Eastern Alliance that are betraying it, so I don't think we can rest easy. The countries that are betraying us, What's in it for them? I'll talk to Lord Beta when I get back. We were returning home to Amuria, and on the way, deep in the mountains, it happened. Enemy attack! Unidentified magic rafts are approaching. A soldier on guard duty warned loudly. The enemy attacked. This is the Eastern Alliance's sphere of influence. What country are the magic rafts from? There are no national markings, so we don't know their affiliation. The enemy number is around 20. There's nothing we can do about it. We'll intercept them. Nagisa, I'm sorry, but this is going to be your first mission. No way. I never thought I'd really have to fight. I don't want a war. Yuda, what should I do? We already have lost Spella, I Dante, and Basim ready to go. What happened to Lear? Sorry, he is still recovering. Sorry, Nagisa. I don't think I'll be able to join you for your first battle, so stay close to Jihad and Delphine. Yeah, I know. Me, Jihad and Delphine set off as soon as the hatch of the ride carrier opened. They're around twenty, quite a few more than us, 
so we'll have to stick together as much as possible, Jihad said, and Delphine and I agreed. Here they come. Be careful, Nagisa. The first to attack us was a five machine unit, all five equipped with swords and shields. The weapon of Jihad's magic raft, Idante, was a long sword, which he used to pierce the enemy that was charging at him. The enemy magic raft blocked Jihad's attack with its shield and responded with its sword. The weapon of Delphine's magic raft, Basim, was a large axe, which was swung wide and struck the enemy machine from above. The enemy magic raft blocked the powerful attack by raising its shield, but the force of the attack was so strong that it collapsed, breaking both knees. Against the collapsed enemy, Delphine swung his axe like a baseball bat at its neck. The enemy collapsed on the spot. Two enemy magic rafts were coming at me. Islet, Jihad and Delphine warned me to be careful, but they were stuck fighting the enemy. I guess I'll have to fight now. I remembered the training at the dojo, the Aikido that my father had taught me since I was a child. He was a dedicated instructor and was relentless with his daughter. And thanks to him, I have grown to the level of fifth dan at this age. They are slow compared to my father's movements in practice. They are as different as a turtle and a swallow. I can avoid their attacks if I concentrate. I twisted my body to avoid the enemy that attacked me with a sword, and using the momentum of the opponent, I put my hand on his neck and slammed him straight into the ground. In Aikido practice, you take down the opponent in a way that makes it easy for you to catch him so that he doesn't get hurt. But since I struck him at a time when the fall will deal damage, the enemy plane stopped moving spewing smoke from its body. With a fluid motion, I avoided the other enemy's attack, took its arm, spun it around, and used the momentum to strike it in the head with my elbow. With the added force of the rotation, the enemy magic raft head was blown off in a cruel manner. Amazing Nagisa, Jihad marvels at the way I fight. Jihad, the next enemy is coming, Delphine warned Jihad, who was in a daze. It seems that the enemy's main force is next and there are more than ten magic rafts. I pull out the sword on my waist and hold my body still in a medium stance. Jihad, Delphine, stand back. Thinking it would be difficult to move with my allies, I ordered them to move back. The enemy attacked my La Spella. Aikido is not widely known, but there are a number of techniques that use weapons, and I am particularly good at Taijutsu. And even my father, who is very strict with me, has agreed that I'm stronger than him when it comes to taijutsu alone. I close my eyes and calm my mind. I sharpen my awareness and focus on the enemy attacks. I wonder why. It's easier to focus when I'm inside La Spella. My consciousness is moving more and more towards the core of my mind. It feels good. I feel like I'm floating. What the hell? There's a blue-white aura coming from La Spella. Hey, Delphine, what's that? I don't know either. I could hear their conversation, but I didn't care. I was already in a kind of zone. My body reacted on its own to the enemy attacking all at once. And with surprising speed, I was able to counter precisely. One, two, three. One hit to destroy a magic raft. Four, five, six. I didn't have to think about anything. Something inside me was taking out the enemy on its own. Seven, eight, nine. The enemy's attack stopped there. I saw that the rest of the enemy planes were fleeing in the direction they came from. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C84. Voting for the succession to the throne. C84. Voting for the succession to the throne. It was finally time to vote for the succession to the throne. Me, Alana, and Jean accompany Lina Carlo under the name of Royal Guards. In addition to the voters, about ten other important people from the country were present in the throne vote as witnesses. Duke Karen hasn't arrived yet, but it's time, let's start the voting. The Prime Minister, Brahm, who was in charge of the place, said so. We can wait until everyone is present, Lina Carlo protests, hoping for the Duke Karen's vote since the appointment with Theseus. I didn't say anything about invalidating Duke Karen's vote, we'll let him vote if he comes later, so let's start already. He doesn't seem to be saying that he's going to invalidate Duke Karen's vote because he's certain of his father-in-law's vote. Okay, that's good, let's get started. The voting was to proceed in turn by placing a card with the name of the voter under the card with the names of Yudin and Mushim. The first to vote was the second prince, Bodello. We don't need a poor king like Yudin, 
What this country needs from now on is an absolute ruler, and I'm voting for Mushim. Then he laid out his card underneath Mushim's name. The next person to vote was the first princess, Ryderia, who I think was the older sister of Linicarlo, but she didn't look like her at all. She was a mature woman with a clean and mature look. When she came in front of the names, she said, I nominate a king who will bring peace to the land, and Yudin will be the next king. As she says this, she slowly places her card under Yudin's name. The second princess, Lindale, was next to step forward, and she walked to the names with a goofy smile on her face. I want freedom, I want a good life, and I don't want to be in a country ruled by Yudin because it looks too stuffy, so I'm going to vote for Mushim. As she said this, she roughly placed her own card under Mushim's name. It was Lina Carlo's turn to speak. Mushim has no heart. We need someone who can understand the feelings of the people to rule the country. I'm voting for Yudin. Then she placed her own card under Yudin's. The turn of events so far was as expected, and both Mushim and Lina Carlo looked relaxed. From here, the dukes voted, and Brahm, the vizier, stepped forward first. I will cast my vote. I believe that in order to develop into a strong nation and a larger country, we need a strong leader, and I believe that Prince Mushim is the best choice for king. Then he placed his own card under Mushim's name. Duke Laidmart steps forward, followed by Prime Minister Brown. I had a hard time deciding which candidate to vote for, but I think Prince Yudin's personality is more suitable to be the king. Duke Laidmart was apparently close to neutral, and he placed his own bill under Yudin's name aware of the stare that Mushim was giving him. Duke Laidmart stepped back, and Duke Barelma stepped forward. I believe that the crown prince should be the heir to the throne, so I will cast my vote for Prince Yudin. He proudly placed his card under Yudin's name. With this, there are four votes in favor of crown prince Yudin. The remaining two are the Duke Holomel and Duke Karen, both of whom are likely to vote for us, so victory is in sight. The Duke Holomel stepped forward with a grin. The moment I saw his face, I had a bad feeling. Maybe that money-grubbing guy was thinking of something strange. After much deliberation, I have decided that the king should be the one who will make the country prosperous, and his name is Mushim, not Yudin, so I will vote for Prince Mushim. I knew it. He betrayed us at the last minute. Lina Carlo and Arthur are also looking reluctant. Oh no, the votes are tied, the only one left is Duke Karen. But... I hope Theseus was able to convince him. Ha 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 ha. I think we have a winner. I'm the next king. Mushim declares this with a loud laugh. Duke Karen's vote hasn't been cast yet. Ha, it's already decided. Duke Karen has already promised to vote for me. Maybe. But he might change his mind at the last minute. You know the Duke Karen's character. He's a man who always keeps his promises. No matter what, he'll vote for me. Sure, I'd only met him once but he didn't seem like someone who would break a promise. This seemed to be difficult, no matter how much Theseus tried to convince him. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C85. Choosing the king. C85. Choosing the king. Duke Karen is here! The guards reported. Both Mushim's camp and Yudin's camp stared at the door of the room. Then the door was opened, and Duke Karen, no, it was Lord Theseus who appeared. Theseus, why are you here? What happened to your father? Mushim called out to Theseus. From this day forward, I am the Duke of Karen, Prince Mushim. What nonsense! This is the official certificate of inheritance, signed by my father. The place was buzzing with excitement at the unexpected turn of events. Mushim checked the certificate, and his face changed color. It doesn't matter who it is, as long as you vote for me. I'm sorry but I have the right to cast my own vote. What? I'm your brother-in-law, and I have an agreement with your father. But you, father's promise does not require me to keep it, and I will vote as I see fit. Theseus then proceeded to the tags of Mushim and Yidin. I will vote for a king who will conduct honest politics and impartial state affairs, Theseus said emphatically, and placed his card underneath Yidin's. Nonsense! This can't be right. Theseus you will not be forgiven. Seeing this, Mushim revealed his anger in a loud voice. Brother Mushim, this is the result of a legitimate vote. The throne will go to Yudin. What's the matter with you? Yudin is not fit to be king. I'm the only one. I'm the only one who can be king. 
Prince Mushim, this is it, you have lost, now admit defeat and allow Prince Yudin to take the throne. Ugh, oh, Prince, what? Mushim unexpectedly plunged his sword through the belly of Vizier Brown, who was admonishing him for his hysterics. You're the one who got me into this mess. What do you want me to do? Admit defeat. I won't be defeated by anyone. I'm going to be king. This vote is invalid. Stop it, Brother Mushim. Ha, huh, Lina Carlo, you thought I didn't think about losing the vote. Eh? When Mushim gave the signal, his soldiers, who were waiting in the next room, broke inside. Kill Yudin. I'm going to be king. Mushim had no idea he would be forced to do this, and Alana and Arthur stepped forward to protect Yudin. Mushim, don't you have any shame? This is an act of treason. How can you be a king if you are a traitor? Treason, treason. Don't get me wrong, Lina Carlo, Yudin is not king yet. No, he will never be king, because today he will die here. What are you doing? Kill him quickly. Following Mushim's orders, the soldiers attack Yudin, which was defended by Alana and Arthur. But how can you say that you can kill your own brother with no hesitation? Lina Carlo, it's not safe for you to stay here. You better think about running away first. To Jean's warning, Lina Carlo nodded. Lina Carlo runs out of the room with Yudin and the soldiers try to stop them, but Alana and Arthur beat them with their swords. Arthur, who Lina Carlo says has nothing to his name except his face, is very good with a sword and overwhelms several soldiers. What are you doing, Yuda? You come here quickly too. Jean told me to hurry up and follow Lina Carlo and the others. What do we do, Lina Carlo? From the looks of it, they blocked all the entrances and exits of the palace. Jean asked Lina Carlo while running. Let's go to the basement. That's where my Odin is. Well, it's true that a magic raft might be able to break through the encirclement. We dodged the oncoming mushroom soldiers and headed for the underground hangar. It's when Lina Carlo came to the underground hangar, she was astonished to find that her magic raft, Odin, was not there. Ha 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 ha, Lina Carlo, I knew you'd come to this hangar. I didn't think it was necessary, but I had your Odin moved. Mushim, Mushim explained, looking down at us from the space above the hangar. You will die knowing how helpless you are without your magic raft. As soon as he yelled that, magic rafts came pouring in from the hangar entrance. Every entrance and exit was blocked by soldiers and there was no way to escape. What should I do? Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C86, The Legendary Activation. C86, The Legendary Activation. There is no way out now, what should I do? It's true that Lina Carlos Odin and Arthur Centaur aren't there, but I noticed that there's a magic raft on the floor, and I told Lina Carlo about it. Lina Carlo, is that magic raft broken? It is the national treasure of this country, the magic raft of Ruzak, the hero who founded this country, but unfortunately it cannot be used. It looks like it's working. The activation Ludia value is ridiculously high. No one in the history of this country has ever been able to move that thing. And of course I'm no exception with a Ludia value of 48,000. Okay, well, that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. Yuda, try getting on that thing. Jean, who was listening to the conversation, suddenly said so. Wait a minute, did you hear what she said? It's a magic raft with a ridiculously high activation Ludia value. There's no way I can ride it. No, you can move it. I believe so. I mean, there's no other way but to move that thing and break through this siege. You have to move that thing no matter what, Yuta. Don't be absurd. It's true that Yuta has an unfathomable power. Normally, only royalty would be allowed to touch this magic raft. But I'll give you special permission. Yuta, board the magic raft. Victor, if we don't do anything, we'll all be killed. I have no choice but to board the magic machine, Victor perhaps thinking that we are already surrounded and cannot escape. The enemy is not in a hurry and is slowly approaching us. The cockpit doesn't look much different from Arleo's. Come to think of it, this situation is similar to when I first moved the Arleo at Pharma's house. Arleo worked then, surely Victor will work this time, too. I rubbed my hands together to loosen them up, and gently placed my hands on the two control balls with a prayer. Move Victor! The moment I shouted that with all my energy, the lights came on as the power was coming on to the devices around me, and then I heard the sound of a motor or something turning. Yes, it's working. 
I immediately sent an order to the control sphere to stand up. With almost no time lag, the image is immediately transmitted to Victor. My friends shouted in admiration when they saw the figure slowly stand up with a creaking sound. I can't believe you actually moved Victor. What, Lina Carlo, you didn't think it would work after all? Obviously. The activation Lydia value of Victor is said to be 200,000. 200, 000. 200 000, 000. That's just what the legend says, so I don't know what the truth is. The only thing I'm sure of is that Yuta's real Lydia value is ridiculously high, beyond common sense. I stood up and looked at the approaching enemy magic rafts. The legendary Victor began to move, and the enemy was clearly flustered. I didn't think Victor was going to move, it doesn't matter, destroy that antique. But Master Musham, that's a national treasure. I'm telling you to destroy it, what's the problem? No, there's no problem. Five enemy magic rafts were slowly approaching to surround Victor. I had no weapons so I attacked an enemy magic raft with my bare hands. In an instant, Victor was close to the enemy magic raft and slammed his fist into it. A heavy air bursting impact occurs. Both arms and the head are smashed to pieces, and the upper part of the fuselage is shattered without a trace. It was surprisingly light, and felt powerful, clearly moving better than Arleo. It's a Highlander. That's a Highlander, magic raft, and you tore it to pieces, in an instant. What are you doing? All of you, attack together. In response to Musham's order, the four remaining magic rafts attacked Victor at once. I brushed aside the four magic raft as they approached, spinning around. With a single swing, the four enemy magic rafts were blown apart, their arms and heads torn to pieces. Master Musham, I'm afraid it's not safe for you to stay here. Please withdraw and leave the rest to the magic raft troops outside. Tell the troops outside to make sure they finish him off. And with that, Musham left for the depths of the royal palace. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C87 Battle for the Royal Palace C87 Battle for the Royal Palace After wiping out the enemy's magic rafts, the infantry who had surrounded Yudin and the others scattered out once to escape. Okay, Yuda, get out of the hangar and secure the entrance. What about Jean and the others? Arthur just went to get the ride hover at the back, so we'll escape in that. I couldn't figure out what a ride hover was, but it was probably a vehicle or something. When I came out of the hangar, I saw that there was a fierce battle going on outside, and when I looked, it was Nanami and the others who were fighting. Looks like the ride carrier was attacked by Musham soldiers. I'd like to talk to Naomi and the others, but Victor doesn't have a Horcrux, and even if he did, he wouldn't be able to communicate with a Horcrux that he wasn't linked to, so I'd have to get close to them and talk directly to them using the external sound output. The enemy's Magicraft squadron, which has noticed Victor, is approaching me. There are five of them, and I need to clear them out before the ride hover that Jean and the others are riding comes out. One of the enemy Magicrafts attacked me with a trident. I avoided it and grabbed the head of the enemy, crushing it with a little effort. I took away the trident from the enemy magic raft, which collapsed helplessly, and pierced the torso of another enemy that was attacking me from the front with his sword, and then I destroyed the one that was attacking me from behind with a series of thrusts. I swung my trident at the remaining two enemies, a direct hit broke one of them into pieces and blew the other one apart from the shoulders up. After clearing away the enemy magic rafts and securing the hangar entrance, a buggy-like vehicle flew out of the hangar. Perhaps this was a ride hover. When I looked at it, I saw that Lina Carlo and Yudin were also on it. All right, Yuda, continue to escort me to the ride carrier. Okay, follow me but keep a little distance. Around our ride carrier, Naomi and the others are fighting against a large number of enemy magic rafts. As soon as I approach the ride carrier, I heard a buzzing sound coming from behind me. I turned around and was suddenly hit in the head with a crack. I looked and saw a bent arrow from a bow gun had fallen out. There was more buzzing and then the figure of a magic raft with a bow gun appeared. It was Amina's Artemis. Amina! It's me, Yuta. Oh, you're Yuta? What's that magic raft? We'll talk about that later. The ride hover with Jean and the others is coming. Can you protect it? Okay. Leaving the ride hover escort to Amina, I decided to wipe out the enemies around the ride carrier. 
I wielded the trident that I had taken from the enemy earlier and eradicated the squadron of enemy planes that had surrounded Nanami's Vidra. And then I spoke to her. Nanami, are you okay? Yuta, what's with that magic raft? Jean and the others are heading for the ride carrier in a ride hover. So we need to wipe out the enemies around here to ensure their safety. I understand. Working together with Lorgo and Pharma, we destroyed the enemies around the ride carrier then the ride hover arrived at the ride carrier. Liza noticed and opened the hatch to welcome the ride hover. Yuda, look at that, there's a lot of magic rafts. When I looked at the direction Nanami was pointing, I could not believe the number of magic rafts that were coming towards us. At this rate, the entire ride carrier is going to be swallowed up. Let's retreat. Nanami, call the ride carrier and tell them to retreat as well. I decided to keep the enemy at bay until the ride carrier retreated. I go towards the countless enemy troops, but I'm not stupid enough to fight that many enemies on my own. So I move across the enemy troops and only draw their attention towards me. Just as I aimed, the enemy forces were coming towards us. Meanwhile, the ride carrier seemed to have started retreating in the other direction. Yuda, the ride carrier has pulled out. All right, we're getting out of here. Me and Nanami headed in a different direction from the ride carrier, while destroying the enemy magic rafts that were chasing us. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-88 hiding. C-88 hiding. Yuta, you've strayed quite far from the ride carrier. Is everything okay out there? Yeah, everybody's okay. That's good. Now we just need to meet up and plan what to do next. Nanami and I fled into the deep forest. There were many tall trees in this forest. And even with the magic rafts, we were able to hide well enough to escape our pursuers. We decided to contact the ride carrier to discuss the rendezvous point and other matters. Since there is no Horcrux in Victor, we communicated from Nanami's Vidra. Jean, is everyone okay? Yeah, we're fine. How are you? We're fine, the enemy is gone. Maybe we don't have to join you right away. What? Why? It's safer to stay put today and meet up tomorrow than to make a wrong move and have them figure out where we are. All right, what's the rendezvous point? We'll go to the Duke of Karen's residence. Linicarlo says that the Duke of Karen, the former Duke of Karen will be able to help us. Okay, I'll head to the Duke of Karen's residence tomorrow then. We decided on the rendezvous point for tomorrow. And when we were done talking, I cut the communication. Yuda, I'm hungry. I'm hungry too. I didn't think about food and we can't go to the city. Okay, let's find something to eat. Is there anything to eat? With all this wilderness, I'm sure there's something. I searched for food while also looking for a place to hide and found a small spring that gushed out between the rocks. It's like spring water. It's drinkable. I'm thirsty. Fearlessly, she scooped the water into her hands and brought it to her mouth. It may have been the thirst, but it was cold and quite tasty. Nanami plunged her face into the spring and gulped it down. Pfft. I'm alive again. Don't drink too much at once or you'll get an upset stomach. Don't worry, Nanami's stomach is strong. Nanami insisted proudly. The water is clean, but there don't seem to be any fish. Yes, it would be nice if there were fish. Mushrooms grew around the spring, but I was too afraid of the poison to eat them. I don't have any knowledge of edible wildflowers, and I don't know what to do. Wait a minute, Nanami, do you hear something? What? I don't hear anything. No, that's the sound of water flowing. Maybe there's a river nearby. A river would have fish. Yeah, that's a possibility. We looked around and found a river with clean water flowing in abundance. Whoa, I think I see fish here. I'm sure there are, Nanami. I can't wait to eat some fish. Okay, let's go get them. But how are we going to catch them? We don't have traps or fishing rods. As I was thinking about how to catch the fish, I casually looked at Victor and had an idea. I've got an idea, Nanami. What are you going to do? You'll see. As I said this, I got on Victor, lifted a large stone from the riverside and threw it at a large rock in the middle of the river. A dull thud sounded, and the stone I threw shattered. What are you doing, Yuda, breaking rocks? After a while... Fishes started to float around the rock I hit. If you don't catch them quickly, they will drift away. No way, wow! Nanami hurriedly caught the fish that came to the surface. I also scooped up the fish with Victor's large hands. I'm amazed you came up with that. It's an old fishing method in my country. I think it's called slingshot fishing. Yuta knows a lot. Nanami doesn't know anything. 
Nanami just didn't have the opportunity to learn. I still want to give Nanami the chance for a proper education. Don't worry, Nanami. You'll learn a lot. Yes, you're right. Nanami will be a smart girl. We were having this conversation as I pinned a large number of fish I had caught on a tree branch and roasted them over a bonfire that Nanami and I had struggled to build. Look, Nanami, I think you can eat this now. Thanks, Yuda. Nanami took a big bite out of the back of the fish. It's delicious. All right, I'll try some too. It was a little salty, but it was definitely fatty and quite tasty. We must have caught quite a few, but Nanami and I ate them up in no time. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C89, Attack slash Jean's point of view. C89, Attack slash Jean's point of view. After retreating from the royal palace, we were on our way to the Duke of Karen's residence. As I was taking a break after communicating with Yuta and the others who had been decoys in order to help us escape, Linicarlo spoke to me. Jean, is Yuta alright? What, Linicarlo, are you worried about Yuta? No. Yuta is now riding the national treasure of Meltaria. I'm just worried about the national treasure, Victor. I'll pretend you're telling the truth. It's true, and I'm not worried, because I don't think that Yuta will be slowed down by Mushum soldiers. You seem to have a very high opinion of Yuta. It is true, after all, Yuta is the only rider who has drawn with me. I'm sure he's got a lot to say about that. I don't think Yuta and the others are in trouble. But I wonder if Theseus and Lina Carlo's sister who voted for Yudin are okay. As Alana said, it's hard to predict what Mushum will do, but I don't think he'll go as far as killing him. I don't think Mushum will harm the royal family or senior nobles unnecessarily, although they will probably be restrained. That evening, we arrived at the Duke of Karen's residence. The former Duke of Karen welcomed Yudin and the others without a hint of displeasure. Princess Lina Carlo and Crown Prince Yudin, welcome to my home. Duke Karen, I'm sorry to bother you at this time of night, but the truth is that Mushum has gone out of control. I'm sorry to bother you this evening, Duke Karen. I'm sure he's not dead, but he's most likely locked up. I should have taken him with me, but Mushum's sudden outburst left me too busy protecting Yudin. It's a good thing that Prince Mushum won't kill Theseus easily. I'll help in any way I can. In the middle of the conversation with the former Duke of Karen, the door of the room was suddenly violently opened, and a soldier rushed in to report. A large force of magic rafts has entered the territory. How many enemy magic rafts are there? I'm guessing at least 500. Gather the whole army. Fucking Mushim, you, good for nothing. Duke Karen, how many magic rafts do you have? We have about 80 magic rafts and 20 ride hovers with Ballisti. Okay, we'll help you, Jean, get everyone ready. Isn't that reckless without Yuda and Nanami? Still, we have no choice but to fight, and Arthur and I will borrow a magic machine from Duke Karen to go out, so get them ready quickly. You really should get your... bonus. Alana, you heard the princess, we're all going out. Alana went back to her ride carrier. I followed her and headed out. It hurts that Yuda and Nanami aren't here at a time like this. Alana and Amina are pretty strong on their own, but those two are still the main force behind the Iron Knights. It would have been nice if the reports of Duke Karen's soldiers had been exaggerated, but there was a large army of exactly 500 magic rafts closing in on us. I watched from the deck of my ride carrier and sent instructions to Alana and the others. Alana, Amina, cover the Duke of Karen's army and destroy the enemy. Pharma, support Alana and the others from the rear. Lorgo, defend the ride carrier and the ride hover troops. Can you call Yuda? Maybe he's nearby? You're right. Okay, I'll get back to you. As Alana said, Yuda and Nanami might be camping nearby. I opened the communication to contact them and ask for support. But no matter how many times I called, there was no response. What are they doing? I called again and again, but there was no response. I gave up. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C90, Enemy Attack. C90, Enemy Attack. After a hearty meal of fish, Nanami and I decided to go to bed early to prepare for tomorrow. I slept in the cockpit of Victor, and Nanami slept in the cockpit of Vidra. Nanami, we're leaving early tomorrow, so we're going to bed. Yeah, I know. Then why are you following me? We used to sleep together before. Why don't we sleep together now? No, the cockpit's too small for two people. We'll be fine if we stick together. I don't want you to get a backache. 
When I said this, Nanami happily crossed her arms. Who the hell does she think she is? When Nanami entered the cockpit with me, she squeezed closer than she should have. You don't have to squeeze so tightly, there's plenty of room. Nanami likes this position. It's hard for me to sleep. I complained, but Nanami didn't move a muscle, as if she was pretending not to listen. Yuda, do you remember the first day we met? Yeah, I remember when we met at that slaver's house. At that time, Yuda looked so radiant. Why is that? Was I wearing something shiny? No, I don't know. I had a gut feeling that you're the one who's going to change Nanami. Oh, so, I lived up to your expectations? Yes, more than I could have imagined. Because Nanami is very happy now. She said that and hugged me even tighter. It hurt a little bit, but when I saw the innocent expression on her face, I couldn't refuse, so I let her do what she wanted. After that, it seems that Nanami and I fell asleep. We were awakened by a loud bang. What? Yuda, I'm going to bed. Nanami, this is no time to sleep. I think they found us. When I looked, I saw that there were three Magicrafts approaching, and shooting arrows at us as. I'm sure Victor will be fine, but if this continues the unmanned Vajra will be destroyed. I hurriedly activated Victor. What, Yuta? What's wrong? Just hold on tight. When the enemy noticed that Victor was activated, they began to focus their fire on me. I accelerated to close the distance at once, and struck the body of one of the enemy magic rafts with my fist. There was a dull, heavy thud, and the body of the enemy contorted. The other two ditched their arrows, drew their swords from their hips and attacked melee. I dodged them and landed a heavy blow on one of their necks with my elbow, and kicked the other one in the leg with my front kick. When I saw that all three of them had stopped moving, I hurriedly approached Vajra that had been attacked. How's it looking, Nanami? Everything okay? I asked, concerned as an arrow hit the area around Vajra's cockpit. It looks fine, but this might not work. What I saw was a deformed Horcrux that was emitting smoke. Wow, that's totally broken. Oh my god, I can't reach Jean and the others. It's a good thing we decided on the rendezvous point yesterday. Yeah, otherwise we would have failed to join them. Anyway, since we had lost contact with Jean and the others, we decided to head for the Duke of Karen's residence to meet up with them as soon as possible. It took us half a day to reach the Duke of Karen's residence from the forest where we were camped. What the hell? When we arrived at the Duke of Karen's mansion, we saw that it had been destroyed. Where did everyone go? I don't know. After checking the area, no one was found, so I didn't know what was going on. I think there was a fight. Yeah, probably. Oh no, they're all gone. There's no way they're going to be beaten that easily with Alana and Amina around, and there's no remnants of the ride carrier or the magic rafts so they should be fine. I was pretty sure that Alana and the others wouldn't be killed. Now I'm in trouble. I can't communicate with them, and I don't know how I'm going to join them. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C91, search. C91, search. When Nanami and I saw that the Duke of Karen's mansion had been smashed up in a spectacular fashion, we searched the area, hoping to find some clue as to where everyone went. It looks like there was a huge battle, but I don't see any destroyed magic rafts. Yeah, I wonder what happened to them. The small parts of the magic rafts are scattered around, so it looks like there were magic rafts destroyed in the battle. But their main bodies were gone. Jean once told me that there is a company that collects magic rafts that have been destroyed in wars. But I felt like they were being collected too quickly. It's no good. There is no clue. Yuda, what should we do? We'll go to the nearest town and see if we can get some information. I wonder if it's safe? I hope it's not full of the bad prince's minions. If we hide the magic rafts somewhere and walk into town, no one will pay any attention to us. Yeah, that's right. The town we visited was a small town in the Duke of Karen's territory, and we went to a tavern there to get some information. Even though it was late in the evening, the tavern was very crowded, and people were drinking noisily. When we entered the restaurant, Nanami and I took a seat at an empty table and ordered our meals. Just food? Yeah, just the food. You know, our ale is really good. Nanami wants some fruits. All right, we'll have one more of this fruit platter. Sure. It would be dangerous to ask around blindly, so we decided to eat and listen to the conversations around us first. If there had been a major battle, it would be big news around here, and would be a great subject during a drink. 
Perhaps there would be a table talking about it. And as I listened to the people at the next table, it seemed that there had been a big battle in the Duke of Karen's territory last night, and as expected, they were talking about it. In yesterday's battle, it appears that Prince Mushim has moved the kingdom's army. War with our lord? Prince Mushim's father-in-law is Duke Karen. How is that possible? It seems that the kingdom's army wants to pretend that the battle never happened, and they were sneaking around hiding the traces of the battle early in the morning. How do you know all this? My brother is in the royal army, and I've taken on the job of transporting broken magic rafts. I don't know how they could let a private company do a job like that, to cover it up. Sounds like they were in a hurry. You're spouting that shit in here? There's no royal army here. I'm pretty sure there was a battle between Mushim and the Duke of Karen. Maybe they will talk about the results of that battle and where everyone went afterwards. With that in mind, the conversation went on and they proceeded to talk about the results of the battle. So which side won the battle? The kingdom's army, of course. They outnumbered the duke forces. Did they kill my lord? No, he seems to have escaped. And now the royal army is in pursuit. Even if he escaped, there's nowhere to run against the royal army. Looks like he escaped towards the Duke of Raidmart's territory. That's the only place to run, because everything else is in Prince Mushum's sphere of influence. Alright, I got the information I needed. If they escaped, then they're all definitely alive. The Duchy of Raidmart, which direction would that be? Later, after finishing our meal, we quietly asked the tavern owner for the direction of the Duke of Raidmart's domain and left the tavern. Is everyone okay? Nanami muttered worriedly. Alana and the others won't be easily defeated. They'll be fine. Yeah, they're strong. They'll be fine. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't worried. We returned to the place where we hid the magic rafts and immediately set off for the Duke of Raidmart's domain. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C92, Retreat slash Jean's Point of View. C92, Retreat slash Jean's Point of View. Chapters 92 and 93 were sponsored by rxsd 3 r Thank you for the support. We'll be annihilated if we continue. Contact Duke Karen and advise him to withdraw. Unfortunately, the difference in strength was blatantly apparent in the results. The only ones who were destroying the enemy properly were the Iron Knights, Lina Carlo and Arthur, who were riding magic rafts for ordinary riders. Jean, the Iron Knights and I will act as you help Duke Karen escape to the Duke of Raidmart's territory. It's a good thing I'm not the only one. Alana, you hear that? Roger that. Lorgo stopped the troops on the right from advancing. Pharma will concentrate on escorting the ride carriers, while Amina and I will hold off the enemy as we destroy them. Lorgo, stop the enemy. Lina Carlo and Arthur, take out the enemy magic rafts we missed in the rear. Don't let any of them get through. Lina Carlo voiced her dissatisfaction at Alana's words. You want me to work as a garbage scavenger? You can't help us while riding a general magic raft. Even if you're a quadruple highlander, there are limits. You're right. But even with this magic raft, I'll be able to take out an enemy highlander. Lina Carlo's words were not false. And the fact that she had already shot down nearly ten magic rafts showed it. Arthur is also doing his best. But he could barely destroy two magic rafts. A regular highlander can't show that much power in a regular magic raft. Take it easy, all of you, because there's no point in getting hit here. The Duke of Karen rides his own ride carrier and begins to flee in the direction of the Duke of Raidmart's territory. All of the Duke's soldiers follow him. As a result, the only ones who can stop the enemy are the Iron Knights, Lina Carlo and Arthur. Once Duke Karen enters Duke Raidmart's territory, we'll move out. Alana and Amina are as strong as they come. The two of them have probably already destroyed 50 magic rafts. But the enemies are still coming out in droves and their numbers don't seem to be decreasing. I don't think they can keep fighting for long if this continues. We've already entered the Duke of Raidmart's territory. I've requested reinforcements in the name of Crown Prince Yudin at the Duke of Raidmart's castle. So you're safe now. Please take it easy and retreat as well. Alright, the Duke of Karen has entered the territory of Duke Raidmart. Amina and I will hold off the enemy, while Jean takes care of the others and stays back. Thanks, Solana, take care. Once Lorgo, Pharma, Lina Carlo, and Arthur are inside, the ride carrier advances to the rear, while only two people are stalling the progress of the large army. Alana, I'll take care of the rest. 
you go back to the ride carrier. Are you sure you're up for this, Amina? My Artemis has a stealth feature, so I can disappear and run away if I have to. It's true that Amina's Artemis would manage to escape even when surrounded by a large army. Alana, let Amina take care of that, and you retreat. All right, Amina, take it easy. After picking up Alana as well, we headed towards the Duke of Raidmart's territory at full speed. After that, Amina, who had been holding off the enemy until we entered the Duke of Raidmart's territory, used her stealth function to disappear and successfully escaped from the enemy forces. We then met up with Amina in the depths of the forest in the Raidmart duchy. It seems that the Duke of Karen's army and the Duke of Raidmart's army have joined forces. It looks like they can hold out for a while. We'll call for reinforcements from the Duke of Baroma's army and begin our counterattack. Will it be enough against the royal army? The Duke of Karens, the Duke of Raidmarts, and the Duke of Baroma's armies all have a combined total of about 300 magic rafts, so they're no match for them as it is. What are you going to do, Linacarlo? There's only one general in the kingdom's army who might be on my side. It is General Orlia, isn't it, sister? Yes, I'm sure Orlia will be on our side but I'd have to see him in person for that to happen. I'm pretty sure General Orlia is stationed in the Eastern Fortress, not far from here, but it's within that Kingdom Army's sphere of influence, sister. That's why we're going covertly to the Eastern Fortress. Covertly? Wouldn't Amina's magic raft be enough to get us there? What? Me? Yes, you can take me and Arthur in your Artemis. Hey, I can't fit three people in my Artemis. You can if you push it. I'm slim and Arthur packs compactly. Why does Arthur have to ride with us in the first place? You only need to convince the general, right? I believe Orlia knows where my Odin and Arthur Sente are kept, and I intend to retrieve them while I'm at it, so he must come with us. I see, well, it's true that we'll need Lina Carlo's Odin and Arthur Sente to fight back against Mushum from now. Don't touch my weird parts. Thus, Amina, Lina Carlo, and Arthur went to the Eastern Fortress, while we with Yudin, went to Duke Raidmart's castle to meet up with Duke Karen. Support me on Ko-Fi for extra chapters. C-93 Encounter. C-93 Encounter. It's full of enemies. What should we do, Yuda? Force our way through. It's fine for now, but if more and more reinforcements keep coming, it's going to be a problem, so I'd like to avoid them as much as possible. I wonder if we can move forward in that river or something. 